Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man, and today's video, as you can tell from the thumbnail and the description, it's about printers, on how to set up a printer properly. And the idea comes from my article that is about top 10 hard desktop support interview questions and answers that is located on CosmicNovo.com. There will be a link at the end of this video if you would like to read this for yourself. This is a third video based off of this article. First one being uh, remote desktop and DNS related. Second one being about missing files and desktop icons. Again, at the end of this video, there will be icons that you can select to watch either one of those. And if you're interested, I highly suggest that you do. Very interesting stuff. I go about uh, explaining these type of videos in a specific way where it's easy to follow for anybody. So today's printer, uh, today's printer, <laughs> today's question is related to installing a new printer at the office place that you work at. Now, before I go through it, let me just kind of explain my method of explaining this um, in a answer format. Um, I usually have four steps, and that is first, second, third, and last point or uh, explanation that I have for each uh, question that is presented to me, especially if this is a you know interview question, because I want the potential employer to understand that I am you know, very knowledgeable when it comes to IT, and you guys can do the same. All right, so let's get to it. The question is, your office received a new printer, and now it needs to be configured for everyday use by a specific department in your building. So keep that in mind, it's for a specific department only. How would you go about installing this printer in a direct IP printing setup? The direct IP printing setup also being something to remember. And the way I would start to explain this, I would say, first, I would unpack the printer to make sure all parts and cables are there. Uh, then I would connect <laughs> and plug in the printer into the power and network port available at designated location. Also, designated location here is very important to keep in mind. So obviously, um, for when it comes to this, you know, you get that giant box and, you know, these are large printers for businesses. You know, you unpack it and then you make sure everything's there, right? You make sure it has all parts and cables and then you put it together, plug it in and, you know, plug it into printer into power network port at the designated location. Second, I would make sure that this new printer has a static IP address assigned to it. And that kind of goes back to our designated location. For this designated location where we have placed our new printer, we have to kind of take note of the port that is there for the network uh, cable that is connected to, right? We, we, we would know, okay, well, this is the port number for this, you know, for this location. And then we would talk to our network guy or we would do it ourselves and make sure that we have a static IP address available and assigned to it. So let me show you what I mean. If you go to your network adapter properties and look at the those those settings there, you go to properties, right? And you would make sure that you have a static IP address available to you. So if you have a static IP address that you want to use for that port, uh, this can be assigned um, through the switch itself and that port would simply just use that and it would never change. And that's the whole point. It's static. We don't want it to change because we want users to connect to it every time. So when you go here into the, the Ethernet adapter properties and select Internet Protocol version 4, if your company is using uh, IP version 4, you will go in here and if you have to, you would specify the static IP address. So I'm just kind of showing it to you on the computer itself, but this is what you would do inside the printer. You would say, use this you know, IP address if this is something you have to do. This is just me explaining to you what a static IP address is and why you would need it for a printer so that users can always connect to it 
and know where it's at. So that way they can install it on their computer afterwards. And I'll show you that as well. And also, I would acquire a driver pa package for the specific model printer, unless the printer is set up to push the drivers automatically upon a request. So if printer for some reason doesn't come with driver package or software, obviously you would go to the manufacturer website, download all the drivers that you need. So let's say it's an HP, it's HP printer, you would go to HP and specify model, get this information, and then the reason for that is, if needed, we would uh, basically go to actor directory and tell actor directory to push this driver. But just kind of hold on to that thought, uh, because most new printers automatically push the drivers. So if it's a brand new computer, a brand new uh, printer, it would automatically push the driver to the user that is trying to install it. And I will go back to the Active Directory part that I've uh, that I've uh, that I spoke about. Third, Active Directory needs to know of the printer added. So this is where that comes in. It needs to be, it would know it needs to know that it's added and it added to the domain itself, right? Active Directory, you know, domain. So what happens is you would take a host name. You would create a host name for this printer. You would assign a host name and then you would add it to the actor directory. So that actor directory knows that there is a printer connected to this domain. So that way they can control who can use this printer through GPO or a group policy. And what this does is it only allows certain users of that department to use the printer. So basically once you have a group of people, a group of users for a specific department, you can literally just add all of those people into the permissions to use that printer that's been added to Actor Directory. So Actor Directory is a simple, simple way to control who can who can use the printer and who cannot. And that kind of goes back to our part. Uh, where it's kind of related to the driver package. If you have to specifically get the driver package, you can uh, set up Active Directory to push the driver as somebody tries to install it. So, uh, but again, new printers will just do this automatically on their own whenever somebody tries to add it. And that is done by the uh, static IP address or the host name. And this is why I talked about it here. If driver has to be pushed separately, this can be configured as well and in Active Directory. Lastly, I would notify the users of the new printer and its IP address and assist accordingly. So of course, you would have to help them because that's your job. Remember how we talked about a static IP address here? Well, your printer with the static IP address that you assigned it to would be used by users or you would do it for them let me just pull up my printers menu and here we would add our printer. So the way we, we would do it, we you know with printers um, menu, we would simply just select add printer. So now it's searching for the printers, but usually you saw how that little, that popped up this link. It usually doesn't find it right away. So you have to specifically tell it. So with the users, when it comes to users, you would simply give them the IP address and say, hey, this is the IP address for this printer. Just add it in there and it's going to automatically install it for you. But a lot of times you would do it for them. So you just click this printer that I want isn't listed because it's not going to find it most of the time. And that's okay. And now we have this menu that you may be familiar with. Uh, and remember how we talked about that IP address? Well, here it is. We can add the printer using TCP IP address or host name. So we can either use the IP address or the host name. Usually what I do, I just, you know, go by the IP address because uh, it's, I don't know, it's just the way I prefer it, but it really doesn't matter. So you have select that and then we would select next and it brings us to this menu. Here we would, for example, just type in the, you know, IP address that we've assigned it and we would, in my case, I'm just gonna, you know, come up with an IP address. Let's say it's 192.168.100.1. So let's, just assume that that's where our printer is located. 
and that's its IP address. And something to keep in mind when it comes to installing the drivers, if it's a newer printer, you'll be able to simply select the check mark here if not selected. By default, it is, I believe. And what that does is queries the printer. It pings the printer and says, hey, do you have a driver? And the printer says, yes, I do. And it then automatically installs it on your computer. So that's pretty awesome. Um, if you don't, you can later on specify the driver that you want to use. But this should be set up so it automatically does it. And then simply you select next. And it's going to look for it. And then it's going to install it. Of course, I, f I forget to mention the printer may have a port assigned to it as well. And uh, you would simply type that in after the IP address that I showed you. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Uh, lastly, I would notify the users, the new printers, and the IP address. I said that already. And that was the last part of this. If you have any questions in regards to this, I know this is a little bit complicated. And that's the whole point. The title of this article is Top 10 Hard desktop support interview questions and answers because you know you have to explain your steps on how to do this and I wanted to make these type of videos so you guys can kind of learn from this and to at least make it as easy to understand as possible whether you have experience or not it's good to have this type of knowledge or refresher for you know uh, my friends that are already IT professionals like me. All right, guys, please like this video, share it with your buddies. I'm sure they will like it. And don't forget, I have those two other videos you can watch. There is a link in the description. And hey, if you want to check out my computer setup that I have, uh, there's also a link in the description below. So if you want to check that out, that's cool too. All right, guys. I wish you best of luck and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Welcome to my video, my friends. Uh, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. And today I wanted to talk about remote desktop and some of the troubleshooting methods you can use in order to resolve those type of issues. This idea came from my article that is called Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers that you can find in the link in the description below if you want to read it. So in my previ previous video, I just wanted to mention I randomly picked a situation in uh, which uh, we created a really good video about and it was related to missing files and desktop icons. If you'd like to check that out, there also will be a link available at the end of this video and in the description uh, below. So let's look at this first question that uh, we are going to uh, talk about today. And uh, it's related to when using a remote desktop, you come to realize that the remote computer is not, not reachable by using a host name. So let's see what happens when you normally try to connect to a remote desktop. I'm going to open up a remote desktop here and I'm going to connect to my computer that's called Tech Support. This is a host name for this computer. Now, not to be confused with the IP address. You can also connect using an IP address to a remote computer. So instead of just typing in Tech Support, which you would normally do, when it comes to a business environment, you can also type in, and let's see, ping tech support. You can also use its IP address. And in our case, this is a version 6 IP address, which we would use to connect to it at computer. So in a type of, uh, in a business type of environment, chances are you would see a normal, you know, standard type of IP address that's just, you know, regular version 4. And uh, and that's perfectly fine. So instead of using the host name, you would type in that IP address in here, and it would connect the same way. But normally, all you would do is just type in the host name, uh, click connect, and then you can type in your login ID, which I already have. It's called YT login, and then you would type in your password, and it would connect just like this. Just a moment. Let me switch my 
picture here real quick. There it is. Okay. I almost needed to troubleshoot that first. So this is what happens when you connect to a remote computer. Now, you know, you can pretty much do everything that you would normally do. And that's the whole point of remote desktop. Video. So this is normal. But let's see what happens when I know that a computer is turned on and we try to connect to it. So my other computer is just called Kobuman. And on it, I have um, it, the remote desktop is disabled. So when I try to connect to it now from this computer, it's going to fail. And uh, we'll see what the errors are. You see, it says remote desktop can't connect to the remote computer for one of the reasons. Remote access to the server is not enabled. So what is that? What is that? Well, let's have a look. If I go to properties of this computer, so you go to properties of this computer, we can see, okay, I just want to make sure I have this. Okay, there it is. It says remote access to the server uh, to the server is not enabled. That means that when we go to advanced system settings here, okay, and it's asking me for admin privileges so I can access this. If you go to the advanced system properties and go to the far uh, right tab, which is called remote, this may be disabled like so, right? That might be the cause, and that's what that is talking about. I don't know if you saw that. It actually flashed it for a second. I thought it was going to disconnect it, although I didn't click apply or okay or anything like that. So, um, and the next thing that it says here, uh, the remote computer is not, is the remote computer is turned off, which is not, or a third, the remote computer is not available on the network, right? So those are the key factors for a successful remote desktop session. However, if we go back to our question, it says here, keep, keep in mind the remote computer is turned on and it's awake and it's on the same network. You see, it says, keep in mind that the remote computer is turned on, awake, and on the same physical network. So that's not the problem. So what I would, what would I do? What would I do? The way I would answer this question or troubleshoot this is, um, well, first of all, I if this is an interview type of situation, I would, you know, present them, you know, few ways of going about it and what it may be. This is just to give the potential employer or a future employer um, an idea of how I troubleshoot things and also that I am indeed knowledgeable and know what I'm talking about. So I would have first, second, third, and last example of what it could be, right? So my first idea would be, well, I would check to see if the remote computer's host name is part of the same domain. And uh, the way you could check that is by going to the Active Directory you see, you, you you just see if the you know if that host name is there. For example, we used here you know Kobuman as the name of the host. So I would go inside of Active Directory and say, hey, is Kobuman as in the name of the computer host name? Is it in there or not? And then go from there. And then also I would check to see if the remote computer is enabled within the domain, even if it has been added. So of course, it could be part of the main, but it could also be disabled. So once once it's part of a domain or active directory, if you will, you can have a host name in there, but if it's disabled, then it's not usable, right? So second, second thing, I would try to ping the computer by using the host name. If an error comes up, uh, if, if an error comes up, it would determine my next step. So we did a ping here for the tech support. And uh, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the other one since we started doing that one. Let's ping Kobuman here. CMD ping Kobuman. See, there's another proof here that the computer is turned on. We just can't reach it. And uh, the, it, this is a normal ping. It's a zero loss. 
zero loss, that means the computer is turned on and everything's fine. There's a perfect, there's connection there. We just cannot connect to it as we've demonstrated earlier. So what could be the problem? Let's go back to our answer for the second. For example, if the message is, it says cannot resolve host name, I would try pinging the computer using its IP address. So that kind of goes back to me connecting to a computer just by using an IP address. So, and that, my third part of that actually ties into that on what the reason for that is. If there is an issue with DNS, meaning that uh, the main name service, the main name service, I think I got there, DNS, the main name service, the main name system, I think that's what it actually stands for. Uh, basically what that does is resolves, um, it basically takes the host name, in our case, Kobuman, and tells uh, the, the server or other computers on the network what the IP address for that is. So Kobuman, as the name of the computer, is basically just uh, an alias, right? And the DNS basically takes that and it translates it and it forwards it to the correct IP address automatically. So if I can't connect to the Kobuman, by using a host name, but I can connect using the IP address like this, like this, if I can <laughs> if I can highlight it. All right, control C. If I can connect to it just like that without any problems using the IP address, that means that there is an issue with the DNS. That means the DNS is not doing its job. It's not taking Kobuman and translating it into the IP address, which it should be, right? So if that works, you know, by using IP address, then, you know, that's fine for now, but there is an issue. Um, third, I would check for possible DNS issues if computer is reachable via IP address. And that's exactly what, that, what I talked about previously. If using IP address, I can connect to the remote computer or use remote desktop session, it would indicate a replication issue of the DNS server. So, right. So, you know, another reason is, you know, if the computer has, you know, if there is an issue with the DNS, chances are it didn't replicate. So, you know, maybe the computer just got added on there and or it got moved or something like that. And the DNS server could not catch up with the change. It doesn't realize that it moved to another IP address, that could also be an issue. But generally speaking, if it ca if you cannot connect uh, to the remote computer using just a host name, then uh, but you can with an IP address, that indicates just a DNS issue. And lastly, if physical access, if I have physical access to the computer, I would check the DHCP settings or look or look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. So basically. If I go to the computer physically, if I have physical access to it, you know, um, if I am at the location there working for some kind of tech, tech support there, um, I would go to the computer, log into it, and look at the DHCP settings. So what is that? Dynamic host configuration protocol settings that are on your adapter. So I'm going to look up my adapter here and look at DHCP settings. I'm going to go in here. Change adapter settings. Here is my local Ethernet too. I'm gonna look at the properties. And I'm gonna look at the pro properties and then I'm gonna, let's see, where is it? Internet protocol version six. So we know we were using internet protocol version six so we're going to double check that, and then we're going to check at this. If this needs to be configured manually, we would have to do so. Otherwise, this should be just set to automatic. And this is usually what you would see in this type of DHCP setting. Now, not to be confused with DHCP server itself, that's different. That's your actual like switch on the network, or for example, your home router is a DHCP server, dynamic host configuration protocol. So I would make sure that looks good. 
and also look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. So chances are maybe there's a bad cable or, you know, because if it's on the network and it's physically connected, then chances are this is not the issue, you know. However, it's unlikely um, if computer is reachable by IP address or if it has been part of the network for some time. So the worst case scenario here being a DNS issue if you can't reach it with the host name only and that's exactly what the question was about so the point of this video is to kind of get you thinking of on how host names work in relation to the DNS and how this issue may come up whenever you use remote desktop sessions all right guys I hope this video was fairly easy to follow uh, this is uh, a hard question to answer um, hence it's in my article of top 10 hard desktop support interview questions and answers. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to ask me. I'll answer them to, my, to the best of my knowledge. And uh, if you like this video, please leave a like and uh, share it with your buddies. Thank you so much. I wish you best of luck. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. As you can tell by the video title and the thumbnail, today I will be talking about how to install operating system on 100 computers. And this idea comes from my article that is titled Top 10 hard desktop support interview questions and answers. If you're interested in reading this, there is a link at the end of the video to this article. If you watched my previous videos, I went through the first three questions and kind of uh, went and explained what they are about and provided some examples, which I will certainly try to do as well in the number four which is the question we are up to in my video series if you will so when it comes to the way i explain things i usually do it in four part answer which consists of first thing i would do second thing i would do third thing i would do and then last thing that i would do the reason for that is related to the fact that you might be receiving this type of question when you interview for a job. So you want your potential employer to know that you are able to properly perform this type of a process or being able to resolve this type of issue. And it tells them also that you, the way you think is the proper way to go about it and also tells them that you're very knowledgeable so uh, this is a good way to kind of practice that. All right, so let's get to it. Number four, what is the best way to install operating system on 100 computers manually? Meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any ad automated system available. So typically in a large business, everything's automated. If you were to receive 100 computers, you can just connect them to the network. You would get host names for them and you would assign them you know, which operating system to install, which programs need to be installed as well, and everything would just be done automatically. You just kind of sit back and relax and everything's done. This is why this is a hit difficult question. And this is how I would go about it. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. And that will tie in a little bit later here. I'll explain that. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. So since I don't have an option of automation, I would make sure that these computers are kind of gathered together in, in uh, preferably in, in the same room. I would connect them together, power them on, and everything like that. So that way they are uh, there for easy access for me to, you know, schedule a lot or, or start to re-image process on a lot of them. That's the point of that. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to the domain. This is why I was saying, first, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on so that afterwards, I would acquire host names for each machine so they could be added to the domain. 
And for this to happen properly, all the computers need to be connected to the network and turned on. So this can be assigned through Active Directory, also known as the main controller. So you would go inside of the Active Directory and you would create 100 computer names, also known as the host names, and then you would assign them accordingly to all of these computers that are being re-imaged. And uh, with, it, with them being connected to the network, makes it an easy process. Okay. Third, because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS installed medias to use, CD or USB. So this kind of goes back to my trying to keep them in the same area for easy access, and that's exactly why, so that I can use installed media on them. Um, afterwards, I would manually boot to inserted media and execute OS imaging process. You see how everything kind of ties, ties in? The way I would do things, it's kind of systematical, and everything kind of goes back to itself this is a great way to tell your potential employer that you have a really good way of thinking on how to resolve these big issues. Because, you know, trying to install operating system on 100 computers and doing it in a, an acceptable time frame, you got to know what you're doing and have a good plan. You know what I mean? So lastly, upon image, and image completion, I would ensure that each computer has host names attached and is added to the domain or a work group. Work group um, usually is used, you know, in a small type of business. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that if you're interviewing at a big company. But, you know, you got to make sure that is added to the domain and host name attached, meaning that associated with each computer. In addition, I would install any software required per department templates or requests. And that kind of goes back to the part of automation that I mentioned earlier that normally happens is you select the type of software that you need and it would install it automatically. In this case, you would have to do it manually, install any software required per department templates or requests. So if somebody needs Microsoft Office professionally installed, this is what we would have to do manually for each computer. And, um, you know, you would have to kind of get that information to make sure you don't spend too much time installing stuff um, uh, that's unnecessary stuff, you know what I mean? Because you don't necessarily have to install the same program on all of these computers. Because who knows? doesn't mean that all these computers are going to the same department, so they may have different templates that you would use and go by. All right, guys, I hope you find this video useful. Uh, unfortunately, in number four question here, I, there was really nothing for me to show inside the computer. But if you take a look at my previous three videos that I made uh, in regards to and in relation to this article that I wrote, you can see that I provided some uh, computer examples um, so you guys can also learn from that. There will be a link at the end of this video. Uh, there will be icons or uh, thumbnails at the end of this video as I am speaking right now. I hope you guys like this video. Please share it with your buddies. Let me know what you think. If you have any questions, I'll gladly answer them. And you have a wonderful day. Okay, make sure you have a wonderful day because I really want you to have a wonderful day. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, I wanted to talk about one of the questions that I have in my article that is called Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. And in this video, I will want to go into more of a detailed and demonstration on the answer itself. So let's go ahead and look at question number two that is within this article. And um, the question is, a user has transferred to another department within the company. And their local profile is missing many files and desktop icons. What do you think the issue could be? So the, my answer is basically in a format where you think out loud and you explain your steps on how you troubleshoot computer issues and basically is a good way for interviewer to understand that you do know how to troubleshoot um, various computer issues. So I explain it in first, second, 
third, and last format. So it's first, second, third, and lastly, which makes my format to answer this question four parts. So let's go to look at the first. I would ask the user if they move to another computer, which could mean that their files are stored at another machine. Right, so if somebody literally switches computers, of course, that new computer is not going to have those files that are stored at, at the other machine. It could also mean that the new computer does not have the same software installed and icons for those would not be present. So if the new computer does not have the same program, of course, it's not going to have those icons. So let's have a look at an example of how that looks like. Here is a brand new login or brand new local profile created for this computer and if I go inside my downloads for example it will be empty because it's a new computer if I go inside of documents it's going to be empty because I moved to a new computer if I go to desktop it's going to be empty because I moved to another computer and this is just a shortcut to Microsoft Edge and what I'm talking about missing files so it's going to miss all those files that you created on the desktop so let's say, let me, let me show you here what I mean. So if I go here and create a, you know, just a new file, it's going to show up on their desktop. So that's considered, a, you know, new file. This here is just a shortcut to the file. So, of course, you move to another computer. You haven't transferred any of your files. You haven't, you know, moved them to another computer. Of course, it's going to be empty. So that's why I explained it in such a way. Second thing is, Let's say you missing icons for the computer. Of course, you're just going to have whatever's installed on this computer. This computer just happens to have Audacity, Google Chrome, OBS Studio, Open Office, you know, and etc. But if you happen to have, you know, Microsoft Office and you had a shortcut to Outlook, to Excel, to anything else on your desktop, of course, it's not going to be there because this computer doesn't have that installed okay now let's go to the second uh, part of that answer okay and second here it says if user has not moved to another machine I would check the active directory um, if any GPO or domain profile restrictions for users new department are affecting the ability to create view or edit files so let's have a look what I mean if someone has been moved within Active Directory or their domain, chances are that their permissions to view, edit, or modify files have been changed, which could reflect on the way things look like on their computer. So if somebody moved to another department and that department has new restrictions in place where it doesn't allow them to view a lot of things which can be modified, for example, you would go in here and look at this PC or previously known as my computer in Windows 7. Chances are they may not even be able to see this. They may not even be able to see local C, let alone any files that are within the hard drive, right? Because changes on the domain level or within Active Directory have suddenly, you know, are suddenly preventing you or the new user to access, view, or edit any of these files. This sometimes happens. Some departments have more restrictions on their users or on their associates. They don't want them to do certain things. They don't want them to view certain things. So suddenly, they got migrated to the new, new uh, part of the Active Directory where they have more restrictions. This has replicated, and chances are, whenever they go in here, they won't be able to see any of this. So... Uh, by the way, one way, if, if you're missing, if you can't see local C drives or any of these drives listed here, you can just simply type in C. <laughs> a lot of times that's actually open like that. So let's go ahead and have a look at our third part of this answer. User may have received a new domain login, which inherently does not have access to previously used local profile, which has the old login ID attached to it. So if somebody, you know, moves to a new department and they decide to tell them, okay, now you're going to use this login, 
you know, when they log in, it would be just like this. You know, they log in and it would be just like this. Their new profile. This is their new profile that they got. Their, their new login is their new profile, right? And it would be empty. It would be empty just like this. So what is the reason for that? It's because their old profile has all the stuff. So let's look at root of C again and our users folder. Once we go inside of here, let's say, and, and this is the fact now, I am using this one, right? YT login. That's my login ID right now. If I previously used this one, everything that's inside of that, it's going to stay inside of that. So now I'm suddenly using this one. Of course, it's going to be empty. So in order to restore that, obviously, you will go back inside of this. Go into the, you know, if you have the permissions, obviously. Um, go inside and, you know, copy paste all the data that's within their documents and everything else on their desktop and just restore it back here, you know, into their new login. And that's the reason for that. Any time you change login ID, it's going to, you know, recreate everything brand new. And, you know, all the old stuff is going to be located on the old profile, which you can transfer back. Okay, now let's have a look at uh, my last, last thing that I would say within, in the, as, a, as an answer to this question, uh, with, you know, during an interview. Lastly, if any of the situations described apply, I would act accordingly to resolve the issue. If user files are located somewhere else and if permitted by the company policy, very important, I would transfer them back to the user. Same goes for any missing software. So what I'm saying here is that if, if it's a common practice for their company to create backups, I would restore all of their uh, all of their documents to them. And I would also transfer all the software that they used to have to the new computer if they happen to move to a new computer. Of course, this is all, you know, depending on the company's policy, their manager at the new department may say, nope, they don't need this. So, of course, you would double check that to make sure that that is allowed as well. So this is very fun thing to think about because this happens a lot in desktop support where, you know, suddenly all, everything's missing and they don't know what happened because users don't know. And, you know, sometimes they'll panic and they would go and they're like, oh, I'm missing everything. Everything's missing. And you sure enough, you go in, desktop is pretty much empty. Documents are empty. Everything's empty, but they don't know what happened. So hopefully you help them or you've been notified ahead of time. So if you're a local desktop support, uh, hopefully you've been notified ahead of time that this person is moving to another department and then you can help them, you know, by creating, you know, you know a backup of that, of their local profile or simply moving it from one computer to another, which you can simply do over the network. You know, you can just simply go through the back door and just type in backslash backslash Two backslashes, name of the computer, you know, name of the computer where they used to sit, and just type in C and dollar sign. This should be able to access their old computer. And once you do that, basically, it will just, you know, it will basically get you into the root of C like this. It would just say the name of the computer there rather than just C. And then it would say, name of the computer would see, you know, backslash C. And then you, in here, you can just go, you know, what is that? What is their old profile? And then you find it. And then, you know, usually what I do is, you know, I go like this, desktop, documents. I would highlight all of this, usually their favorites. Then I would copy and then access her or his or her computer remotely that they're using currently. You know, go back here, find their new profile, whatever that may be at the, the other computer and then just paste it, you know. Um, usually <laughs> it, it, did it, it did it like that because I did it on the same login. But if I go into and find another login, it would simply just update the profile or the folders that are there. It's not going to create duplicates. Then that only did that because I did it on the same local profile. Uh, trust me, I've done this hundreds and hundreds of times. 
All right, guys, I hope you find this video helpful in your help desk, desktop support, or whatever it is that you're doing, right? So let me know if you have any questions. I'm here for you to help you out. So don't be shy. I'll help you with any questions that you may have. And let me know if you like this type of stuff. Smash the like button. Tell, tell your friends about me. If you, you know, if you like this type of stuff, they might like it too. All right, guys, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And have a good day. Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video, I will show you how to update BIOS on HP computers. Whether it's a desktop or a laptop, the method is very similar or identical. This also can be used as a learning tool for other types of computers, name brands, or specific aftermarket motherboards. It's very important that you watch the whole video because there are a lot of issues that you may come across that I explain and I also explain to you how everything is done step by step. Very useful for desktop support or tech support in general. So the first thing we gotta do is find our BIOS. We gotta get the new version of BIOS so we can simply search for that by going to the internet and just search for our, your specific model, whether it's a model of a desktop, laptop, or motherboard, simply type it in. In my case, it's HP 800 G2, and I'm just gonna type in BIOS behind that. This should give me results, and sure enough, the top result talks about BIOS for my specific computer. Once you select that link, typically what you see on any manufacturer website is that you will get a list of all kinds of drivers for all the peripher peripherals that are on your computer. For example, audio, graphics card, networks card, storage, and such. However, we want to concentrate on a specific menu here, and that is BIOS. If we click on that and expand it, we do have a download button. We can simply click download, which we will do, Select download and we're going to click save. This will save the package of the BIOS onto our local computer. That is very straightforward. But let me just go back here and just tell you about something very specific that could be an issue for you if you come across it. It's pretty rare, but it may happen to you. Sometimes you have to update previous version of the BIOS in order to install the most recent one. So basically what happens is you try to install, uh, let's say in this case, version 02.37 version A, you may get an error that says, nope, you cannot install this until you install a previous version. And here is a link for the previous version right underneath it. If you click that, it may say you need to install, for example, version 02.3 zero revision a before you can install for example 0.37 so in the nutshell just kind of be on the lookout for that error and if you do get it this is what you have to do and this is where you find the previous versions okay so let's go ahead and open the folder where we downloaded our package copy it to my desktop just so i can have it here separated from everything else and you can see that this is a Microsoft packaged type of executable. We're going to run that here. And this is certainly one way of doing it. So if you go here, this is going to unpack it into C, SW setup, and then backslash SP94599 folder. So once we do that, it's just going to unpack it and it may start to install it from here which is certainly doable. So this thing that came up is basically some update and recovery instructions that you can use. You can also do it from here, which gives us instructions on how to do it. Once we are in a start menu, we're going to hit F10 to set up BIOS flashing. And then I'm going to actually show you this with an external camera that will record all of my steps externally so you guys can see it. So. Let's look at our unpacked 
BIOS. So let's see here. It's in the C and it's SW setup and then SP9495. So here is our flash files. And inside we have a folder called HP BIOS update REC. So we're going to go inside of that. And here we have an executable that we can run. So let's see what the um, you know what that does for us. So once we initialize this, uh, what it's going to do is going to look for the specific BIOS settings that are on your computer, and then it's going to check to see if the password is set on the BIOS, and if it's not, it's going to deny you installing of this BIOS. So let's go ahead and run this. I'm going to run this from the Windows, and again, I will show you how to do it from the BIOS itself. So we're going to, we can try to do it from here, so we can simply click Next, and our other option is to create a recovery USB flash, which is what I wanted to do. And uh, that's another way of doing it. Or you can simply copy BIOS update file to any file location or create a backup of the current BIOS to any file location. So let's go ahead and create a backup just so we have it. And it's going to create a backup of it within the same folder. So this is a really good thing to do first, just to make sure that you do have a copy of the BIOS just in case you have to revert back to the older version, which a lot of times is not even possible, but uh, HP has created this um, utility that allows you to do so, which is not the case in most of the BIOS that you update on motherboards or some other brands of computers. <clears throat> so now we have current BIOS was saved successfully. We're going to finish that. And this is actually really simple. So I don't want you to be kind of turned off by so many steps. And it's very good to learn, especially if you're doing desktop support. You know, this might be something you do. So let's go ahead and try to update it from here. And then we're going to do create recovery USB flash as well. So once we click on the update, we get this warning. It says your current Intel Active Management Technology firmware is affected by critical security vulnerability. Please update the firmware or implement mitigations immediately. So if you click OK, it kind of talks about what this is. And it's uh, Intel Active Management Technology. It's a uh, something that prevents or controls remote privileges for that computer so you know this should be fixed with the bios update if not then we can just ignore it for now and if uh, you know if you're just uh, using it as a personal computer which i am then you don't have to worry about that per se so we're just going to go move on here is an example of what i was telling you about the bios version my current bios version is 2.15 and the one that we're trying to install is 2.37. We're going to click Next. It's going to create a backup once more of our current BIOS. And then it's going to proceed or at least attempt to install BIOS through the Windows. And after which we would simply reboot the system and that BIOS update would be complete. That's in the perfect case scenario. This is not necessarily you'd be that you'd be able to do in a business environment, but that's okay. Again, I will show you how to do it manually with a thumb drive. So now it has prepared it. Now when we click restart, it's going to install it basically. So we're going to restart it. And uh, for that, I'm going to bring an external camera so we can see what happens. So here we go. Restart has started. Now we're going to see what happens after we did that. And we're certainly going to check the version that it should be, which I believe is 2.37. So now it gives us a couple of different options here. It gives us an option to update BIOS to 2.37, uh, 
postpone update or cancel update. So we're going to go ahead and update it. I'll go ahead and hit enter on that. And as you can see, it is commencing the update. It says do not shut down or remove external power from your computer during this process. Chances are that your aftermarket motherboards will have a system or utility that will allow a BIOS update just like so. You may not even have to do it in such way but it will basically involve the same thing where it would it would install it and then reboot and then you'd be pretty much done. Now it's basically just asking to reboot and there's a countdown so I'm just gonna let it do so in three seconds two one zero Oh, that's not good see I think I broke my computer after it made those horrible beeps the computer was shut down and I had to manually turn it on it turned itself off again and now it's rebooting after you saw that message that it says it was finalizing so that took about I want to say 15 to 20 seconds after for the uh, finalizing of the BIOS update. Of course, we can confirm whether this actually happened, and I will bring I will record that on screen just so you can see. So, with the update completed, we can double check to see if indeed it worked, and there are a couple of ways of doing it. You can initiate this executable once more I'm sorry this is the package but the executable that we looked at earlier and it will tell you the current version of the BIOS that's on the system so if we go back to C SW setup SP HP BIOS run this again it will show you what the current version is but you can also do it with just going into your search bar and just type in system <coughs> system information open that up and where it says bios version it says here that we have version 2.37 that was last created or updated on january 2nd 2019 which is a little bit more than two months ago okay now let me show you how to manually get into the bios update so with our USB drive plugged in here under F, what we can do is run that executable once more. We're going to go inside of C, SW setup, SP94599, and HP BIOS update folder. We're going to run that executable again. And as soon as it comes up, there it is. We're going to create a recovery USB flash. This will create a copy of our BIOS. Make sure you have the correct drive connected. Now it's copying files and it's going to put it inside of a folder called Hewlett Packard, I believe that's what it said. And here's a little notification where it says to recover a device with a flash drive, please follow these instructions. Insert the flash drive into USB power on device. You may restart up to three times, which we will do. Now let's just double check to see where it's at. Before we get to that, USB drive, Hewlett Packard. Now here's a pro tip. If you go inside a BIOS update folder here, it says it's empty, right? But that doesn't make sense much. But if you go into the BIOS folder and look at current, it actually will show you the current one, which is 2.15. But it will also show you the update file for the most recent one, which is 2.37. So sometimes the BIOS, once you go inside a BIOS, and I'll show you that in a minute, to update it manually, it will just say, I can't find these. So what you have to do is actually go back here and go back inside of BIOS. And where it says new and previous, you, you should copy them 
you should copy those files that I showed you accordingly. So you can see that it's empty. The new one and the previous one is empty. So we're going to put them inside of that. I'm surprised that HP, in our case, didn't do that. So I know this is the old one, 2.15. So we're going to go back here, and that's going to be the previous one. I'm going to put it in there. I'm going to make a copy of it. Because the BIOS thinks it's there a lot of times. So that's a pro tip right there. So, and then I'm going to make a copy of this one. Make a copy of this one, which is 2.37. This is something else that I'm copying over, so you can ignore that. So, and I'm going to put that into the new. It's going to copy it over real quick. And there it is. So now, BIOS will know exactly what to look for. We have previous. Oh, <laughs> where did it go? We have new. And then we have previous. Where did I put the previous one? Okay, well, let's go back here. Here's the previous one. Copy. BIOS. Previous. Okay. Copy it over. There it is. Okay, now we have previous and new installed. Which is something you shouldn't have to do, but if you get an error where it says, I can't find it, it's not there, not located, this is what you have to do to fix that. Okay, let's move on to the manual BIOS update procedure. You may have to press a different key combination to get to the BIOS boot menu, but it should be the escape key. And if you remember our instructions that popped up when we downloaded BIOS, it said to hit F10. I'm going to go down so you can see which menu we need and it says BIOS setup. So in the main menu, this is how it was, we need to move one, two down where it says update system BIOS and as we have a copy of the BIOS, of the new BIOS on the USB drive that's plugged in right now, we can go here, we can go down here and select update BIOS using local media. So if we hit enter, it's going to give us options to do so. But since we've already done it, the only option that's given us is to roll back the previous version, which is 2.15 as indicated. Otherwise, it would just give us an option to update to the newest version, which would then we would simply select it on our USB external storage, which is very self-explanatory. All right, my friends, I really hope that this video helps you, whether you're doing it for your personal computer or you need to learn something like this as a desktop or tech support person. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. This is what I'm here for, and I'm here to help you out with any questions that you may have. If you like this video, please share it with your friends, select the like button, or subscribe. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In this video, I am talking about Microsoft's remote desktop feature uh, that is within all versions of Windows except 3.1 and earlier, as far as I know. But XP, Windows 7 and Windows 10 will have a remote desktop. So the way you find it is just simply by searching for remote desktop. You can just type that in in your search box. So either way, once you find it, you can look it up and see that, you know, this is remote desktop. And if you work in tech support, you already are familiar with it. But then again, you're also familiar with some issues that are related to a remote desktop. And one of them is configuration and the other one is usability. So if you have a remote desktop like this, this is the default. And if you, you know, if you want to access another computer, you would simply type in the name of the computer or the IP address and you can remote desktop into it. And for the most part, that is fine, given that the remote computer is allowing remote desktop sessions. So how do we look at that? How do we find whether a computer is even enabled or allowing remote desktop session? Because here's what happens. If I just type in the name of a computer that's on the same network, so let's say computer one, 
And we know that's the host name for that computer. We're trying to connect to it, and we simply select connect, and it will try to do it, it would try to do it, and it would give me this, you know, error says you cannot do it. Well, that doesn't mean that the computer is not on the network or even part of the same domain, which it should be in order for the remote desktop to work properly. Um, I should say on the same network, it doesn't have to be on the same domain. But another reason could be is the fact that the remote desktop is disabled. So in order to check that, we would have to go to that computer and then go, then go to computer properties like so. so and then from here we would select remote settings on the left hand side. Once this comes up, we can see whether it's enabled or not. And the remote desktop is right down here. Not to be confused with remote assistance, that's something else. So if this is disabled like so, then your computer is not reachable via, via remote desktop, right? So we have to make sure that this is enabled and uh, that would do it. Um, I do like that a pop-up just came up that kind of reminded me that another reason you wouldn't be able to reach a computer one in our case or its IP address via, via remote desktop is that it might be asleep. So what I found is that as long as wake up uh, function is enabled on the computer at the BIOS settings, wake up on LAN, it will allow for that computer to wake up and then you'll be able to remote desktop into it because otherwise it'll be just like this you're trying to remote to it everything's set up correctly and you still get this and it wouldn't happen as fast usually because it would try to wake it up and then if you just give it a few seconds actually if you give it a few seconds and try again it's going to actually connect because you woken up the computer by simply pinging it with the remote desktop connection. So that's something to keep in mind. It's kind of uh, uh, kind of useful, it'll save you time instead of trying to figure out what is wrong with it and uh, or just assuming that you can't reach it or you know this and that. Um, you just kind of keep in mind that you can wake it up with the remote desktop. It just happens automatically. You just kind of have to give it a few seconds for it to happen. So aside from going to BIOS, one way to tell whether a computer is enabled for wake up on LAN is to go to computer properties and we're going to go to our device manager and then we're going to go to network adapters and then we're going to find our network adapter in my case it's Intel Ethernet connection we're going to go to properties and then we're going to look for an option that says power management inside of that we can see whether it's enabled or not. You can see it says here, allow this device to wake the computer. So that's how you tell whether it's enabled or not. And again, this can be checked in BIOS as well. Another reason is that if the computer is shut down, you cannot turn it on. Um, that's another reason why you wouldn't be able to reach a remote computer. It's not turned on. So it's not, you cannot turn it on because the remote desktop f from Microsoft does not have that function. One thing to keep in mind is that through command line, you can actually do some functions that could help you when it comes to remote desktop sessions. And there are only a couple of things that I'm aware of that you can do. And that is to either shut down or restart to computer. So in our case, shutting down the computer is not useful because we won't be able to wake it up unless we have some other means but we can restart a computer. So let's say a user has remained logged on to the computer, to the remote computer. What will happen is that whenever you initiate, you know, connection, remote desktop connection, it would say, you know, somebody else is logged on and you may not be able to log them off, you know, but you can tell there, you know, that they're not here. You know, it's three in the morning. They're not here. I need to have access to that computer. So what you can do is restart the computer. So if you go to command line and just type in shut down, this will actually bring a bunch of options that gives you ability to initiate remote desktop uh, restart. And that will kick off this remote 
desktop user, it would, it would force him. You can do uh, uh, command line as a part of the setup that you have to force the remote desktop to restart. So if you go to this section of the CMD, you can see some commands. And of course, if you do some basic research on the internet, you can come up with your own version of remote desktop restart where you can force it and it would kick off the person that is using the remote computer and that way once it restarts you can log on to that computer and make changes of course use this at your own discretion because if they remain logged in and they have some unsaved work on that computer then you may not want to restart it or force it to restart because they will lose that data so use that at your own discretion but if your computer systems or computers at your work are scheduled to restart at night and users are aware of that then there might not be any repercussions of you actually restarting the computer at 3m because that's what happens anyways another issue with remote desktop is that yes you can save your own credentials if you accept if you expand the options you can save credentials here so you don't have to type them in each time but this is only good for you and for your domain login this is not going to be useful other than that because you cannot use remote desktop while somebody else is logged on to that computer you either are using the remote desktop or using that remote computer yourself or the user is using whoever is sitting at that computer or using that computer so that's a huge huge problem with that so you can't just you know remote desktop initiate remote desktop connection and just take over the existing session that is already in progress with the user so user will not you know be able to show you remotely what is going on while other remote desktop software will allow you to do so so that's a one huge problem when it comes to remote desktop connection of course i am definitely grateful that it does exist because i still use it at work and um, especially if i'm trying to configure multiple computers or uh, access multiple secure computers at once without uh, you know letting anybody else know what i'm doing on that computer and the computers are available and not being used by the group that is sitting there so for example let's say you work you know after hours if you work after hours remote desktop connection would be just fine for you because chances are nobody else works at that company at you know 2 a.m 3 a.m or whatnot because typical hours are you know eight to five depending on the type of business so if yeah if nobody's using the computer yeah you can certainly do so log in remotely connect to that computer and configure things programs and etc and etc the last thing i wanted to talk about when it comes to remote desktop is related to audio in order to troubleshoot audio on the remote computer so let's say there is a headset or speakers connected to a remote computer you won't be able to troubleshoot it unless you make some changes to the remote desktop session uh, configuration before you actually connect to that remote computer so what you have to do is go to show options go to local resources and then select settings under remote audio select settings and then make sure that you have play on remote computer selected and then select OK. Otherwise, you won't be able to actually see components within Windows that are related directly to the sound controller. Otherwise, you would just say remote audio. So let's let's close this out here. Open our sound settings. By the way, this is a remote desktop that I'm connected to right now. If you look at the playback settings here, it normally shows, you know, real tech. This is the typical what you will see on when it comes to audio control on a computer. And if you go here, you can see that I don't have uh, I don't have a microphone connected to that remote computer. So this is everything remote. But if you haven't done uh, or changed those settings that I just showed you, which again, let me show you here real quick. Options, local resources, settings. 
If you do not select that play on remote computer and save that, it would just say remote audio here. And if you go to recordings, it would be blank. So what you're doing is actually just making changes or have the ability to make changes to your own computer, not the remote computer. However, if you change it to play on remote computer, you'll be able to actually see the sound card on the remote computer as well. So when it comes to remote desktop, it's very limited. I Again, I am glad that it does exist. It is useful. I'm not going to say it's not useful because it is, but it is very limited and compared to a lot of other software, remote desktop software available out there, it is very lacking, very lacking. So I would recommend using it if you have nothing else, but once you start using some other remote desktop software, you will realize how awesome it is when you can actually take control over user sessions in real time and they can show you what their problem is in real time as if you were there and many, many other things that are done a lot better compared to Microsoft's remote desktop. I hope you guys like this video. Please do share it with friends or family. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I am here for that purpose to help you out no matter where you are in the world. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. This is a quick desktop support tutorial on how to share an extra drive over the network. So why would you want to do this? If you want to have a centralized point on your home network and you want to share a drive that has, for example, some media files on it or some important files that you want to have quick access to or simply take up a lot of space and you want to be able to simply access it from another computer on the network, this is how you would do it. One way to do that is to share it. So let's go through this and how to do it. Does it say that this drive here is the drive I want to share? It's called New Volume and it's under letter E. We're going to right click it and we're going to select Properties and then we're going to look for a tab that says Sharing. We're going to select Sharing and then underneath what we're looking for is a button called Advanced Sharing. We're going to select that and then we're going to simply do a check mark right here where it says Share This Folder. And uh, one last thing that we have to do here in order to be able to, you know, read and write on our share drive over the network, we have to change the permissions here, which is super simple. We're going to select permissions here and we can see that by default, everyone is allowed to do so, which normally is fine. And this is why by default, you can only read, but you cannot change or write or anything like that. And especially you don't have full control. So if you want to simply select full control and allow everyone that's on the network have access to this, you can certainly do so and that would solve your problem. However, I like to add my own login because I don't want everybody to access it. So in order to do that, I'm going to remove these. I'm going to leave it read only so that everyone can see it, but they can't make changes and I'm going to add my own login. So if, if I click add, I can add my own login name, which is used for this computer where this drive is located. This is incredibly important. You want to use the login for this computer. So login name for my computer is Kobuman0. And I'm going to, you can simply double check by click check names if you want. But I, I know it exists, obviously, so I'm just going to click OK. Now we can see that it's there and it's under the name of the computer, which is called Kobuman. And the login name is Kobuman0. So this is important to remember here that the name of this computer where this drive is located is called Kobuman. So before we leave this pop-up, or before we leave this uh, box, we have to make sure that our login is selected, and then we select full control. Because if you go down to here, we can still see that everyone only has read option, and then if we do select Kobuman, we can still see that it has full control. This will allow us to create new files, folders, drop, drag and drop anything we want, and full access to it. Incredibly important. All right, now let's click apply and okay. After you click apply and okay, you can see that now this drive is being shared 
and it's indicated by two little guys here as an icon. Now let's go to the other computer and see what we can do to access this. Here we go. Here's our other computer that we're at. And now we just need to access it. So how do we do that? We remember the name of the computer, which is Kobuman, correct? We're going to type in backslash backslash Kobuman, and then another backslash, and we're going to type in the letter E, which was the drive letter for our drive that is being shared over there. I'm going to hit enter, and there we go. We have access to it. But wait, this is under everyone. Remember, we didn't put in our credentials at all. It may ask you at some point, if you're doing this for the first time, to actually put in your credentials. But if you didn't get a pop-up, you'll be using it on the default, which is everyone. So how do we rectify that? I mean, it's great. If you got the pop-up, you can just simply put in your login information. But this is just us able to access it. Let's go ahead and create what would look like just like a regular hard drive. And that is called mapping the network drive. So we're going to select our computer and we're going to select map network drive. Now let me go back, make sure you're at this tab where it says this PC and then select computer up here and then select map network drive. And here we can leave the drive letter to whatever we want. And then we're going to type in again, backslash, backslash, name of the computer, which is Kobuman, and then backslash and then drive letter. One thing to make sure to do is place a check mark right here, which says connect using different credentials. This will let us specify the login we want to use with full control. And with a pop up here, uh, we can see that um, I already tried this earlier, but let's go ahead and this is how it looked like. I'm going to click, you know, use different account. And then I'm going to type in the name for the login on the remote computer, which is Kobuman0. And then I'm going to type in my password and select remember my credentials. You know, kind of remember to select that, click OK. And now we're inside of our drive. You can see now it comes up as a network location. Another way to do this is add a network location, but I just map it as a network drive. So now that we go inside of it, we have direct access to it. We can create new folder. We can go inside, create new files, drag and drop, whatever we want. And it's all great and dandy. This is also a good way to use a remote drive as a backup location if you are doing desktop support. For example, let's say you're, you know, reimaging a computer and you need a remote location to use as a backup for users' profiles. This is a good way of doing it. So you have a backup. Also, if you're replacing your hard drive or something like that, that you need a good remote place to quickly back up all your files. I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, please share it or like it. If you have any questions, I am here to help you answer them. So feel free to ask me anything. Thank you and have a good day. Welcome to Help Desk Startup Learning Guide. This is a collection of videos created for youtube.com forward slash Kobuman channel and combined to provide a single point in learning help desk. What you will learn here is based on personal experience and opinion of what you must know before starting IT help desk. Yes, this video is specifically designed to help you get a help desk job. Below is a list of each topic presented in its format as a basic start to help desk. Make sure you watch the entire video so that you become familiar with help desk knowledge and procedures. For the first video, we have an introduction. Can anyone get an IT help desk job without experience? For a second video, we have top 20 most common desktop PC support issues and solutions. For the third video, we have help desk and the customer service call handling procedures. Hello, welcome to a tutorial video on how to get an IT job 
without any experience. This is a simple step-by-step -step guide that should provide the basic guidance needed to succeed. This preparation method can be applied to other jobs and not just IT. Keep in mind that this video is going to be very direct without any sugarcoating. Yes, it is a bit harder to get a job with no experience, but with time and patience it will get you there. You just need to get your foot in the door. After you acquire some experience, it will be much easier to get even better positions in IT. Number 1. You need a good resume. For this part, I need you to pause the video, look up an example of IT resume in Google, and have it side by side so that you can follow along. After you have a resume up, play the video again. Keep in mind that you can adjust resume titles to what works best for you. On your resume, under experience, list anything you have done related to IT. Let's say you know how to build computers. You would list that. Let's say you know how to set up a server. You would list that. Let's say you know how to build a website. You would list that. Let's say you have a good customer service experience working somewhere. You would list that. Just keep adding information by yourself that may be related in any way to the job you are applying for. You do not need more than one page for resume size, so it should be easy to fill out. Therefore, when it comes down to it, you do have some experience. Number two, when applying for a job, always provide a cover letter to why you are interested in this job and why they should hire you. For this part, talk about how you have the knowledge for this specific job. Sure, you can mention that you have the ability to learn but it's best to keep facts in reality. Some employers may be looking for some one to teach a new job, but most are looking for someone who can do the job already. Number three, be prepared for interview questions for the job you're applying for. A good place to start is my own YouTube forward slash Koboman channel that has a variety of different interview questions and answers for multiple IT jobs. Number four, fear. There's nothing to be nervous about because recruiters know exactly what to expect by reading your resume. Think of it this way, even if you don't get the job, going through some interviews is a good learning experience. Go to the interviews for purpose of learning and getting better, which is something that will come on its own, but only with practice. With so many jobs out there, you are bound to get one for sure. You may not get the first one or second one, but that third interview you will know exactly what to expect and being scared will go away. Just be friendly, smile and act professional. This could be the main reason for getting a job, especially when it comes down to multiple candidates for the same job. Employer will usually pick the friendly and polite person if given a choice between similar applicants. You need to trust in your knowledge. Experience will come on its own, but only when you try. Number five, interview dress code is important. Formal suit 
is the safe way to go about it and shows that you are very serious about this job. However, you could wear business casual attire, which consists of dress pants, dress shoes, dress shirt, or polo style shirt. Lastly, please do me a favor and either share or like this video with anyone who may need help getting a good job. So many folks out there could use this type of guidance. Thank you all so much. Congratulations, you've made it through the first part of the video. And before we start the second part, I just wanted to quickly mention that I have some cool design t-shirts available below the video if you're interested in supporting me and my content. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining me on this fun and educational video. What comes next are some of the most common desktop support issues that you can expect to encounter during your tech support adventures. All issues are randomly sorted from super easy to funny, so sit back, relax, and let's have some fun. Issue number one, mouse is not working or it has sticky keys. The cause for this could be dirt or spilled drinks. But the solution for this is to replace the mouse. Keep in mind, mouse you can't really clean up like you used to. Uh, you know, back in the day, you have those uh, uh, those old mice that had a ball inside, and you can unscrew the bottom of it. You kind of pop it open. You pop the little ball out, and then you can clean the little rollers around it, and they can like fix the mouse. But you know, but you know, if you had a sticky key on it, you can't, you know, you can't really fix it. You know, not not at least, you know, regular people like us. You know, this is and, and the mice the mice are so cheap. So in this situation, you would just replace the mouse. Issue number two: keyboard is not working properly, or it has sticky keys. The cause of this could be dirt or spilled drinks. Um, solution is to replace the keyboard. So similar to replacing the mouse, you know, keyboards, you can't, it's really hard to clean if you, you clean it if you spill something. Sure, there are, you know, uh, spill resistant keyboards out there, but you're not going to find something at, at, the, at a business place, something like that, because they tend to be more expensive and, you know, just the regular keyboards are cheap, so just replace it. Issue number three, monitor is not working. Cause for this could be power button not pressed, loose power cable, loose video signal cable, or just a bad monitor. Um, solution to this is to press the power button, check the cables, or replace the monitor. Issue number four, computer has no network connection. The cause for this could be network cable disconnected, um, it could be also a bad network cable, but that's very um, unlikely. You know, that doesn't happen often. It, it is possible, but it does not happen often. Um, the, solution, the solution to this is to plug in the network cable or replace the network cable. Issue number five. A specific website is not working. Cause for this could be that specific website may be down or user, user has the wrong or mistyped link. You know, it happens. Um, the solution to this would be, if it's an internal website, contact um, support um, for that website. So if it's an internal website, chances are you will have, you know, tech support for that website that has access to the server. But if it's an external, wait for it to come back. I mean, there's really not much you can do if google.com goes down. And then afterwards, have user try the correct website link. Issue number six, files or data is missing. The cause for this could be user deleted this data or user forgot to save data. And in some cases, user moved the data or files into a, another folder. So it'd be a sticky key. You know how occasionally you would try to click on something and you would still be still still be holding on to the uh, the file that you're trying to click on, and then you just accidentally drag it into a, another folder. 
Um, the solution to this is to attempt to recover data if possible through Windows Restore or backup solution, or if it's, uh, you know, if it, the file's been moved, you would just simply, you know, look for that. Look for the uh, adjacent folders to see if the files are there. Issue number seven, user can no longer receive or send emails. So the cause for this could be user's inbox has reached its limit size set by the Exchange server or Windows password is not set. So what does that mean? Um, if, you are, if you have an email provided by your business, the email is going, to be, is going to be handled by the Exchange server. Typically, Exchange server has a limit for your inbox. So your main folder that you receive your email through has a limit of how big it can be. So for example, let's say it's 200 megabytes limit for that inbox. Then if you receive a bunch of emails that have you know, attachments or you just have thousands of emails, chances are it will fill up fairly quickly and it will go beyond that 200 megabytes at which point you cannot receive any more or, or even send any more emails, okay? And the part about Windows password not set is basically the Outlook, uh, Microsoft Outlook is asking for your new Windows password. So this happens a lot when um, someone has changed their password within Windows, but they haven't updated their Outlook, okay? Um, solution to this is to delete or archive old emails, delete old calendar notices that have attachments. Keep in mind that calendars also count as part of the inbox. Okay, and um, lastly, um, you know, update the password. Um, you know, w within the Outlook, Outlook is going to ask you what's the new password. You would type it in, or you can just simply just close Outlook, open it back up, and it'll work. Issue number eight: the printer does not work. Cause for this could be a printer is not installed, user trying to use another printer, printer out of paper or ink. The solution to this is to install the printer, change default printer, and add paper or ink. Issue number nine, computer is slow. Cause Computer is installing delayed updates. This happens if user turns off the computer after their shift. Um, low RAM could be the cause or bad hard drive. Solution, educate user to not turn off the computer at the end of the day, add more RAM, change hard drive, or just reinstall the operating system. Issue number 10. My phone headset is not working. Cause sound options for recording or playback devices is not set properly. The solution, the solution to this would be configure recording and playback devices. Um, in rare occasion, it's the headset itself that's broken, uh, but most of the time, it's the recording and playback devices that are not set properly. Issue number 11, blue screen of death. Mostly caused by bad hardware or drivers. From my personal experience, blue screen of death was either bad hardware or bad drivers. So the solution to this would be to replace the broken hardware. And this you could, you know, determine by you know, doing the hardware diagnostic, you know, and, and or reinstall the operating system. Cause sometimes, you know, there wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to find any, you know, apparent hardware issues or even driver issues. So sometimes starting with a clean slate could resolve this issue, you know. Issue number 12, user can't log into PC. User cannot log into PC. A very, very common one. I get this call every day. The cause is wrong password, user locked out of their account, or they have caps lock key on. 
So the solution to this would be reset the password, enable their account, and tell them to disable the caps lock. Very simple. Issue number 13. Computer restarts for no reason. The cause for this most of the time is computer installing delayed updates. Occasionally, the cause for this would be a, a computer stuck in a loop, most likely trying to install some kind of update or, or software. That's a rare case, but in most cases, it's just trying to install an update and it, it restarts sometimes a couple of times, you know? Uh, the solution to this is to simply wait for computer to finish installing updates. Issue number 14. Wi-Fi is slow. Cause for this? Well, a lot of times Wi-Fi is just slow. You know, it's, it's, it's especially, you know, I mean, anytime you're dealing with, you know, something that has to provide a signal, um, wireless signal, then chances are that it might become slow or not have the same bandwidth as you know, physically connected to the network. And of course, the solution to this is connect the PC physically to the network. Issue number 15. This trouble ticket would simply say, state computer is not working. Cause for this, anything you can think of, not enough information. The solution to this is reach out to user for more information. Issue number 16, the internet is down. Cause network cable unplugged, proxy settings changed, specific website is down. Um, with these type of uh, trouble tickets, they may come through with just a simple statement where it says the internet is not down. You know, the, the user needs to be a little bit more specific. So you kind of have to uh, uh, ask them for more information. Um, solution to this is check network cable, check proxy settings, check the website or websites that user is connecting to, you know, to make sure that they have the correct links because Sometimes user may assume that the whole internet is down, which has never happened. Issue number 17, change the password. Now I can't log in. The cause to this is user changed the password and now they don't know it. There's a, you know, it's, you'd be surprised how often this happens. Um, the solution to this is to reset the password. And I gotta say, this happened quite a few times where the same user would get reset multiple times in the day. So it, it's user error, basically. One of my favorites, issue number 18, nothing is working. Cause? user is having a mental breakdown. So the solution to this is to replace the PC or replace the user. Issue number 19. I need access to the Q drive. Cause for this, user either needs login access to the Q drive or needs it mapped to their PC. Solution to this is ask user, what is this Q drive? I mean, it could be any number of network paths. There are a lot of, you know, shared drives, network shared drives out there. You know, just saying that it's a Q drive doesn't tell us much. You can name the drives anything you want. Once the actual name of the network path is determined, ask user if they need their credential access or add it to their PC. So chances are the user could mean that they don't actually have credential access to it. 
So that means even if it's added to their computer, even if it's mapped to their computer, they won't be able to get in. They could mean that, we don't know. So we just have to find out. Issue number 20, computer crashed. What could be the cause to this? Hardware or driver issues? You have to do the diagnostic of the hardware and the software to determine what caused the crash. You can go back to the log system log files and see what caused it. You know? Solution is ask user how and what they were doing when it crashed to help you narrow it down. And then of course, like I said, perform system diagnostic, diagnostic if needed. Welcome to Help Desk Call Handling Procedures. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. One of my viewers recently asked me if there is a call handling format for Help Desk. The answer is yes. There is a format to follow, but this varies from business to business. However, every Help Desk has a common path to follow that basically achieves the same goal, which is to resolve issues. There could be multiple steps to handling just the intro. In this example, I have broken down the procedure in seven steps that should reflect the professionalism and call handling proficiency. Step number one. Thank you for calling tech support. My name is Irvin. May I have your phone number, account number, or etc. so that I can pull up your information. And if you've noticed at the end, I have phone number, account number, or etc. because this will vary from business to business. Some businesses may train you to ask for the phone number first. Some may say, ask for the account number first or anything else. Number two, in order to secure your account, can you please verify your date of birth, last four of social security number or etc. If you don't have this information, that's okay. We can also secure your account by answering some questions. As you notice, the second part is usually to secure the account to make sure that we are speaking to the correct customer or the user. A lot of times you would ask for date of birth, last four of social security number, or even etc. for example, to verify their home address. If they don't have this information, some companies also use a format in which customer answers some questions that they've set up previously. For example, what is the name brand of the car that you owned or what is the name of your pet? Number three, listen to the customer's issue carefully and then ask questions based off previous experiences. This comes after you are familiar with companies, products or services. Each business will train their associates to familiarize themselves with different issues and procedures. So let's say a customer calls in and says, this product I bought is no longer working or there's something wrong with it. Of course, you will have the training from the business that you work for to handle this properly. You just have to make sure you pay attention and ask proper questions based off your experience, whether it be from training or simply from many calls that you've handled in the past. Number four, I'm sorry, would you mind repeating that? In case you've missed something, a lot of customers talk really fast for anyone to follow. So this is something you will have to ask occasionally in order to, you know, help the customer properly. You need to understand what they are saying. So it is okay to ask the customer to repeat themselves. Just be polite about it. Number five, sometimes you have to place customer on hold, but this is usually done with no more than two minutes before you have to come back and say that you're still working on the issue. Again, this will vary from business to business. From my experience, two minutes is an average allowed time to place a customer on hold. However, a business that you work for may say one minute before you have to go back and say, hey, just to let you know, I'm still working on your issue. And the reason for this is because it reflects on good customer service. However, 
the underlining reason for this is production. The business you work for wants you to be very productive and resolve issues as efficiently as possible. Step number six, is there anything else that I can assist you with? Or have I resolved your issue? As closing, do not hang up on the customer until the customer says either yes or no, confirming that their issue has been resolved. The last thing we want is to hang up on the customer and their issue has not been resolved. This reflects poorly on the company and the service that customer service provides. This is incredibly important. Thank you for calling Tech Support. You have a wonderful day. At this point, you're just ending a call with a nice gesture. However, some businesses will have you ask the customer to take a survey. This will vary from business to business, of course. This concludes our video. Keep in mind that some aspects of Help Desk are omitted because they are specific to the company you may work for. For example, a basic issue that is handled by IT Help Desk is resetting changing user passwords, which is done by a company provided tool and not necessarily through Active Directory. However, I have videos on many of these topics, including desktop support, network administration, system administration, NOC support, and much more. If you think this information is useful and appreciate my effort, please share this video with your friends, and I appreciate all of your support. Thank you, and have a wonderful day. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Welcome to Desktop Support Training Medley. This video serves as a training for someone who wants to do desktop support. So what I've taken is two of my very popular videos and created 18 various problems and solutions scenario for you to learn or test your desktop support skills. If you find that you can answer or deal with any of these issues on your own, well, congratulations, you are ready to apply for desktop support. If you like this video, please share it or like it. I really appreciate it, and I wish you best of luck. Have a nice day. Welcome to Top 10 Desktop PC Issues and Problems. In this video, we will talk about Top 10 Desktop PC Issues and how to resolve them. Of course, there are multiple ways to resolve any computer issues, and the ones presented here provide an example of that. If you know a better solution, please leave me a comment. I would love to learn about other possible solutions for any of these issues. If you are interested in additional educational material, my channel youtube.com forward slash Kobuman has over 300 videos that you can enjoy. Additionally, if you'd like to support me, you can do so through patreon.com forward slash Kobuman link in description below. Number one, blue screen of death. Cause, typically caused by driver or hardware conflict. Solution, take a look at the dump file to figure out exactly what the cause of the error is. Alternatively, update hardware drivers, or consider the situation in which blue screen of death happen. For example, you've installed new hardware or software. Also, you might want to run hardware diagnostics. Number two, missing DLL files. Cause, typically caused by incomplete software installation. Solution, reinstall software, find the missing DLL, and copy it to System32 and or SysWow6432 folder. Register DLL if needed 
through command prompt. Example, reg svr32 space and then the name of the DLL. Number three, software or application will not install. Cause, not enough drive space. Newer version already installed. You didn't install prerequisite software. For example, VC Red Disk X64, MS.NET, or DirectX. Or not compatible with the operating system. Solution. Free up space on hard drive. Look for previous installation of newer software. Install all prerequisites. Acquire compatible OS. Number four. Software or OS is running slow. Cause. Lack of resources, such as RAM, CPU, or hard drive. Virus or malware infection. Missing updates. Solution. Open Task Manager and look for RAM or virtual memory allocation. Any applications use all of the RAM? Adjust virtual memory if necessary. Check CPU usage levels. Check your hard drive space. Through Task Manager, check the system processes and look for sketchy names using a lot of CPU or RAM. Virus can have similar name to common Windows components. Perform full system scan for viruses. If you have a virus that you can't remove, consider OS re-image or reinstall. Install all updates for your computer, let them finish, reboot. Updates can take up resources and time. As a side note, you can also upgrade to an SSD storage for a huge boost in OS performance. Link in description below. Number five, computer restarting multiple times. Cause, software or Windows updates, or a virus. Solution, let the Windows updates finish. Windows updates alone can restart the computer many times and take a long time. Run virus scan. Number six. Suddenly, applications or computer behaving abnormally. For example, software keeps crashing, missing files, or runs slow. Cause, virus infection or hard drive going bad. Solution, run virus scan, check Windows system logs for NTFS system errors or other 
or other hard drive related logs. Replace hard drive if necessary. Number 7. Internet or website issue. Error. 404 page not found. Cause. Page is missing or deleted. Wrong website link or website is down. Solution. If specific page is missing, search the website for desired content. Double check the website link because it may have been changed. If all pages are 404, contact website owner. Number 8. Computer is running hot. Overheating. Cause. Poor airflow. Not enough system fans. Dust or dirt accumulation. CPU fan not working. CPU heatsink is loose. Power supply unit fan is not working. Computer case is open. Overclocking. Room or ambient temperature is too high. Solution. Add system case fans. Clean your computer from dust. If CPU fan is not working, replace it. If CPU heatsink is loose, attach it. If power supply unit fan is not working, replace power supply. Close the computer case. Stop overclocking. Lower room temperature or move the computer. Number 9. Low memory RAM or hard drive storage. Cause. Too many programs open, such as games, video editing software, large Excel spreadsheets, and etc. See Task Manager. Hard drive storage too small. Solution. Close application that use too much RAM and only use one at a time. Perform this cleanup to free up space. This should remove recycle bin, download folder, cache data, temp files, old operating system restore points. Alternatively, you can purchase more RAM or add a second hard drive. Link in description. Number 10. Very slow internet. Cause. Too many downloads at the same time. Too many computers sharing internet connection. Bad Wi-Fi signal. Virus or malware infection. Solution. Limit downloads. If too many people are sharing internet, you can limit or set max speed in router for even distribution of bandwidth. 
check Wi-Fi signal distance and adjust in router. Check PC for virus or malware infection. Reset router. Call internet provider. Question number one. When using a remote desktop, you come to realize that the remote computer is not reachable by using a host name. What would be the troubleshooting steps to take in order to resolve this issue? Keep in mind that the remote computer is turned on and on the same physical network. First, I would check to see if the remote computer's host name is part of the same domain. Also, would check to see if the remote computer is enabled within the main if it has been added. Second, I would try to ping the computer by using the host name. If an error comes up, it would determine my next step. For example, if message is cannot resolve host name, I would try pinging the computer using its IP address. Third, I would check for possible DNS issues if computer is reachable with IP address. If using IP address, I can connect to the remote computer or use remote desktop session, it could indicate a replication issue of the DNS server. Lastly, if I have physical access to the computer, I would check the DHCP settings or look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. However, this is unlikely if computer is reachable by IP address or if it has been part of the network for the same time. Question number two. A user has transferred to another department within company and their local profile is missing many files and desktop icons. What do you think the issue could be? First, I would ask the users if they move to another computer, which could mean that their files are stored at another machine. It could also mean that the new computer does not have the same software installed and icons for those would not be present. Second, if user has not moved to another machine, I would check the Active Directory if any GPO or domain profile restrictions for user's new department are affecting the ability to create, view, or edit files, which could also be the reason for not seeing certain desktop icons. Third, user may have received a new domain login ID, which inherently does not have access to previously used local profile, which has the old login ID attached to it. Lastly, if any of the situations described apply, I would act accordingly to resolve the issue. If users' files are located somewhere else, and if permitted by the company's policy, I would transfer them back to user. Same goes for any software that is missing. Question number three. Your office receives a new printer, and now it needs to be configured for everyday use by a specific department in your building. How would you go about installing this printer in direct IP printing setup. First, I would unpack the printer and make sure that it has all parts and cables. Then I would connect and plug in the printer into power and network port available at designated location. Second, I would make sure that this new printer has a static IP address assigned to it and acquire a driver package for a specific model of the printer unless the printer is set up to push the driver automatically and upon request. Typically, printer would push the driver. Third, Active Directory needs to know of the printer added to the domain, and this can be done by assigning a printer hostname and adjusting GPO settings that allows the users of that department to use that printer. If driver has to be pushed separately, this can be configured as well. Lastly, I would notify the users of the new printer and its IP address and assist accordingly. 
Question number four. What is the best way to install OS on 100 computers manually? Meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any automated systems available. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to domain. This can be assigned through Active Directory. Third, because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS install media to use, for example CD or USBs. Afterwards, I would manually boot to inserted media and execute OS imaging process. Lastly, upon image completion, I would ensure that each computer has a host name attached and is added to domain or workgroup. In addition, I would install any software required per department, templates, or requests. Let's just pause for a few seconds here. As you may have noticed, all of these questions require you to explain your way of doing things. I also have top 20 desktop support questions and answers that talk about specific technical aspects of the interview. Link in the video description below. Question number five. From a desktop support point of view, how would you deal with user migration to a new domain? How would you deal with users affected by this change? First, I would make sure that users and their management is aware that this change is coming and how it will affect them. Second, I would choose a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. This can be communicated with the network team. Third, I would reach out to department managers to coordinate the switch so that the production impact is minimized. This would involve application and website access testing on the new domain before converting everyone else. Lastly, once all testing on a new domain is successful, a green light would be given to convert all other host machines to the new domain. Question number six. The entire building is switching over to the gigabit network and you are to assist with this process. How would you handle this project? First, I would work with the network team to decide on the new IP network ranges and make sure that certain machines receive static IP addresses. Second, if any network cables need to be upgraded, it would be coordinated with members of desktop support and the network team. For example, CAT5E is a minimum cable rating for gigabit speeds. Third, if any changes affect printers and other static devices such as servers, this has to be communicated to users and make appropriate changes to each machine. Lastly, the most important thing would be the testing part before deployment because there is a chance that certain applications require firewall exceptions for their IP or our range of IP addresses. Question number seven. One day you come into work and find that major systems are down. However, you also see that ticketing system has 50 plus unassigned or unworked tickets. How would you prioritize and how would you go about dealing with both problems? And how many users are impacted? This will determine which issue to work on first. Tickets would be the last priority. Second, if multiple system issues are related, then I would handle this issue on my own, if possible. If issues are not related, in that case, I would recruit help from coworkers and possibly assigned individually if manager is not present. Third, I would proceed to troubleshoot the issue and get as much information as possible before reaching out to any other support groups that manage specific aspects of systems affected. In this case, support team is essential to resolve major issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team. Lastly, once issues with major systems are resolved and the bulk of users are back to work, then I would concentrate on resolving tickets unassigned. 
Of course, it goes without saying that during crisis issue, all of the management would be notified of progress and solution, and lastly, the root cause. Question number eight. Explain a situation in which you had to deal with difficult problem and how you went about resolving it. First, an example in which I had difficulty resolving happened all the time, and this is due to not having immediate access to systems involved. Anytime I had to deal with a server network or website issue that I don't have access to, I would have to involve other groups or members of IT, IT team to assist. Second, a more specific example would be a web-based systems application stopped functioning, which affected 500 plus users. And since I don't have access to the application server, the support team for that application was immediately contacted because the issue was affecting multiple users, which means the issue is not local due to that fact. Of course, the first thing I would look at is the error information that would provide clues to what the issue may be. Third, I would gather all information related to the system outage, which would typically include number of users, specific errors, example computer IP addresses affected, time the issue occurred, and also test to see if issue persists using alternative methods. To make sure that this issue res is resolved as fast as possible, this information is crucial. Upon having this information available, appropriate support teams would be contacted. Lastly, I would work with the support team and users affected to help resolve the issue by providing feedback and testing as required. In the meantime, it is also important that management is aware of the situation and receives regular updates on the matter. This includes IT and users management. If you appreciate this video, please leave a like or share this video. Thank you so much and I wish you best of luck, my friends. All right, here we go. The main name system, also known as DNS. In this video, I'm going to attempt to explain it in a way where it's easier to understand. Again, that's the shtick of my channel, guys, so I'm going to try to do that. Um, but before we do so, please take one second to like the video. I'm sure you will enjoy it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And let's get into it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about DNS. So for that, I think we're going to start with our most commonly used website, and that is Google.com. Com. Just by typing in google.com, you are using DNS. So even if you're unaware of what DNS is, you are using it every time you are using the internet. So keep that in mind. It's very interesting in the way that actually works. So if we type in DNS in google.com, if possible, it's going to pull from the wikipedia.org and it's going to give us an explanation of what it is and possibly a few images of it. We can get back to that, but let's kind of kind of glance over it to see what it says. DNS stands for Domain Name System, and here it uh, implies that it's IP, meaning Internet Protocol. So, Domain Name System here implies that it's used by Internet Protocol. So, the way I'm going to actually go about this video is explaining DNS to people who are not familiar with the, what DNS is, basically somebody who's new to computer science. So if we look at the quick description here, and this description comes directly from the Wikipedia, it says the main name system is hierarchical and decentralized naming system for computer services and or other resources connected to the internet or a private network. So this seems like a good source for us to actually go to, and uh, we're going to do so. We're going to go to our Wikipedia link there, and we're going to use this as our basically learning material, sort of like a textbook, because Wikipedia, although anybody can technically edit it, uh, generally speaking, is correct with the information that it's proposed or with the information that is presented, I should say. And also it's part of creative comments. So that way it's okay for me to use this text as part of my video. Okay, here we go. The main name system, and we're going to read this again real quick, and I'm going to try to teach it in a way just like you would teach it in a classroom. The main name system is hierarchical and decentralized naming system for computer services or other resources connected to the internet or a private 
network. So if we start from the beginning here and just literally concentrate on the meaning of DNS, it will give us a really good idea and understanding of what DNS is. So if you look at first word here, it says domain. Domain is basically a group of computers. A group of computers that are connected on some level. In this case, it's connected, they're connected at the application level, which basically is the entirety of the internet. So if you look at the here, the internet protocol suite here, and it talks about application layer and has DNS in here, application layer is part of the OSI layer, and there are seven layers of that. Now let's get back to the word domain. Again, domain means just a place. Okay, think of domain as in uh, back in the day of, uh, uh, well, well, okay, let's talk about King Arthur, right? King Arthur's legend, and uh, it, it's a fictional story, obviously, but you know how they have their own kingdoms and domains? That's pretty much what it is. So if King Arthur is within his kingdom, he has his domain, that's basically his area and everything around that, that he controls. That's his domain. So you can look, think about it in the same way as in computers, okay? And you can have domains at local level, obviously, you know, just because King Arthur controls a certain amount of land and area, and that's his domain, that doesn't mean that businesses, for example, a large business can have their own private domain. This is why it talks about private networks here at the last part of this sentence. So if you work at a business, they're going to have their own private domain that doesn't necessarily follow the rules or belong to internet at all. It's private for security reasons, right? And then if we look at the other word that kind of connects to the that connects to it, so domain name, basically it's it's literally that. It's the name of the domain. So in this example, the easiest example and the perfect example of that is where we are right now. If you look at wikipedia.org, that's called a domain name. So you see how that's kind of tying, tying in together? So you have a domain, but of course you got to name it. You got to give it a name. In this case, the, the name of this domain name is Wikipedia. Dot org And it could be anything like google.com, yahoo.com, microsoft.com, or whatever. So where and so the question comes up here, so how does wikipedia.org here, how does wikipedia.org have a domain? Where does it get it from? Who names this domain? So if we ask King Arthur, what is the name of your domain? You know, he might say, well, it's called Wikipedia, you know? <laughs> And that's kind of, uh, but for that to happen, we need some kind of a system to actually does that. Uh, in this case, we don't, uh, King Arthur can name his domain whatever he wants, as long as it's a private domain, uh, and, and you can request that. But if it's a public domain, in this case, wikipedia.org, then we need a system for that. Get it? So it's a domain name system. This is why, if you were to go to a website that sells domain names. So let's say you decide that you suddenly want wikipedia.org for yourself. You search for it and it's going to say, well, looks like somebody else already reserved the right to call their uh, website or their domain that. So it's a public domain name. Uh, this is not owned. The name Wikipedia might be owned by Wikipedia company, but it's not owned, domain is not owned by anybody. You cannot own a domain. It's a public thing unless you reserve the right and pay for the right to use it. So if Wikipedia forgets to renew their right to use wikipedia.org and let's say I or you go to, I don't know, any of those websites that, that can sell you a domain name for your website and then you reserve it, there that it belongs to you for that amount of time that you reserved it for. And for that to happen, you need a DNS or a domain name system. 
whether it's set up to work in an internet environment, which it is, um, then, or, or whether it's on a private network, in which case a private company will have their own domain, which would be called, I don't know, private network number 5com You know, you can call whatever you want because it's going to be centralized, you know. And of course, for all of and of course for all of this to happen, you got to have some kind of hierarchy, right? Hierarchy means just an order of things, and for that, the DNS system itself controls that. So whenever you go and you know you try to get your own domain name, let's say Bob Bobson.com, I don't know. It could be anything really. It could be I want a domain name dot com. You know, chances are you can reserve that as well. But it is a naming system for computers. There is a lot more to it uh, than just getting the name for your website. There is a part of it uh, that kind of talks about or explains on how it actually works in the background and what what is the other purpose of the DNS. So it is a naming system for computer services or other resources connected to the Internet or a private network so we already explained that but let's see how it actually works why is it why do we even need it why is it even there you know aside from just being a hierarchical uh, order of things like a I don't know phone book you know how you have a phone book everybody's got their own names and their phone numbers in it that's the part that's kind of what DNS does as well except it instead of instead of just having um, names for example wikipedia.org it will also have instead of phone numbers associated with it will have ip addresses associated with it or routed to it and just kind of hold on to that hold on to that thought and uh we will <laughs> we will touch on that here in a moment as well so let's let's read the next sentence it associates Various information with the main names assigned to each of the participating entities. So what are they talking about here? You know how I talked about a phone book and how there are people in the phone book. So there is a person's name in there and there is their phone number. Same thing happens with the DNS. You have, for example, wikipedia.org and then we know that's wikipedia.org. Well, the DNS system needs to know what is the IP address that it goes to. So, in this case, you can say that the wikipedia.org is a person in the phone book, but in order to reach that person, you got to call the number, right? In this case, wikipedia.com. When you type in wikipedia.org, I'm sorry, not .com, wikipedia.org, it dials that number for you in the sense, if you will. But in this case, it's an IP address. So what is this IP address? All right, let's find out. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to co open up a command command prompt, command line. I'm going to ping it. I'm going to ping wikipedia.org. And there it is. <laughs> Here is the IP address for wikipedia.org. So if we were looking at wikipedia.org, if we were looking at a phone book or a directory, in our case, it's going to be a domain name book, domain name book, right? And I looked up Wikipedia. Imagine we were flipping through pages and we we're like Wikipedia, 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 Wikipedia.org. Aha! And then there is the number to dial, basically, to get to it. By pinging wikipedia.org, we get an IP address of the location where Wikipedia is located. It's home address, if you will, if we're still using the analogy of the phone book. Very simple. In this case, I know this looks kind of confusing. This doesn't look like a regular IP address, but this is actually a version 6 IP address. This is why it looks like that. It's a combination of letters and numbers, but I'm sure you guys are used to seeing you know, typical IP addresses like you see at home, for example, 192.168.0.1 or whatever, you know. This is just the version 6 of that IP address. These are the new homes, guys. These are the new homes that are built 
for the internet. All right, I hope that kind of gives you a an idea of what I hope I'm actually successful in telling you, explaining to you what DNS is and what it does at a basic level uh, for somebody who is uh, being introduced to computer science. So, and of course, if you keep reading this, and I highly encourage you that you do go read this uh, on Wikipedia, it says here, most prominently in translates more readily memorize the main names to the numerical IP addresses needed for locating and identifying computer services and devices and devices with the underlying network protocols. So it basically tells you exactly what I told you in just more of a textbook type of way, you know. And then we can, um, you know, I can go through this here and just keep going through each sentence and keep breaking everything down, but then it will kind of confuse you. Uh, even more, because literally first two sentences uh, can be used in my for me to explain to you uh, what the DNS stands for. And if you want to kind of understand it even more on a more technical level, you can literally go through here and read it for yourself. Uh, but again, in this video, I just wanted to make sure that DNS is understood for people who are just... Um, you know, starting to learn DNS or, hey, people, maybe people who just don't know what DNS is. Maybe they heard of it, but they don't know how it works on a basic level. And well, at least they don't know how to, they, maybe they don't understand that um, in the way I explain it. You know, I have a specific way of explaining things. And this was what, uh, uh, this is what makes me unique, I guess. And I think some people like it. And because it's just different way of, approaching the same issues in the sense of how do we learn these computer terms. So the way I explain it, I always try to relate it to the real world examples as best as I can. I hope you like my style of teaching. Please let me know what you think. If you have any comments, please leave them below. You know what, if you just need help or if you want me to do make another video, just let me know. I'll gladly do them and I like the way I teach. I try to relate it to the real world so that way it's easy to understand. I hope you appreciate this. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. So there will be a time when you come into work and suddenly there's a lot of work that needs to be done. How would you deal with that? Hello, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about a situation in which you would have to think fast, think fast, think fast to resolve computer issues. So this video is good for help desk tier one, tier two, or desktop support or tech support, or if you're the guy that just simply works at a location as tech support for a company. So in this case, we have four different uh, trouble tickets that came through the system, but they are something that was left over from the previous shift or from the previous group that was in charge of that. So I'm gonna show you how I would quickly resolve these issue. So this kind of uh, give you, will give you an idea of how I'm thinking and I will actually give you a kind of uh, uh, an idea of my level of knowledge or level of expertise, a level of experience. But before we do that, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. It makes a big difference for me. And without any further delay, let's get into it. Okay, so here we go, guys. Uh, we've got some tickets we're going to work on. What is this? Oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys watched my previous video um, on Actor Directory. Uh, I do uh, suggest you check it out. Uh, we worked on some of these people. We created some user accounts, put them in their different groups, and we got, you know, the different people that we created on there, like Mary Pipkins, Mike Bobson, and Larry Buffett, and we put them all in there if you want to check that out. I do have a video on that. It's, uh, uh, I think it's Actor Directory for Beginners or something like that. Yeah, check that out. It's a good video. All right. So I made some of these tickets during uh, testing of the live stream that I made, I want to say a couple of weeks ago. So they are uh, quite expired. So as you can see here, time to do is negative 85 hours. So that's many, many days past due and you, you don't want to see this in a ticketing system at all. Uh, you want them to be fresh. You don't want them to have that. Well, you know, okay, let, let me just create that, uh, just a fake ticket. Just so you guys can see, fake ticket, how it uh, looks like whenever uh, you have a freshly ticket that comes through. Of course, this is going to be a different uh, looking 
for different uh, ticketing systems, but for this one, we're just gonna, it's gonna, yeah, there it is, pops up. And it, it, when it just creates it for Jira ticketing system, it's eight hours um, to do it, to fix it. That's the deadline, eight hours. All right, so let's see. We have my desktop icons are missing, and uh, it says here, I am missing desktop icons, please help me. So what can cause this? Now, there are many things that can actually cause this from user deleting the files from uh, some kind of a change on the main. So let's say somebody uh, gets transferred to a different department, they get moved into a different group within a domain or within Active Directory, if you will, and um, suddenly now they are missing different icons because uh, this can be due to the like different redirects that different groups may have. And again, if you don't know what I'm talking about at this point, you might want to check out my Active Directory video that I mentioned previously. And uh, when it comes to this, uh, video, I'm just going to kind of give you quick answers and show you quick answers on some of these tickets that how I would go about resolving them. If you want to know exactly how to do these tickets, you know, in, in the sense on how to contact the customer, how to add internal notes like this, how to reply to the customer, how to talk to them in general, and customer service just in general, how to work actual system. I have many, many examples of videos on that, and do check that out. There are literally, so if you go to my channel, youtube.com forward slash Coleman, and go to the search box within my channel, and just type in ticket, and you'll see all of those individual examples that literally go into super detail on how to do all of this stuff, and it's very, very good, especially for somebody who has never done it. Anyways, I'm sorry, I had to get that out of the way, so you guys... Uh, you know, have more resources to actually check out in case you haven't watched my previous videos. So again, I'm going to go through all these tickets that are in the system, and I'm going to give you quick answers of what I would do in order to resolve them. So this one is, I'm missing desktop icons, please help me. So it could be just something that, you know, user went through like this and just like deleted, or went through like this and just kind of drag things into the recycle bin or anywhere else. And, and then again, it could be somebody who moved to a different department. You kind of have to ask them all this stuff. Did you move to a different department? Uh, why are you, you know, it's kind of unusual to have missing desktop icons. So when somebody moves to a different department, they're moved to a different group within Active Directory, which can have different desktop redirects. Uh, these desktop redirects is something that is set up for individual departments that allow for certain desktop icons, uh, files, even files like this, or anything else within that you can put literally in a folder. And um, those people within that group will get desktop redirect, meaning that they will get all of those uh, redirected files pushed to them. So let's say somebody logged into this computer and they belong to a certain group. And let's say that certain group is going to always have, for example, these files in it, and their desktop will always have these files. They will get automatically redirected. Uh, they will they will automatically get these files redirected to their desktop like this. You know, so if they've been moved to a different group, chances are they may no longer have these. You know, so that's another thing you can do. Obviously, you can look through a recycle bin to see if there's something in the recycle bin if they've deleted it, and uh, it depends what it is. They may be asking about. Uh, specific software that it's missing you know software could have multiple icons because you know if there are some software that has more than one function and they have more than uh, one app within that one software so they could be missing those uh, is it all icons if it's just some you know all these things we have to um, kind of ask them first in order to kind of help them and kind of trace back the steps and help them figure out where what happened to them so that's how I would approach this ticket here. Here's another one here where it says, I can't hear people through Zoom meeting. So if we look at this and it says today I had a meeting, but I can no longer hear people. So what is this? I mean, Zoom meeting, we all know what Zoom meeting is, and that is just the software or an application that's used for communication, right? So, you know, if they can't hear people through Zoom meeting, that means there's some kind of an audio issue going on. And of course, for that, I would go through the uh, sound control panel. What I usually like to do is 
I would right click this uh, volume icon and of course make sure that it's you know normal stuff that it's not muted and this and that so what I like to do is go open you know open sound settings and go to uh, well first like right away, right away you can you know make sure that their output is set to whatever it is so in this case we got real tech set to real tech high definition audio we know real tech high definition audio is just a built-in audio for the computer that's not their headphones that they're might be using so you might want to drop down and select the headphones that they're using you know so that's just one place where you can look at it. I mean they haven't mentioned anything about people not being able to hear them but if that's the case obviously you want to go to input and make sure that the microphone is selected or if you see an issue like this where it says no input device found then we have another issue then for that I would go to sound control panel which is over here and then uh, for you know but since the issue is they can't he I can't hear people through zoom meeting um, chances are that the, their headset is not selected. In this case, we, there is no headset. The only thing that's selected is just the real tech, which is the onboard sound. So we want to make sure that their headset, whatever it is, um, might be selected. As a matter of fact, I'm going to plug in a headset over there so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so there it is. I plugged it in over there and automatically selected it, which is good. Uh, so yeah, of course, uh, the issue might be simply that their headset is not plugged in, but chances are pretty low, you know. Uh, but, you know, we want to make sure that it has that uh, green circle with the white check mark that it's selected. So if you have it uh, set like this, so you can, you know, this automatically actually selected it to be a default the communication device, which is fine. That could work too. Uh, but let's say it's set up like this and you, you know, it's not set up as default. You might want to do this and set it up as a default. And <laughs> you can do this, make sure it's set as, uh, you know, uh, automatically communication device but uh, and here's the part of it now where the microphone comes up now we can see that it's selected and you can see that there's nothing plugged in it's a recording part of uh, just the real tech part of it uh, that being said uh, make sure that if you go inside of the application whether it's zoom uh, webex or whatever it is that they're using for meeting make sure that you go inside and make sure that this their headset is selected just like so. I have many videos on this, so I'm just going to move on from this. But this is typically what the issue is when it comes to audio issues. We want to make sure that everything is selected, volume raised, tested, whether it's uh, them not being able to hear somebody or whether they're, people are not able to hear them. So just go through those settings and, uh, yeah, it should be able to get you on the in the in the right direction here's another one that says i am missing a program on my desktop so they usually uh usually usually realize this when there's an icon missing when there's an icon missing on their desktop so you can start from there let's say they're say they're saying i don't have my google chrome you know chances are maybe it's just a shortcut that's been deleted so you want to go to the programs and actually look for it to see if it's installed there that's your first step if indeed is a missing and you know how they they say in this example, they're saying my program on my desktop, chances are it's just the icon. So if it's just the icon, go to Recycle Bin and see if it's been accidentally deleted and bring it back. But if, if the software is indeed missing, uh, you would have to basically go inside, uh, usually within the start menu somewhere here or within... Uh, the programs themselves, you would know, you know, the company that you're working for, you would know what kind of uh, distribution software that they're using to push different programs. So, for example, you see all of these things that are installed on here. Chances are, aside from Microsoft stuff, but like, let's say there's other stuff installed in here. For example, uh, we got OpenOffice, we got Oracle, and, uh, you know, stuff like that. Chances are that this type of software will be controlled by another software that does the distribution, meaning installation of the software for all the computers within a company. So it's a program that controls installation of all of these things. So you would go in here and search for that program and look it up either here or the root of C, depends how it's all set up. But you would make sure that indeed that program that they're missing is listed in there. So all you have to do is just make sure that it, it, see if it's in see if it allows you to reinstall it and there should be a way to do it a lot of times you would select it and just select install you know and they have different options like uninstall this is the repair maybe this and that that's how i'll go about it but if they are uh, no longer have the the software that they need this might be some kind of a licensing issue you have to kind of figure out what happened to their program so sometimes sometimes people that control what they call subscriptions, 
uh, software subscriptions for the company, for each computer, for each individual within the company sometimes, um, they will remove uh, licenses, licenses, uh, program licenses from the computers, and they would sometimes automatically remove them, or meaning that, that they would remove the program automatically. So the way you can check this is basically by finding out what the uh, host name is for the computer, typically. So you would find out what, so the name of the computer, host name or computer name is the same thing. Host name is generally used in a uh, business type of environment. So host name, computer name is the same thing. So you would n take this name, tech support, uh, as the computer name, as the host name, and look it up in the system that uh, allows you to look up different subscriptions that are uh, added to this computer named tech support. So, and then you will look for that specific subscription for that program that they're missing. And if they're missing that subscription, they may have to, or you may have to assist them in order to get that software again, you know? So, all right, that's how I would go about approaching this one. So let's move on. And for that, we have a ticket here. It says, I think I may have a virus on my computer from Mike Moser. It says here, this morning I received a weird message that said my computer is infected. I can't click away or use a computer at all. So this is a really good uh, example of something that you may encounter um, in a help desk, but also desktop support. If you're in a help desk, you may have limited tools, but if you're doing desktop support and you happen to be a guy that's like on site, then there is something you can do about it. Depending on the help desk, you may be able to do something about it as well. But generally speaking, if, if it's a message like this, you definitely want to take care of it right away. So if you are just a text, if, okay, well, let me, let me start from the beginning. I apologize. If you're help desk, all you can do here is kind of uh, go with your feeling on this. You know, the, the, the ticket literally says, this morning I received a weird message that my computer is infected. That, you might as well assume that there is a virus on there right off the bat. So the best thing you can do to them, or, or to them, not to them, but with the user is ask them to disconnect the computer from the network and turn it off. So that way, or, or just, you know, unplug it from the power. You know, that's what I would do. Just let them, tell them to shut down, turn it off. Especially if they can't click on anything, you want them to turn it off. And when you're tier desk, when you're tier one help desk, that's pretty much all you can do. And then from there, you may have to refer them to their local uh, tech support people. You know, they could, they may have somebody at the office in their building. So let's say there, it's some kind of a large building. There's, you know, I don't know, 500 employees. They got to have somebody there who is the, their tech guy who deals with this type of stuff. Now, if you're that guy that deals with this type of stuff, uh, there are steps that you have to take in order to remove this virus. Generally speaking, in a business environment, the best thing to do is just, you know, re-image the computer, meaning that you would delete everything from the computer. But sometimes you have to recover data that's on there. Let's say user saved a bunch of important stuff on the computer. Then you got to take certain steps in order to uh, retrieve this because you can't just pull them off. So typically you would, what you would do is take a hard drive uh, from this infected computer. You would physically take it, put it into another computer, and set it as a slave drive. But make sure that other computer is updated, meaning Windows updated. Make sure that their virus definition is updated, and make sure it's completely updated uh, to make sure so it doesn't get infected as well. Make sure that the computer is off the network, meaning that it's not connected to the, the company's network or anything like that, because if we don't know what kind of virus this is, this could be something that could spread, you know what I mean? So this is all in case you have to recover data from it. All right, from there, um, you, you know, the, 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 this drive is slaved. Whenever you slave a drive into a computer, meaning you add a second hard drive to the computer, in this case, this infected drive, you take it, you put it inside the computer, and you just plug it into the power and the SATA connection, chances are. And then what it's going to look like is just going to show up as a second drive like this, you know. So as long as it's like that and it's not the system drive and you don't execute anything, meaning you go inside of this drive and you don't click on any executables or anything. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even go in, into it right away at all. I wouldn't even open it up. Um, you know, the chances are that as long as you don't run anything, your computer is completely safe because you are running things off your C drive and that everything that's running in the background 
like this. See, these are all background processes. They're all running from your local C drive and not from the slave drive, uh, like in this example. So as long as you don't execute anything, you, there's no way for a virus to actually execute itself. You know? uh, that, would be have to, that would have to be some highly sophisticated virus. It's, it's, it's well, I want to say 99.9% .9 impossible for that to happen. So the reason you want to have it slaved like this is so that way you can actually scan it. So if you right click it and then you can just scan it, for example, with, you know, Windows Defender or whatever the installed antivirus software is it or, and is, is on, on your computer. That way you will find the, uh, the in infection, you would remove it, and at that point you can go inside and recover anything that might be on there that they need. You know, so that way it's perfectly safe to go in and ask them or just kind of look around to see where they might have data that you want to recover. Of course, the drive itself, when you slave it, might have a BitLocker encryption on it. For that, it's going to ask you for a key. You see how this one has a little locket on it? That means it's unlocked. But, you know, if you uh, if you do get a prompt, like you would double click it and it would ask you. I made a video on this, on how to actually unlock it. So I do have a video on how to deal with the BitLocker encryption. You double click it and it would say, nope, you need a password or you need the BitLocker uh, key. And then you would get that and then, you know, go from there. That's another layer of security, which is good. So that's how you would go about it. And of course, after you're done with it, remove the drive. And I would just, you know, uh, wipe it. I would wipe it clean. Okay, I hope I'm not going too fast because this is a video and which I'm trying to make uh, just in my spare time. I really don't have that much spare time, so I apologize if I'm going too fast for people that are used to me going slower. And I think that's it. This is the last thing. One, the last one here is the fake ticket one. And again, I have a lot of examples of this type of stuff. How to do everything from from the beginning to an end. All right, guys, I'm gonna go to my uh, face cam outro, I guess. Well, there you go. I hope you find this video insightful. Sometimes you got to think fast in order to resolve all these issues quickly. In this case, we had few tickets that were left over and we took care of them. Uh, there are many, many things you can do with that. But with experience, you will become faster and more knowledgeable and will be able to resolve these issues quickly. It's not a big deal once you know how to do all of this stuff. So never shy away from trying to learn things on your own. It's incredibly important because that's how you learn new things and that's how you become smart. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Take care, I'll see you next time, bye-bye. You know what the most confusing thing is to somebody who is trying to get in IT? And that is trying to explain something to them right away and being way too technical right off the bat. So let's say somebody asked you to explain what Active Directory is, how would you do it? Would you suddenly start talking about domain and start talking about user accounts, group policies, and all that stuff? They would be like, what? What are you talking about? In this video, I'm going to show you what Active Directory is to somebody who's never been familiarized with Active Directory whatsoever. They've never heard of it. I'm going to explain to them in such a way that they can relate to so it's easy to understand. As simple as that. After that, if they're interested in Active Directory, then it'd be much easier to start from there. Think about it. I explained it to you what it is in a simple terms. And then once you figure out that first part of it, then you can start to look into technical aspects of it. Imagine just trying to teach somebody how to drive. You can show them, hey, this is the steering wheel. This is how steering wheel moves. These are the brakes. This is the gas pedal. You step on that and then you brake on this and then you steer like that. Those are the basics. The only way they can learn how to drive later is by letting them use it, letting them drive the car, and then afterwards, they will learn how to drive a car really well. But it's going to take some time. So this is why I'm going to explain Active Directory in a simple way to understand. So that way, if you're interested in IT, this can get you there. All right, let's have a look to see what I'm talking about here. Let's see if I can 
succeed in explaining what Active Directory is to people who have no clue what Active Directory is. All right, here we go, guys. But before I proceed, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. It makes a big difference on, in exposure of this video. Thank you so much. I appreciate it so much. So here we are. This is Virtual Machine with Active Directory or Server 2019 Data Center running. What we're going to do is we're going to actually work and add some people into the Actor Directory. But before I do that, let me explain to you what Actor Directory is to those people who don't understand that. Uh, and by the way, my teaching in this is very unorthodox, the meaning that I don't go by the book in the sense that you sit down and they say, go to this chapter and learn this. And, you know, there is a order that you followed going through the book. Well, what I'm going to do is explain it to you in a way where it actually makes sense. At least I hope it comes across as something that makes sense. So Active Directory is basically a place within a server that has your login credentials, meaning your login ID for that computer. So let's say you start working at a company and that company says, okay, you're hired now, congratulations. Here's your login ID and password. So you get your login ID. Let's say your name is Bob Johnson and you type in Bob Johnson or whatever it is as your login ID. And then they give you a password so you can log into the computer. You sit down at the computer, you use those credentials, your login credentials to log into the computer. Well, those credentials are actually coming from the Active Directory. And Active Directory within the server, within, within Windows Server, is actually located here. So if you click on Start button, and then you click Windows Administrative Tools, and then you select Active Directory Users and Computers. So get it, you, as somebody who's going to use the computer, is the user. Get it? You use that login information to use the computer. So Active Directory users and computers are going to be located here. We're going to simply connect or simply click on that. So as soon as this loads up, we're going to add, and I'm going to show you where the users are as well. It's very simple. Uh, but we're going to add more users as a practice in this Active Directory. And if you want to follow along, you can download a trial version. You can see this is a valuation version of server. If you want to install it on your virtual machine, uh, which could be, in this case, I'm using Oracle VirtualBox software to install a virtual machine, meaning a virtual computer on my computer. And that way you don't have to have a second computer to run Active Directory on or run the server on. So you can download it. This is completely free. Okay, so we have now Active Directory users and computers. So you are the user. So guess where you would find your login ID? If you're thinking users where it says here, you'd be absolutely right. So your login ID would be in this folder. It's just like the folders that you have in your documents. You know, you go in here, let's say you open up your documents and you know, you go to your documents here and this is the folder with your documents. And inside of that, you might have more folders and this and that. That's the exact same thing here in, within this server. There's a folder called users. And all the people that you use computers, the users, will be inside of this folder. So to find yourself in the folder, you can just scroll down and look. Where, where is my login? You know, This is a fresh, usually you would see a lot, a lot of people in here within a company, you know, but you know, we have some in here, so that's fine. But how would you find yourself in here? You can scroll through and just look for Bob. What did we say? Bob Johnson. Here is Bob, Bob J, Bob Johnson, right? I think I said Bob Johnson, but you could also right click the folder and click find, which makes it the best way to find yourself or anybody else for that matter. So let's say you start working help desk and Bob Johnson calls in and says, hey, can you look me up? I need you to reset my password. All you got to do is do what I did here. You right click the folder. You know, you click find like I showed you. And then just type in name, Bob J. I think I have him as Bob J in there. So I'm going to 
click find and there's Bob and now we can go and make changes to it but before we do any of that let's kind of expand on this users fat part of it we need to in this um, in this uh, scenario in this practice and if you have it a lot if you have this installed you might as well play along while we're doing this I'm gonna go at slower pace in this video just for that we're going to add five more people in there at least five I think and we're going to come up with some names so I'm gonna come up with some common names I'm gonna say Susan Jackson and then we're going to add her in into that folder of the users because she's new Susan just started working in accounting we gotta give Susan a login so she can sit down at the computer and log in you know and then we got uh, Larry um, Buff Buffett I don't know Larry Buffett sure and then Larry started working in accounting as well. They hired two people for this uh, uh, role-playing scenario. And then we have Mike. Uh, let's see, what was his name? What, what could we give him his name? Mike. Uh, Bobson. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just coming up with names. And then we're going to... I create another one and we're going to say Laura Bailey and then one more we're going to say uh, why am I struggling here it's early in the morning guys for me it's like 7 in the morning so I'm struggling to come over days this is kind of silly okay okay one more name come on Irvin you can do it you can do it I'm trying to psych myself up um okay uh mary pipkins <laughs> all right that's that's good enough so we got susan jackson larry buffett working in accounting <laughs> accounting group and then we got mike Bobson, Laura Bailey, and Mary Pipkins uh, <laughs> working in collections. All right, collections call center. So there are those collection reps, you know? You know, the ones that call you and collect the money, trying to collect money for you. Okay, so we got to give them login IDs and passwords so that way they can log into their computers wherever they might be sitting. Keep in mind, this is a domain. You can see how it's called techsupport.coboman.com. This is a domain, meaning that it's a group of computers, as you can see here, that, that are in there. And usually this will be like populated with a lots of computers and users, um, just to kind of keep it simple to understand. Uh, so domain is a group of computers and users uh, for an organization. So this is how you um, organize and control their login access. So you got to have a way to control everybody's login in a single point, which in this case is this actor directory. So again, I'm not going to go into the technicals. We're just going to learn what actor directory is in relation to just everyday work and people that use um, that you know, they use Actor Directory without even knowing Actor Directory. So, meaning that, you know, once you get a login ID and password, you're using Actor Directory um, indirectly. You know, Actor Directory gives you the credentials to log in. Okay, so we're going to add, uh, where, where's, our, where's our sticky notes? Here it is. Susan Jackson. So, to add new user, we can right-click the users folder, and we can select new, and then guess what? she's a new user correct so we're going to add a new user other way of doing it is if you make sure that the users folder is selected and then just hover and then click here where it says create new user in the current container meaning that whatever is selected it's going to create it inside it but i like to stick to this so if you're if you're new to computers chances are you're going to start with you know basic um you know as a basic technician or somebody who's working help desk, which is what you would have access to mainly. 
So you would right click and then go to new and then create new user. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to start from the very basics. And first person is Susan Jackson. Susan, last name, Jackson. Okay. And now we can tell, tell her or, or basically tell her or give her a user login name. So this is the thing that I mentioned over and over again. This is what you use as your ID to log into any computer that is controlled by this domain, which is domain, which is also known as domain controller, which is this server that we are literally inside of. Okay, so we're going to give her a login ID, which could be anything. It could be combinations of letters and uh, numbers, and, and that's fine. But we're going to keep it simple here. So we're going to call it Susan J. And if there are more than one Susan Jackson in there, and you want to keep the logins like simple like this, you may want to put in like Susan J2 or Susan J3 or something else that defers her from the other Susan Jackson, if there is another Susan Jackson. So for now, we're just going to say Susan J, and we're just going to leave it at that. So once we click Next here, we can give her a temporary password. So the way you do that is literally just typing in whatever you password you want, but um, make sure that you don't make any changes here. You see how by default it says here, there's a check mark here where it says user must change password at the next login. So whatever we type here as her password uh, is, is, is might as well be something very simple in the sense that she's going to be forced to change the password anyways, the first time she tries to use that password. Not necessarily a secure way of doing it, but we're going to keep it simple here. So I'm going to type in new user one and then type it again, new user one. So this way she's going to be forced to change the password. And if you're doing this and giving somebody a temporary password, so let's say you are working help desk and Susan calls you and says, I can't log into my computer. You can change your password as well, but make sure there is a secure way of conveying what her temporary password is. So we're going to, Type in this time we just use new user one as a simple password and then we're just going to click next because she's going to be forced to change it anyway. Okay, now Susan Jackson is in there. Now she can go to any computer and log in using those login credentials, meaning login ID and password. But then, and, and, and that's fine, she's in there, but she is now in a general, just general group out there in, in, in the environment. She's still not, this is not organized, right? She's here right next to Susan, right next to all of these other people that are in there. So they're all in the same group, which is, which is not organized way of doing things. And then keep in mind, she is now hired to work as somebody in accounting group. So we have to have a way of doing this. And we're, I'm going to show you how to do that too. It's very, very simple. But for now, let's just create another login and that's for Larry Buffett here. We're gonna add him and then we're going to go in there and or we'll do organizing. But for now, we're gonna click right click users again, go to new, and then we're gonna click user and then we're gonna create the login ID just like we did for Susan here. We're going to create one for Larry, Larry Buffett. And we're going to call it, we're going to give him a login ID, Larry B. I'm pretty sure he's the only Larry B. Uh, Larry, uh, so if there's another Larry Buffett in there, we're going to, we, we know we would get an error. So we would, but in this case, it's fine. So again, we're going to give him him, same deal. We're going to give him a new, new password, temporary password. We're going to call it new password. And again, I can't stress this enough. The company you work for may have different security requirements when it comes to giving new passwords. I distracted myself from that. <laughs> okay, new user, wide user, what? They're going to always make sure that this is checked 
to force them to change the password so they have their own password for security and then we're going to click next and then Larry Buffett is in here okay so now we have Larry Buffett and we got Susan Jackson we can see they're highlighted because they're you know we created them recently and uh, we have to keep in mind that these guys now they can log into any computer which is fine but when it comes to specific groups for example in this case they work for accounting group the accounting group uh, is chances are will have different um, security settings let's just call it that security settings compared to somebody who works in collections call center so chances are security settings for accounting group are going to be completely different from collections so we got to make sure that we put them in their own group it's literally just a group of people right it's just a group of people that belong to certain department or I guess organization if you will but in this case accounting so what we're going to do here we're going to and to keep it simple um, this is not necessarily a way to organize this again this is just me explaining how this how Active Directory works for people who don't know what Active Directory is this is not for system administrators video so we're going to right click just to keep it in the same place we're going to right click users folder again just so we can get to this part where it says new and there guess what we're going to create we're going to create a group we're going to create a group but before we do that and what I was going to do is call create a group called accounting, right? But let's make sure that the group is not in here already. I don't see it. I don't see a group called accounting. Let me just do a quick search, right click, find. I'm going to type in accounting. Yeah, there is no group named, named accounting. So we're going to have to create that group. We're going to make sure that they're uh, you know they're grouped right so we're going to go right click we're going to go to new and select group and then we're going to call it accounting right we're going to call it accounting so and the, what this literally does is creates a way to keep all the same people that belong to the same group in this case accounting in one place it's literally that's all it does for now that's all you need to know as somebody who is one wanting to uh, learn actor directory from very very beginning and where it says group scope and all of that there is a reason you might want to change this for example to domain local but i'm not going to um, expand on this again because this is just for somebody who never seen a uh, never seen actor director so we're just going to keep it super simple and i'm going to leave everything as it is okay just just keep in mind for those people who are watching here and say oh you know you did this or that no this is me literally talking to the people who have no clue what actor directory is no offense to anybody so again sorry about that a little rant but then again we got to put these two people susan jackson and larry buffett we got to put them somewhere and that is accounting group so we're going to create a group called accounting and we're simply going to put them in there and I'll show you how it's uh, very simple so we now we have a group in our act director this is accounting group and for everybody that works in accounting which includes these two new people that they just hired we're going to put them inside of that group so we found accounting it's there and we're the way we're going to add those people in there we're just going to double click on it and we're going to add members you see how it says it's literally the next thing there it says add members and we're going to add susan and larry in there but let me show you again so here's the group you can see it's a security group global in this case and they belong to accounting and this is what you would do after you put them in there so we got susan or we, we're going to have to find her again but there's larry and we're going to have to add him to that group so after we create the Larry and Susan we're going to add him in there so we find accounting and then we're just going to double click it or if you can't find it in there we're going to select find and we're going to type in accounting so there are multiple ways of finding this group anyways 
there the point is what I'm saying is that we need to add them in there so that way it's organized. We've got to have an organization within this actor directory. Okay. So we're going to double click accounting and then we're going to add members to this accounting group because remember we hired them. So we're going to click on members. They are members of the group. They are hired for accounting. And then we're going to in the second tab where it says members if you're if, uh, if you're following along, and I'm purposely going slower just so you know, so you can catch up, uh, we're going to add them in there. So if you go down and then you click Add, we can simply now look for these two people. And I know this kind of looks like, hey, this is just a search box. Where is the drop-down menu? Where is like, you know, this looks simple. And that's okay. This is actually really good. This box is really good at finding people. So again, we are in the members tab. We're going to add new members to this accounting group. We're going to click add. And here we can simply just type in Susan. Matter of fact, we're just going to type in Susan J. Let's see if I'll find it. Let's see if it's good at finding it. There it is. It found Susan Jackson right away, right? This is Susan Jackson. We know. And if there are multiple ones, you would know as well. But if you really want to be very specific, you can type in full name and then you can confirm that, yeah, in, indeed, I've just added Susan. And remember, we added, we, we gave her Susan J as her login, right? Susan J, this is where she's going to type in at the computer to log in. And it says at techsupport.kobuman.com, meaning at meaning at the server level, or I should say at the domain level or at the Active Directory level. These are all the same things that I literally just said. So it's at server level, at, um, at server level, and meaning that their, her credentials coming from the server. Their, her credentials are coming at or from domain, which is the same thing. Koboman.com or techsupport.koboman.com uh, is the name of the domain. Um, Anyways, see, I'm, I'm starting to get technical here right away. See, it's just a bad habit. Anyways, this is where she's getting her login from, from this place where it says tech support, which is the server that we're working on right now. So it's, we know it's Susan J. So we're going to click OK. There she is. She's now added to this group. She's now a member of accounting group. And we're going to do the same thing for Larry, right? we got to add Larry in there. We're going to type in Larry. Let's see if just Larry comes up just by typing in Larry. There he is, Larry Buffett. I didn't have to type in anything else. And we know it is that same Larry because we gave him Larry B login right there. Okie dokie. So that's simple, guys, right? This is simple, basic part of it. Matter of fact, if this is all you learn as, you know, somebody who is uh, going to do help desk for now or just basic tech support like this is all you need to do even if you're thinking about doing desktop support chances are this is all you need to know when it comes to actor directory and i'm definitely going to expand on this but since we're done now with these two first two people we're going to add the other ones too once i'm once i'm here i want to explain what the point is of uh, what the further point is of putting people in active uh, in, in a group within Active Directory. So we now we know that accounting, accounting department has two members. These two members, the reason they're organized, so this is, Active Directory is all about organizing things, all about organizing things, if it's a huge company especially. And we can see that we have Larry and Susan in there. And now they're grouped. So you know how when you log into a computer at a company or if you've never if you've never seen that but what happens is you log into a computer company's computer using these login IDs using these login passwords you know let's say Susan goes in and she just started and she logs in and then suddenly she realizes that there are certain things she cannot do on a computer or she suddenly realizes that she's missing icons on her computer just like we are seeing here on this uh, virtual server She's missing all these things, or suddenly she realizes that she cannot, uh, she cannot, for example, read files or create new files or anything like that. That's chances are because she hasn't, uh, 
she doesn't have the security or she's not allowed because of the security to do these things. So chances are you can set this up that once you just create somebody like we did and you put them in there like, you know, Susan Jackson just sits here and let's say she's not part of the group. Chances are she wouldn't be able to do any of these things like create new files, you know, access icons or any of that stuff. So the point of us putting her in accounting group here is that so she can get those specific permissions that accounting department is allowed to do. So accounting department has certain permissions. They're allowed to do certain things. So that's the whole point of putting somebody into a group. Again, I'm trying to explain this in a simple way without actually going to system administrator part of it and creating actual security groups and all of this system admin stuff. This is just for somebody to understand what Active Directory is. Okay, now to complete our practice, we're going to add these other people into a collections group as well. And if there is no collections group, we're going to create a collections group. So we got Mike Bobson. We're going to do this again. We're going to right click users and we're going to click new user. And we're going to, is it Bob, Bob Bobson? <clears throat> no, it's Mike Bobson. <laughs> ah, Mike Bobson. And we're going to give him an ID of Mike B. So we got Mike Bobson. There are no other Mikes probably. And <laughs> we're going to give him a login ID of Mike B. Again, at techsupport.com. And yes, if I were to get technical, you can have multiple domains within same actor directory. This is why you have the drop down here. But anyways, I digress. This is a video. I know I apologize for repeating myself, but this is a video to, to explain what actor directory is to somebody who's never, uh, who's not familiar with it. And we're going to give him a password, new user one. All right, new user one. And make sure you stick around because I will actually show you how to reset their password because they will change our contact. You say, I can't log in again. So we got to go in. Sometimes their accounts get, uh, you know, locked out or, or even disabled. Anyways, we got Mike Bobson in there. And let's create another one. Laura Bailey. <clears throat> All right. New. <clears throat> Excuse me. Laura Bailey. I'm going to call her Laura B. By the way, this is not, the login IDs are not case sensitive. So just because I put Laura B as in cap B, like capital letter B and capital L, doesn't matter. New user one. New user one. So we created Laura in here. And then we got Mary Pipkins. Again, we're still, we're just only creating basic login for them. Mary Pipkins. Mary P. Right. We got all those three added in there. So now that we know they are part of collections group, we got to, you know, put them into collections. Um, they're part of call center. They're going to be taking collection calls. So let's see if there's collections group in there. We're going to right click the users. Collections. Fine now. And again, when it comes to further organizational point of this, just to touch on just a little bit, somebody who's a system administrator, chances are most of these, the, the, the login IDs and group that you see in here, they will be gone from here. And then you would have different folders in here that control different organizations. You may have a folder that's called groups, 
you know, separately. That's, I don't want you to worry about that now. I'm just telling, I just want to show you this part of it, uh, how this actually functions. But when it comes to organizational point, this is something you, you, it would look different, is what my point is. It would look different um, from what this is. This is just basic how it looks like once you, once you install uh, Windows Server. Okay, so there is no group collections. So we're going to have to create this group to put them in their own group called collections. So again, we're going to you know, right click new and then create a group. And we're going to call it collections. Matter of fact, we're going to label it call center. Okay. And now we're going to add those three people to this group. So here is, here's our security group for collections. We're going to put them in collections group because they're part of collections. And again, once we open this, we're going to add members. And it's the second tab again. We're going to click members. And then we're going to add them in there. We're going to click add. And just like we did before, let's see. Who was the first one that we created? Mike Bobson. Mike Bobson. Actually, let's do this. Let's just type in Mike. Let's see what happens. Aha! You see? Once you type in Mike, just Mike, you can see there is another Mike in here. There is a Mike Moser. But we know that Mike Moser is not the guy. We know it's Mike Bobson. Good old Mike B. So we're going to add Mike Bobson, right? Yeah. See, this can actually be fun too, right? So we got Mike Bobson added to our collections group. Now we're going to add somebody else. Who was it? I know it's Mary, but there was the Laura Bailey. Let's type in Laura. Laura. Where is Laura? All right, there's only one Laura, so that's cool. We know it's Laura Bailey. Laura B. We're going to add Laura B in here. And then we got Mary. Of course, we can't forget about Mary, guys. We got to add Mary into the group. Otherwise, Mary can might log into the computer and suddenly realize that she can't do anything. She'll still be able to log into her computer, but chances are she won't be able to do anything because of special permissions for collections. And there's our Mary P, Mary Pipkins. All right. Now we added her. And then, again, just to kind of touch on this, you don't necessarily have to worry about this as somebody who is, um, you know, adding people to Active Directory. Chances are the members of will have things in here. And basically, that would, again, control what all of these people in collections can do. That's what that does in here. So <laughs> we're going to leave it at that. And now they're part of collections. Now, whatever collections is allowed to do, these people are put in the collections group. Now they can do all of these things. Okay. So now... As somebody who might start doing basic tech support or, you know, help desk, they may get a call from, for example, Larry here. It's Larry calls in and says, I can't log into my computer. Well, we can look them up in Active Directory, scroll through. But the best way to find them is to right-click the user's folder and then select Find. I always say this. This is the easiest way to navigate this thing. Was it, did I say Larry? Larry Buffett. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. It's early in the morning for me. And, uh, you know, I, my short, sometimes my short memory, to be honest, is not that great. So we search for Larry, and Larry Buffett comes up. And uh, just to show you, if we were to search for, was it Mike? If we were to search for Mike, there would be multiple Mikes. So you might want to be specific when you search. So let's say we're searching for Mike here. You can see there's two mics again, right? But we know it's Larry. So we're going to search for Larry. There's Larry Buffett. We found him. Easy peasy. We're going to double click on him. <coughs> I'm sorry. We're not going to double click on him. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, details about their... Anyways, I, again, I'm trying to keep it simple. So we're going to close that for now. This is another video. So we found Larry. We, we just want to reset his password. That's it. We just want to reset his password because he can't log in or maybe unlock his account. So we're going to right-click Larry here. It's very simple. We found Larry. Whether it's in here 
or inside of this big thing where we have to scroll down. It's going to be the same thing. And once you find Larry Buffett, we're going to right-click, right-click with the mouse, and then we're going to, guess what? We're going to reset password. And here we can set new password. And again, it kind of looks like similar when we created his login ID, right? Remember this thing where it says, user must change password and next login? And it kind of gives you this thing where it says, user must log off and then log on again for changes to take effect. So we're going to have to tell him that if he's logged in already into a computer, that he needs to log off. That's what it says here before we change his password. So best thing to do is tell him restart your computer, you know, reboot. And it looks just like when we created her where his password. Sometimes people try it too many times and they lock themselves out. There is a limit to how many times you can change, change the, or try to uh, use the wrong password. So if he is locked, what we want to do is click here where it says unlock the user's account. This will do it once we change the once we click OK as well, but we're, we're going to give him a new password. So we're going to give him a new password. And you can call it whatever you want, you know, depending on what security policy is for your company. You can just call it Monday 1. Let's say today is Monday. Let's say today is Friday. You can call it Friday 1, just so it's simple for him to kind of type in. I try to make these simple and keep them very simple for them. <clears throat> as long as I'm allowed to, right? So whatever the password is, you have to confirm it, and you're telling this is the new password, and whenever he tries it, he's gonna be forced to change it, so that, he's un so, so that way you don't know what his password is, and then we'll make sure that he's unlocked in case he tried way too many times the same old password, so chances are he might be uh, locked. So this way we're going to unlock him. And now the password for Larry has been changed. We can tell Larry, okay, your new Temporary password, keyword temporary password is Monday 1. You're going to have to change it. Make sure, <clears throat> you know, make sure that, uh, you, you know, you do so. And, well, he because otherwise he, he'll have to. He, you just tell him you'll be forced to change your password so you'll have your own password. And that's that. We have reset Larry's password. Now, there are other things within Actor Directory that there are, a lot, there are a lot of other things in Actor Directory. But the point that I'm trying to make with this whole video is to explain to somebody who doesn't have a clue what Actor Directory is. How many people, go, I tell you what, within your household, you have people that everybody knows how to use a computer. Go to them and ask them, hey, do you know what Actor Directory is? Do you know what domain is? what the main controller is, they won't know. Chances are really high they have no idea. So the only place you would encounter this is in a business environment. So if you're trying to get a job as a technician or a help desk or whatnot, this is a really good intro and a way to uh, introduce yourself to actor directory. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. I purposely tried to go slow so that way everybody can understand it. And I, hopefully that worked. I hope so. All right, guys. Um, I guess I'll show you my video outro so you can see my face. Uh, all right, let's get to that. I hope you find this video interesting and educational because that's the whole point. Actor Directory is not super complex. It can become complex, but only at the level of trying to actually build an Active Directory for a business where you have to make sure that certain aspects of security are in place. So if you're a system administrator, that's a whole nother thing. But even before you become a system administrator, you have to learn the basics of Active Directory, right? Again, I go back to my point or correlation with driving. You don't suddenly start driving like a professional driver until you actually start from basic stop and go. I hope this message comes off as clear and understanding. All right, I hope you like it. Thank you so much for taking a moment to like and share this video. I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kuboman. In today's video, I want to emphasize a video that I made in 2016. It was fairly popular uh, because it talked about unknown factors and unknown issues that you may encounter during your tech support. So this video is going to be help good for help desk or desktop support, uh, tier 1 help desk, tier 2 help desk. All of the stuff that I'm teaching is all real world experience and it will kind of go to, goes to show that I made this video in 2016 and I'll show you a screenshot uh, that I actually have done so. My point is that I have a lot of experience in working in IT, so what I'm doing is actually sharing my knowledge for free with everybody in the world. Uh, hopefully they can learn something from it and benefit or even get a job from it. I really hope that's the case here. That being said, if you like my content, please click the like button. I really appreciate it. That's the only thing I asked in return. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And with that being said, let's take a look at this video that I made in 2016. Keep in mind, it's a little bit slower pace because at the time I was still kind of fresh when it comes to making videos. But it's an excellent video because it touches on all kinds of different things from access issues to websites not working to Outlook issues. A really good video. I hope you like it. Today I want to talk about very specific things that are related to desktop support issues that are being reported to you as desktop support personnel and this specific issue is always presented to you and I don't mean in a specific uh, trouble ticket that you receive but in specific uh, manner the trouble tickets are presented to you meaning that they are very hard to understand for example you get a ticket that just says I do not have access to something random, for example, a website or um, access to some kind of a drive or some kind of a folder or some kind of an email. But the tickets are very vague sometimes, so you cannot determine what the actual cause is because user simply cannot explain it in an efficient manner. And I understand this can be very frustrating sometimes, um, you know, dealing with users like this, customers like this, but it is important to stay calm because this happens uh, more often than than some people may realize uh, before they apply for a desktop support type of position. So again, it's incredibly um, important to be understanding as well, you know, because some folks don't simply don't understand um, you know, computers, I guess, in the way we do, right? I mean, that's just being realistic. It doesn't mean that they are not better at other things than we are, okay? So let's say, for example, you get, you know, a trouble ticket says, I do not have access to this drive. So let's go ahead and pull this up, right? I don't have access to this drive. Uh, so there are a few things that could be, you know, that, that, that could be causing the issue, and we just don't know. We just kind of have to go through the motions with this user in order to, you know, effectively and, you know, troubleshoot this, right? So we have to ask questions. For example, do you need access as in, do you need permission access? Meaning that, um, let's say they have a network drive installed, for example, like right here, let's pretend this is a network drive, this is this root of C. And so we need to ask them, do you actually need access as in being able to enter this drive? right because if they don't have access permissions access to this specific drive they when they try to select this it'll just say access denied right they'll get a pop-up right or do they need simply this network drive mapped right so in this case we would just simply map the network drive right we would just simply add it pick whatever they want and you know that would be that sometimes user thinks that access is simply that, right? Not being able to reach something rather than not having, you know, permissions access, right? But at the same time, you will get, you know, a, a trouble ticket that says, I need access to the Z drive, right? So what is the Z drive? We don't know, right? Especially if you work in a, well, you know, most likely it will be a big organization that you work for, you know, in desktop support, um, but you, Z drive could be anything, right? That is my point, right? What is the Z drive? So you have to ask him for specifics about it, right? Which Z drive? What is the name? What is the actual name of the Z drive, right? We could, 
we could name it anything. We could pick any letter, but if we don't know the folder path or you know the network path for this drive, we, we just simply would be just guessing. It could be anything, right? But again, it's important to be you know calm and dealing with these type of situations because this comes up of all the all the time. So we would ask him for specific. Is it share drive? Is is it called that? Is it called share drive? And which specific folder do you want it to be mapped to, right? So we need to get these specifics for them, but all they simply were stated is we need access. I need Z drive. I need access to this Z drive. But it could be any of those things. It could be you know, permissions access or simply just adding it so that they have it installed. Of course, when I click here, it's it's not actually going to add it because it doesn't exist. So I'm just going to cancel out of that. But same goes for, you know, different type of situations that you may encounter. It could be saying, uh, you know, simple things like, I don't have access to this website, right? We, we don't have, I don't have access to the website. You know, making it sound like it's a you know a computer issue when in fact it might be just a website issue, especially if it's an external website. So um, the user might be looking at this screen basically that just says the page cannot be displayed. Right? User could be simply looking at this. So let's have a look at these images here that we found in Google. Right? User could be looking at any of these things. Right? The page cannot be displayed. The page cannot be displayed. Um, the page cannot be displayed, right? These are just one of those things where user might say, I don't have access to this website, you know, assuming that there is something, you know, at you know at their local PC that's causing the issue when in fact the the page simply doesn't exist, right? This is typical 404 type of page where page doesn't exist. So we have to get this type of information, um, you know, this type of information and kind of take it as in like, you know, we we simply have to research, you know, more into this in order to figure out what's causing it. In this case, chances are that user simply has the wrong link, right? The user simply has the wrong link. We have to ask them that, you know, has, you know, ask them, is, is it, is it, did, would this start today or do you how often do you access this website and, and especially if it's one of those things is it, one of those things that are you know that user doesn't access on a regular basis chances are that this link has changed right but we don't know that because agent or agent or agent user or customer simply did not provide enough information for us to you know resolve this type of issue right and that's the whole point of this video, you know, kind of being able to, you know, have the means, not well, not just the means, but the, you know, patience to deal with these type of issues quickly because we need to get more information to resolve their issue as quickly as possible, right? Another example is, you know, Outlook, Outlook issues where, you know, missing email, right? Missing emails, right? This type of thing, you know, will come up often too. Or, and that could be caused by many different things too. You can look at it, um, you know, in many different ways. We just have to get more information. Is it the archives that you're missing? Is it actual email that you're missing from your inbox? If it's an archive, you could simply be, it could be a simple situation where you just add the, the you know, the archive file to their email fold, to, to their email, right? Um, you know, that the PST file, you would add it in, in, into their Outlook and they would now have access to their archive. And then, but to them, it could be just email, you know, or they could be even say, I'm missing a folder from my email. And they could also be archived too. But again, it could be something that's missing from their inbox as well, right? It could be something that's missing from their inbox as well. Let me see if I can find the screenshot of that. Here we go. So here's uh, an example. It's a little bit blurry. Let me see if I can. Oh, I hope this doesn't take me somewhere weird. Okay. Uh... Okay, let's go. <laughs> let's go back. Um, I just need a screenshot of, of an inbox. Here we go.
I think this is it, right? So in inbox, right? And within inbox, you could have multiple folders, right? Anybody can just add folders and you can have a bunch of different, you know, folders. Well, chances are that user simply deleted the folder or uh, deleted email, as you can see here, or simply dragged, dragged their folder that's underneath this, you know, usually underneath the inbox and dragged it into God knows what, right? We simply don't have enough information, but they, all they say is, I am missing emails. I'm missing this and that, you know. But if they are, if they did delete, just to kind of throw this out there, if they did delete their folders within their inbox or their, their emails, um, you would have to have access. Um, I mean, it depends how long ago it was deleted, you know. It depends how long ago. It could be simply just located in their deleted folders, right? It could be just simply located in their deleted folders, deleted items, like right there, for example. You know, this is, I believe this is an older, probably Outlook 2000, 2007. Okay. So it could be simply deleted in there, but if it's permanently deleted, um, you may have to um, have access to the Exchange server, which is the email server for Outlook, right? So again, my point of this. Um, almost a ramble, if you will, is that this type of issue will come up all the time in desktop support situations. So you have to have the patience to deal with this because as soon as you start getting frustrated, you will overlook many things that that you would know how to fix, that you normally would know how to fix. So it's kind of, it, it, it's very important to stay calm and, and, and just kind of concentrate and be to the point and don't let the, um, you know, you have to kind of take control in, 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 in a polite manner by asking the right questions of the user to provide, so you can provide a, an effective solution to them and an efficient, an efficient solution to them, you know? All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you have time, please go to facebook.com forward slash Kobelman, like my page. Also, I have a website called CosmicNova.com if you like technology news and, and, and science, um, science articles. Um, you can go visit that as well. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you very much. Well, there you have it, friends. I hope this is very educational and very useful to you. Most important, very useful. If you like this content and you appreciate it and you feel like I've deserved your subscription, please subscribe. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you next time. Take care. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin Olson. This is Man. In today's video, we have a refresh course for help desk desktop support or tech support in general. What I do is every couple of months, I would take the videos that I've made over that time and combine them into a single video that you can watch without having to go through and find these individual topics on your own. So let's see what we have. First thing, we have a real world scenario where the issue is no administrator access at local level. I will show you how to do that. I will also talk about BitLocker encryption and its use in a business environment. Third part of that is installing software through PowerShell. So it's an introduction to PowerShell and how to use it to install and uninstall different programs. It's really good to use for somebody who might be interested in that. Last part of the video talks about file association along with some Java troubleshooting. Guys, let me know if you like this type of stuff. If you have any comments, please leave them below and I'll answer them as well. And if you got a moment, please click the like button. This really makes a huge difference for my channel. I really appreciate that and I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you. And in today's video, we're going to look a real world scenario in which you may come across in tech support. In this situation, we cannot access a remote computer so we can make changes to it or fix something on it. So what happens is, we, for example, try to backdoor into it to make some changes. We would simply, you know, for example, type in uh, backslash backslash name of the computer that we're trying to access. And then we would try to hit enter and the error would be, well, you don't have administrator privileges, so you can't do anything with that. Or we are trying to remote desktop into it and it would be the same thing. We would type in the name of the computer, hit enter, and it would say, well, oh, you don't have administrator privileges, you can't access. So what seems to be the problem? Well, here's the thing. As tech support, you probably belong to a group, group uh, policy on the domain that has administrator privileges that's automatically applied to all the computers that belong to that domain. So in this case, what happened was is the chances are that that group policy hasn't applied 
to that computer locally. So let's say the name of your group on the domain. Let's just open sticky notes real quick so we can have a reference. Let's say the name of your group is IT support. You and everybody else that belongs to that group, you and everybody that belongs to this IT support group on that domain has admin access. So at this point, in order to quickly resolve this issue, instead of going through, you know, reimaging the computer, this and that, or trying to force any of these things, we can just simply add IT support group that you belong to with administrator privileges. We can add it to this computer at local level. And if you appreciate this type of content, instead of me playing an advertisement here, please take a second here and just click the like button or subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And this way I don't have to bug you with ads. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to have a local administrator password or our local administrator login so we can make these changes locally. Obviously, uh, we need local admin uh, privileges. So what we're going to do is going to access our system with using local administrator. Now, this is one of those things that your company will provide for you. Uh, you know, if you have a good company that you work for, chances are that every computer that they have will have a backup login, which will be a local admin, local admin, and will have a specific password for it. So you're going to have to find this out. You're going to have to look up the name of the computer that you're trying to troubleshoot. For example, you can see here that the name of this computer is called Tech Support. So you would access the database that has the passwords for the tech support, um, for, for the local admins on tech support, and then you're going to find that what that password is and what the login name for that is, and then you would log in to that computer. In my case, I am logged in as administrator using this login. So in my case, it's YT login, and it has administrator privileges, and it's for this computer that's called tech support, and I am good to go. Now I can make changes to the group policy that uh, has applied to this computer. All right, so let's get to it. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to open up our local group policy. Now, this is the wrong thing to look at. A lot of people look this up and they're like, oh, well, how do I do this? Where is this at? This is the wrong thing. This is local group policy editor for the components of the window or anything that runs on this computer. So what this basically does, you would go in and, for example, allow or disallow a component of the windows or software to run. For example, it would say allow, you know, or, you know, or deny um, whatever is trying to do, okay? And this is not it. What we want is actually called local users and groups. So in order to get that, we can type in lusrmgr.msc in our run command, and we hit OK, and it's going to open up our local users and groups. Here's where we're going to apply our changes so that we can go about our business and get to fixing this computer. Now, there are roundabout ways to get this, and you can get to this through the computer management as well. If you go to Control Panel, click Administrative Tools, and then select Computer Management, you can see that local users and groups are here as well, which is the same thing as the window that we opened previously, like so. So it's the exact same thing. You can see users and groups here. It's the exact same thing as what we have on this other side. So that's one way to go about it. Now, you can apply this um, IT support group by selecting groups here in this in this left hand side so make sure you select groups not users users are just local accounts groups is what we want so we're applying a group policy to this computer and let me just expand this here so it's easier to see a little bit easier to understand because i really want to highlight the part that we're going to make changes to all right so what we're going to do is add administrators group policy to it. So obviously we're going to select administrators. And you can see here, if you read it, it says administrators have complete and unrestricted access to computer slash domain. Get it? So IT support group belongs to a domain. Now we're going to add IT support to the administrators of this computer that is locally. And we're going to now 
do that. And once we do that, all the administrators, all the people that belong to this IT support group will have administrator privileges on this PC at that time. So the way you do that is simply select add and we're going to type in IT support and then we're going to click OK. And in this case, it's not doing anything because I, it's not, it's just a fictional, uh, you know, uh, group policy. So it, what happened is we would add it and then suddenly you would see IT support, a domain group policy applied to this and you simply click OK and possibly reboot the computer, but it should take uh, effect immediately. At this point, the whole point of doing this is so that not only will you have administrative privileges on this computer, now you can make any changes to it you want remotely or this and that, but everybody else that belongs to that group. So all the people that work with you, now they don't have to go through this thing of getting local administrator login, the password, this and that. Now you can make all these changes and then everybody can just log in and that's the quickest way of doing uh, doing this. Now, of course, if the local group, if the group policy hasn't been applied to this computer automatically for some reason, that there may be some other issue that you may want to look at it. However, this is a quick fix and you can just go about your business and then, you know, anything else. I mean, there might be multiple groups that need to be applied to this. It just depends in, depending on the on the system uh, of the business setup that you have where you work at. It's just going to kind of vary, uh, you know, from business to business. In today's video, we're going to talk about BitLocker and its use in tech support or in a business environment, if you will. BitLocker is used for encrypting of your drive so for example let's say you have a computer at work chances are it will be encrypted with some kind of software typically it would be the c drive for example here so there are many types of encryption software and for example one of them is sophos but a lot of businesses are going towards a bitlocker because bitlocker is part of windows operating system and it's free and it's convenient and it works well bitlocker uses aes 256 encryption and that's another reason to use it because it's just about impossible to uh, decrypt it in basically access any data on it unless you have a key for it or direct access hardware access to it so in addition what i'm going to do is actually talk about how it's implemented in a business environment and which kind of uh, operating systems can't use bit locker so for bit locker to work you have to have windows 10 Pro Enterprise or educational version of Windows operating system, meaning that if you have Windows Home operating system, you will not have the option to turn on BitLocker. You need to have at least Windows 10 Professional. So that won't work if you have Windows Home. Okay, I digress. So let's move on. So let's talk about the importance of having drive encryption. So what happens is if somebody steals this computer, they can literally take this C drive here, they can take it out of the computer, and they can plug it into their computer, and they're going to slave it to their computer. It's going to kind of look like this. It may show up as local disk D, for example, and they're going to try to access it. However, if it's encrypted, they won't be able to access it at all. It would just say, well, you need the key to unlock this drive. So there's a great security feature that comes with any type of drive encryption, but this is um, also made easy with a bit locker. So if they have access to your computer, let's say they steal it, and you know, chances are that you have a password, right? Most of us have a password before they can log into the computer, so they can't get past the password. So they take the drive out and they try to slave it inside of their computer. And if you don't have encryption, they can literally just go inside of C, they can go to your documents and look up anything that's inside and have full access to it. You can see there are some important stuff in here and then we don't want them to have any access to that, especially if you have passwords that are saved, for example, in a notepad. Let's say you have a notepad that you just keep around for a password. For example, let's say you see you have your Gmail password and then you have your login, chances are, you know, Gmail login, and then you may have it saved on a, in a notepad. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you have drive encryption. So keep that in mind. If you are saving any passwords to your computer in a format as such, which is completely normal, you, if you don't have drive encryption, then you're just kind of asking for uh, data loss or somebody, you know, God forbid, 
you know, this is just the worst type of, you know, scenarios that somebody steals your hard drive or they can even access it um, over um, in other ways, right? So that being said, we definitely want to have our drive encrypted in our case. Why not do it? Because it's free. It's completely free with Windows operating system. So let's look at the implementation of this in a business environment. But before I proceed, I would just like to ask you to take a few seconds to click like on this video or subscribe. In this case, I don't have to play an advertisement for you. Instead of waiting 30 seconds, you can just spend five seconds here and click like or subscribe. I really appreciate it, guys. I really do. Thank you so much. So let me show you how BitLocker is enabled. If you just have a personal computer, you can simply right click any of the drives and then you can select turn on BitLocker. So what happens is when you click turn on BitLocker, the computer itself will test the drive to see if it's compatible with BitLocker and then it will tell you whether you can turn it on. Chances are that it will be because most drives are compatible with BitLocker encryption. So here we go. It gives you an option to save a recovery key. And again, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. A recovery key can be used to access your files and folders if you're having problems unlocking your PC. It's a good idea to have more than one and keep each in a safe place other than your PC. So this is incredibly important to save somewhere else that's not your PC. I personally, what I do is I either save it somewhere on like somewhere externally and you can, there are many options of doing this. For me personally, I have multiple copies of the bed locker and you know, you can, so here's an option. You can save it on an external USB if you really want to. You can save it on, uh, you can send it to your email. You can uh, just print it out if you really wanted to. Those are certainly options that you have here. And of course you have an option here that says save to your Microsoft account. I don't really do that because I may lose the password to my Microsoft account. You can save it to a file. That's definitely an option. You can print the recovery key as well. We will have a look here in a moment on how you would use the recovery key as well on an encrypted drive. However, let's touch on how this is used or implemented in a business environment. So the drive would be encrypted after the computer has been imaged or re-imaged. So after the, the system used in your business it has finished installing the operating system anew, it would start to encrypt the drive with BitLocker. And at that point, whatever the system has initiated, I mean, this could be done possibly with a, you know, a, a batch script or some kind of a, a tool that initiates BitLocker and at the same time saves the file to a remote loco location. So it, that way you have access or a, a copy of that recovery key in case of a computer crash. So let's say user reports an issue where he says or he or she says, my computer crashed. And you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, this is a hardware hardware problem, let's say a motherboard died or something like that. And the problem is that you can't just take that drive and plug it into another computer. It won't work because BitLocker knows that that drive belongs to another PC. So you only the only way to do, the only thing you can do here is slave the drive. And let me just cancel this. Or no, let me just move this out of the way. You can slave your drive and it would kind of show up like this, like local disk D. And then you would have an option, you would have a, like a lock key, and I'll show you this, and it would ask you for a recovery key. So that's the thing. It would have a copy of this key somewhere else remote, and this process would encrypt it, save it somewhere else. So in case of a crash, of a hardware failure, you would have the system or a tool. It really depends on the business setup environment. It could be just a, a file spreadsheet somewhere. We don't know. But... I digress, you would have that key and then you would look it up probably by using the host name or maybe the serial number of that computer. You would look up what the key is for that so that way you can recover user data. So let's go ahead and do it manually here so to see what happens. I'm going to save it to a file and I'm going to click here, save. And you will see a specific error. And uh, for, for this here, I'm just gonna leave the BitLocker recovery key as it is. So that way, I don't, need to, I don't need to change it anything. It's self-explanatory. I already know what it is. But I want to show you what happens if I was just to click Save here. And you can see right away that the BitLocker wizard here says, you can't save to this PC. Please choose another location. So let's go ahead and try desktop. We're going to click Save. Again, 
says this location can't be used. Your recovery can't be saved to an encrypted drive. Choose a different location. You see how everything kind of comes back to this to have a remote somewhere else recovery key located so that way you don't so that way you can recover the data right in case of a crash or anything like that i mean as far as i know you may like you may forget a password for your drive and then you can recover it with a recovery key as long as you remember to keep a key somewhere safe that you know to look for it okay so let's go ahead and save it to another drive I'm going to try to see if I can save it to this other drive that is not encrypted. So I'm just going to leave it at D here. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it BitLocker Keys. And I'm going to go inside of that and then I'm going to save it as so. So let's go back in here and make sure that we do have that bit locker key where's our thing bit locker keys and here's our file if we look inside of it here are our keys here's the recovery key here's the identifier for it and that's you can see that that's reflected in the file name as well and uh, here is our recovery key in case of a crash so you can see that the recovery key in this case is just a combination of different uh, of uh, numbers uh, with dashes and this is 256 bit encryption for your drive okay now that we have the key saved i can go ahead and, and click next it gives you an option on how to encrypt it you can see the encrypt disk usage encrypt used disk space only and it's faster and that's set up for base brand new computer so if it's a brand new install this is what typically what happens and anything else that's added to it you save new files programs this and that it's going to encrypt it automatically as it states here and but if you have a computer that's been used for a long time you might want to encrypt the entire drive which is slower but this is what happens so you know chances are if you remember that you know once your computer is reimaged just you know use uh, the fast one and that should be fine because everything else you add to it later on will be uh, encrypted as well so it's going to click next new encryption mode here's a choose a, which encryption mode to use as you can see here there's a two different types of mode and uh, the newest version is installed or introduced in version 1511 on windows 10 and if you aren't sure you can just leave it at compatible mode so that way it's backwards compatible for all other versions of windows that you may be running if you're not worried about it you can just leave it in new encryption mode because i believe the newest version of operating system i believe it's 19 something so we're well past that either way it's fine uh, I'm just going to leave it in compatibility mode just in case. And then I'm going to, it's going to ask you, are you ready to encrypt this drive? Encryption may take a while depending on the size of your drive. He says you can keep working, which is fine, although your PC might run more slowly. So it's asking you if you want to do a, a bit locker system check. In this case, all it is doing is just making sure that the hard drive itself is in good running condition meaning that there are no errors with the drive itself and you can certainly do that just to be sure so let's go ahead and do that and then again don't forget i will show you how it looks like uh, when we are trying to recover data on a an, an encrypted bit locker drive so what you're looking at here is what happens if somebody tries to boot from the bit locker hard drive this is the error they get and you can see it's referring to a recovery key id and if you remember it's the exact same one that we have for our hard drive so i literally put it in another computer try to boot it from that drive as well and then now it's saying well you need the key to even even attempt to even get to the login screen of this pc and here is our reference number we can compare it exactly to our key and it's this here and then we have the identifier for it so now it's asking for this specifically all right now let's see what happens when we log in to our computer and see it as a slaved drive so here we are our encrypted drive is now slaved now we can see that it has a little lock key on it so let's double check it and see what happens and here we go again it's asking for that bit locker recovery key all right let's give it a shot and see what happens with that i'm going to open up our recovery file here is our key i'm going to copy this entire key like so 
I'm going to try it again. I'm going to paste that in there. I'm going to hit unlock. And there you have it, guys. Now you can see the little lock is unlocked. And now we can go inside of this, make any changes, and recover user data, which is typically located in users and under their login profile. And lastly, going back to our computer where we have encrypted it in originally, we're going to have a look of some options that are there available for managing a BitLocker. If we right-click the C drive and select Manage BitLocker, we can see that we can once more back up your recovery key if you need a copy of it, or you can also turn off BitLocker if you choose so. In today's video, we're learning some of the basics of PowerShell, specifically on how to install or execute application installation. So what, we'll, uh, what I would teach you here is how to use some basic commands that would lead you towards creating your own scripts that would allow you to install software through the PowerShell. So basically, once you go to the internet and you download something, it's going to be inside of downloads folder and whatever you decide to install, let's for example, take this example here, Media Creation Tool 1809, you would simply double click it and you get the prompt and you go through the prompts and then you install everything like that. Well, you can also execute this through the PowerShell. So there are a couple of ways of doing this which will help you get to the point where you create your own script to run PowerShell remote installs or even local installs, if you will, and that is to get to the same directory. So if we type in CD downloads, it's going to take us to that directory. The reason it got us to that directory is because we were already partially there. But if we really wanted to navigate to this, it would be simple as this. We're going to type in users, name of the local profile that I'm using, which is YT login, and then I'm going to type in downloads, it's going to get us to the same place. So if we type in DIR, we can see that that media creation tool is indeed there as well. So this is one of those things you might want to double check every time you create or before you start to create your scripts. <clears throat> By the way, this is going to be a little bit more advanced. So it's a little bit more advanced for, uh, you know, people who are more familiar with computer software, but if you're new to computers, I will try to go as slow as possible. Comparatively speaking, here's the same directory in a GUI form. So this is inside of our Windows, and we can see that it's exact same stuff that we see in here. So let's go ahead and execute it from the PowerShell, and the way to do that is to type in start process, and then type in media creation tool dot exe. See, now we get the same prompt to uh, go through our uh, prompts to, you know, basically install our software. However, if you want to make this to be a silent operation, you would do the same thing and then just do a switch or a command, which is forward slash S. This would execute it silently if it is an MSI package, typically. It won't work here because this is executable. It's designed to literally go through the prompts like that. But if you do have MSI package, it will allow you to do so like so. And for example of an MSI package, in case you don't know, is for example this one. This is an MSI installer for that, and that is .msi. Now here's another example of how to do it on from a remote uh, remote location. In our case, we might have something on a network level, which is for me located here. I went ahead and created a folder for this example on forward uh, backslash backslash Kobuman one, and that is the PC name or the server name that you might be using. And then I'm going to type in folder name repo one. So if we look inside of this one, the IR, we can see that we still have that media creation tool inside of that. So the same way we can execute it from here as well. So we can start type in the same way, start process media creation tool 1809.exe. Since we're in the disk directory already, I can just hit enter and we're going to get that pop up again and it's installing. So I went ahead and canceled that. This is where you're getting all these errors. Now, we can the same way we can start our script by typing in let's see here start dash process and then we're simply going to navigate to the network location let's see here and then it's going to be cobbleman one for uh, folder name 
repo one and then we're going to do a backslash and then we're going to type in media creation tool 1809.exe then we're going to hit enter and now we have that pop up again and again if you want to make this silent you're going to have to create your own msi package or something like that and basically design it so it is silent so meaning that nothing happens that you see visually it just kind of installs it so that's how you would do it uh, that's how you would start to create your script for a remote location using PowerShell. Now, you can also use a package manager to download different applications or access different applications and execute them like so, but you would have to have some kind of a uh, package manager that would allow you to do so. So let's look at a repository that's online available right now that you can kind of look at as an example of that. So there's one that was set up for testing by Microsoft, which we will navigate here in a moment. Let me just do a, a quick clear here so that we don't have any uh, confusion here. And in order to find these packages, we can type in find dash package. And then we need to specify a provider, which that means is you know dash provider this is basically indicates that we're going to now type in the provider name in our case the provider or our server name if you will is chocolatey i think that's how it's pronounced so we're going to hit enter here and see what happens so here's just the run of all the things that are available as in packages on this repository or uh, server if you will so how do we get any of these packages downloaded to our computer? We just kind of have to know which one we want, but we can also kind of, if we specifically want to look for some specific, let's say, I don't know, uh, let's say Notepad. So we can stop it from kind of going through all the things and see if there's anything available for Notepad. Because you can see there are so many different things here. And if there's something specific that you can, there you're looking for, you're going to have to, you know, kind of remember that or specifically search for. So let's stop this process here. And I'm going to leave it up just for the sake of reference. I'm going to open up a new PowerShell and we're going to access the same repository, but I'm going to tell it to look for a specific name. And in our case, we're going to use an example of namepad so we're going to type in again find dash package and then we're going to type in provider and then server chocolatey and i'm going to specify a command which is name that tells it i'm okay i want you to look for this specifically or anything or any derivative of that or anything like that i'm going to type in notepad and i'm going to use asterisk so i'm going to type in and everything that's uh, that has a notepad there's in, inside of this uh, repository it's going to show up as so so now we can see all the things that are available as a package um, inside of this repository so yes we can now download these packages and uh, we're going we can use them in our package manager to push this type of different software so what can we do with this point well we can install one of these packages so let's go ahead and pick a, a random one let's Let's pick this one, Notepad++. We're going to do Control-C on this, so we have it saved. And then again, we're going to uh, we use some commands. And this, this this case, instead of typing in Find Package, we're going to type in Install Package. Install Package. We're going to uh, type in Provider once more. And then we're going to type in Chocolaty. And then we're going to specify name, and then we're going to say notepad++. So let's see what happens when we execute that. And now it's asking us whether we trust this source, which is for the right reasons. If you're going to look at this repository, make sure that you feel comfortable with installing this on your computer. And here it asks you, are you sure you want to install software in Chocolaty? And I can say yes, yes to all, no, or no to all, suspend, or or if you unsure, you can type in help. So in my case, I'm just going to type in Y for yes, and I'm going to hit enter. And now it's installing this package. So let's see what happened. Did this actually install it? This is actually what happened. When we did that, it actually just downloaded that repository into our folder that is created on the root of C, and it's going to be in our libraries. And here is our Chocolady 
uh, well, there's a core extension. Well, there it is. Notepad++ is what we just got here. And there are a couple of different packages here that are installed. Oh, this one actually came with the installer. So that's cool. Now we can actually execute this installer if we really wanted to. And all right. I found that some of these uh, packages are not com incomplete that I've downloaded, for example, Visual Studio here. This one doesn't seem to have the actual the actual uh, executable in there. But this one actually installed. What is this one? This is part of the same one. Okay, well, we can execute this now, and all we got to do is just copy this path here, and then we can type in again, start process and then we can specify that and then we we need to get the name of that installation let's do the uh, x64 the 64-bit version of that and I'm going to paste that in there and I'm going to hit enter and here it is now let's see if it works silently it errored out because I clicked no as you saw I'm going to use the S switch let's see if this nope so yeah, it has to be an MSI package for it to install silently, and this one is just a simple executable. Anyways, guys, I hope you find this kind of interesting because it really is. You can um, do we can set up scripts that will allow you to install remote uh, software packages into multiple computers, this and that. There are many many ways of going about. It. This is kind of just an introduction to PowerShell, and. Uh, there are many, many different tools that you can look at. And uh, and not only can you install, you can also uninstall. And again, there are different ways of doing this. You can use the invoke command or you can just use install package command. You can use the start process command. Many, many different ways. And this is the great thing about PowerShell. You can customize this to your needs or to your business needs of just the way, the way it feels the best for your type of business that you'll work at. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about three different videos, three different topics for desktop support, and if you're also learning help desk. Very useful stuff. The first one is about ping command, how to use ping command and how to resolve issues using it. Second one is about trace route. Ever heard about trace RT command? Well, I'm going to talk about it and we're going to learn about it. Very cool and interesting stuff. Last thing we're going to talk about is reliability monitor. A lot of people don't know about it, but reliability monitor is kind of like software, but it's actually built into Windows. I know it's actually software, but it's part of Windows. And uh, we're going to learn about it because it's kind of cool and not many people know about it. And it can help you resolve weird computer issues that are kind of apparent and easy to actually visualize using Reliability Monitor. It really tells you what's going on. All right, guys, let's check it out. But before we do that, please take one second to like this video. It really makes a big difference to me and my channel. It really helps me grow and whatnot. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing that. So if you're doing tech support or desktop, desktop support or what have you, chances are you'll be using ping command. So what is ping command and its use? I'm going to talk about the first part of it and explain the whole thing. But my written answer here is generally the ping command is used to determine whether your computer has access to external resources or the internet. So anything that is considered external resources is anything that's outside of the connection of your computer. So let's say you're using a desktop PC at work or a laptop, and then you're trying to access an external resource like a shared drive or a server or a website, whether it's internal or external, and you are you can't connect to it or there's a you know, issue with latency or lag of some sort, it's running slow, that's how ping command would be used. And all these things are considered as external resources. So something that your computer connects to over the network. Okay. Now through command prompt, CMD, you can type in, for example, ping www.microsoft.com. And this is an example of a ping command. So let's go ahead and open up CMD. 
I'm going to top, open up command line, command prompt, or whatever you call it. I keep saying command prompt, command line. I use Linux too, so sometimes I forget which one is which. Anyways, we're going to use this example that we have here, and it's ping www.microsoft.com. So let's see what happens when a normal working website is up and running and see the result from it. Did I misspell that? Of course I did. Microsoft.com. I'm trying to multitask here, so <laughs> you will forgive me. <laughs> okay, so one of the first things that comes up that you will notice here is a number, which is an IP address, which is uh, controlled by the DNS. And the DNS, basically what it does is takes a domain name, in this case, Microsoft.com, and translates it into a an IP address, which is the location of this website on a server. So the server for Microsoft.com is located at 23.45.133.21. So that's the IP address for the server, uh, of the server for the for Microsoft.com. Okay. So now these are real results of the ping command for a normal running website that is up and running and there are no problems. So what happens is ping command sends four packets of data. So you can see here that it sent four packets. They are size of 32 bytes. And then it waits for a response and how long it takes to respond, which is shown here in milliseconds. So this is the first attempt from uh, off the ping to this IP address. And we can see that the response time here, that it took 14 milliseconds to respond. And then the ping command does it again, which is the second time. And this time it replied in 15 milliseconds. And then the third time, also 15 milliseconds. And then fourth time, also 15 milliseconds. Hence, four packets sent. Right? Very, very easy to understand. But of course, for it to actually respond, for actually to have a response of any sort, it has to send back four packets as well. So you can see here that the server at 23.45.133.21 also sent back four packets which were received at the same size. And then we can see that lost zero, that means it was successful. That means none of the packets failed that all the four pings were successful. That's a, an example of successful ping command. We know everything is okay with this website. So let's go find a website that doesn't work. So I went to this website and this website kind of tells you of some of the, you know, big websites that are down. So let's kind of pick a random one here. Let's pick Trivago.com here. That's a safe website. We're going to type in ping Trivago. Well, let's do www.trivago.com. Www now, if this website is down, like it says it is, we're going to get some negative results, which would be a good example of use, of, of how you use a ping command and how to help you troubleshoot the issues. So, so far, we can see that it's timing out. What does that mean? That the first packet was sent and it didn't connect. It waited a certain amount of time, didn't connect to the server, or the server didn't reply, I should say, and then it timed out. And then the second time as well, I'm sorry, first time, second time, and we're waiting for the third one. Third one timed out. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go all full screen here. Let me kind of move some of this stuff out of the way so it's easier to see. And we can see that all four packets sent timed out. That means that the server just we you know the the ping you know waited waited you know we waited and the server didn't respond time out there's only a certain amount of time ping command will wait for a response and that's what happened and we can again see here that four packets are sent so and then zero received and in this example trivago.com is located at this ip address that's the server that's the web server for the trivago.com and now we can see that we sent four we waited, we waited, nothing happened, we received zero because it's down. And then we lost four. That means we sent four and they never came back, which gives us 100% loss of packets. 
So how does this help us? Well, for, for one thing, we know the website is down. Or, you know, a server that you're trying to access at your job is down. Right, we can you know web server or some some other network component, some other network resources. You know, if you have the name for it or the IP address, you can just ping the IP address. If you wanted to, you can just type in ping, you know, IP address three five one seven nine dot zero zero two dot two zero zero. And here we go again. We're pinging Trivago's server again, except we're just directly bypassing the domain name. And we're bypassing the DN. Well, we're not necessarily bypassing, the, but we're bypassing the uh, domain name. We're going directly to pinging the server itself. And again, it's timing out, which is another indicator that the website is down. So, going back to the uh, my question of how does this help us aside from knowing that the website is down? So, if it's an external website. What we would have to do is find the web uh, webmaster for it or a person who has access to the server. Same thing goes for if it's ex internal website. So let's say your business the, or the business that you work for has some kind of internal website that everybody goes to, everybody uses it, you know, this and that. And, you know, you don't have necessarily access to it. You would find that webmaster and contact them. So how would you go about that? Well, if you know who the owner of Trivago.com is, you would contact them directly, obviously. But if you don't know who the owner is based off the, the name of the Trivago.com, based off the domain name, you can see who the owner is of this IP address. And this is something that, uh, this is something that your company would provide this to you if you're doing tech support. So you would basically have a tool that lets you tool or you know some kind of notes or something I don't know it, this is all depends on this varies from place to place you know but for example at my main job I know I will know who owns this IP address so not only can I look up to see who owns Trivago.com for example I can also look up who owns this IP address and then I would contact that guy who is the owner of this IP address or a guy or a gal or whatever, um, I, I would contact them and say, hey, this website is down. But the only time I would do that is if I don't have direct access to this. So let's say it, this is a server that I have, you know, that I'm running and everybody in the business here is using it as just a storage location. You know, let's say this is just a web server that hosts files for everybody in my building that I support. Well, I would simply just try this, you know, if I don't have physical access to it, I would open up remote desktop connection, type in 8.35.179.200, see if I can connect to it, you know, and it's going to fail because obviously I don't have access to it. And, you know, that's okay, but if I have physical access to it and... I know where it's located in the data center or in a server room or whatever it is, chances are this, you know, this server might be just turned off or, you know, there might be something else bad with it. But at least I will know that there is something wrong going on by using the ping command and that will get me to either me fixing it or finding who can fix it. And that's how you would use ping command in a business and environment. Either way, uh, for this we're going to need a command line which we're going to open up right now. So in order to use traceroute, we're basically going to use the example from the article. It's simply typed in trace RT <coughs> pardon me, trace RT followed by the name of the website you're trying to reach. This doesn't have to be a website. It could be a server of some sort or a switch, or I should say just an IP address of um, a network uh, component or a location. So, and that gets me into why would you want to use trace RT before I even hit enter here and then a bunch of stuff comes up. I want you to understand why you would want to use it. So let's say at 
your work at your office. For some reason, you cannot reach CosmicNova.com. However, from your phone, which is, by the way, on a network, on a different network entirely, you can reach Cosmic Novo just fine. Also, another example is an application that uses um, network connection to work. For example, an application that has to reach to a database that could be located in totally different state, country, this and that. It could be at the end of the world. It could be that it's not working. That's another reason you would want to use Traceroute. Or simply there is a server somewhere we can't reach, whether it's used for storage or this and that. We would want to use Traceroute to figure out why you can't reach it from your office network, but you can reach it from any other network. So what it does, in the nutshell, Traceroute, it traces all the routes taken on the network to reach CosmicNova.com in this example. So it's going to map it out for me. <clears throat> so think about it this way. Let's say you have a date or you are going somewhere that you've never been before. You open up your phone, you go to Google or Apple or whatever it is that you're using, you type in in your navigation the address that you want to visit, and it gives you all these routes that it takes. You know, it says go straight, go left, go right, this and that. The trace route kind of does the same thing in a sense. However, trace route it will tell you whether there are certain roads or routes that you cannot take or that they're broken or non-existent. So that's a very simple explanation of what trace route does. It tells you whether a certain turn is broken or non-existent. Hence the name trace route. I hope that's an easy one to understand there. So we're going to see an example of this. As soon as I hit enter here, we're going to see what happens. And I'm going to explain um, all the steps that it's going through. All right. Hitting enter. We trace out executed. This is typically what happens. It takes maximum of 30 hops, as in 30 roads or 30 paths, if you will, in order to reach the final destination, which is this IP address for this website. And this may take a while. This is why I have a finished trace route of all the routes taken for that website. And I will show you what that is right now. So let's have a look at some of the things that kind of stand out. The first thing, the first hop that shows up is basically pinging my IP address of the local computer. So the computer I'm using right now, local um, IP address for that is 192.168.1.1. So that's a typical local IP address. Second hop is basically trying to ping my IP address, external IP address for the internet. So my internet provider, which is Charter, is actually blocking that information for security reasons. It automatically blocks it. There's nothing I can do about it, but it's perfectly normal to see a second hop fail timeout like this. And then you can see that hops three through eight are all from my internet provider, charter.com. Is Charter is my internet provider. And you can see all these, if you will, switches that it takes in order to access the internet that goes the outside of the charter's network. So it goes through all of these and it seems everything seems fine. So that's perfectly fine. And then finally reaches the internet and then it has to go through this switch here. And again, it looks normal. This route is normal. And then it goes to the number 10. Again, it's normal. Then we look at 11 and we can see that there's increased millisecond response not necessarily too bad because we're not talking like 80 milliseconds, 100 plus or something like that. However, something does stand out here and that there is a third on, on the third response or third attempt ping of it is there is no response whatsoever a timed out. So if we are having issues connecting to the final destination, potentially we could look at the switches or servers that are located at these two IP addresses. So the first one is 
um, 232, I'm sorry, dot 70, and this other one that starts with 172. So because we see uh, no response here at all for the third uh, ping there, we can kind of possibly assume that there might be some kind of a latency issue with these two switches or nodes, if you will, or they could be server or whatever it is that they are. We can look at that because it could be a server somewhere. And the reason I say server is in a sense, depending on which type of thing are we troubleshooting. Are we troubleshooting a website? Or are we troubleshooting application connection, this and that? So it could be a you know part of the final destination of like, for example, application that maybe uses some kind of database that is located at the server or whatnot, or server itself could be the firewall. We don't know, but we need to know kind of why, what's causing this, you know, delay or lack of response whatsoever, if there is a problem, right? But typically that's associated with higher millisecond response time. So in our case, this is probably just normal and chances are that these servers here just have a limit of how many times you can ping it. So we're going to move on from that. And then it goes through a bunch of different nodes here, which could mean that it's just blocking. This is very typical that these nodes are literally just blocking these type of um, connection requests, which is fine. We can, this is pretty normal. But every time you see a gap in between where it fails somewhere, this is something we would have to be concerned about. And we'll potentially look at that here in a moment. But this is an example of a good trace route response. And then it finally reaches uh, the uh, destination of 130.211.160.1. Uh, which is where CosmicNovo.com is located, as you can see here. So it took all the routes and it took it 23 routes to get to the final destination and we know that everything is okay here. All right, so I found a website that's supposed to be down, a safe website. And let's see, do I have that going here? Yep, I had it uh, tested. It's Anthem.com, which is basically insurance provider, health insurance provider. And I saw that it's down. Let me just double check here one more time going to ping it one more time to double sh to, to make sure that it's down and then we're going to do a trace route on it to see if we can figure out what's uh, causing the problem chances are it's the web server itself but it could be something in between too so i'm going to do a trace route on that as well and then i'm going to and you can see that it failed you know sent for received zero it's timing out definitely down so we're going to do a trace route RT anthem.com and see what kind of response we can get. Again, this may take a while, which I will just fast forward to the results so we can see what's going on with that. So as we are looking at the results of anthem.com, you can see that they are similar to what we had earlier in the sense that it's taking same routes initially. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about. See, this is the first one, and we can tell that it takes, you know, hits my LAN, and then it goes through all of these charter uh, switches, if you will. And if we go back here, we can see that the, they are the same switches, and it takes that same route. However, after it hits those, it decides to go another way, which was indicated, which was dictated by a this switch. This switch says, okay, well, now, you know, you're done with the charter network. Now you have to go through this something else. So let's look at the previous one. I'm sorry. Let's look at the previous one here. And did we take the same 15166? So in our case, after the 166, charter sent us to this other one which ends with one, two, which by the way, is probably next to it. So there is a switch probably next to it in the same data center. You can see how it's only off by three IP addresses. Anyways, it decided in this case for the anthem.com, which is this top one, it decided to bypass the next switch, which typically would have been this one to route to cosmicnova.com. Um, well, 
it, well, it had to take another one here. So instead of going to any of these other ones, you can see that this one just said, okay, well, this is going somewhere else. And it takes a different route and it goes to this other probably internet provider of some sort, which I'm assuming is related to AT&T. And it doesn't say that here, but the reason I know is if you look at these 7 through 10, you can see that the switcher's names are STL, which is, stands for St. Louis, ORD probably stands for Orlando, Florida. And uh, you can see that they're called atlas.cogento.com. And you can see the IP address that are connected to there. However, if you look at number 10, you can see that it says ATT here, so which is AT&T, probably Orlando. So it goes through Florida somewhere, and then it continues with switches that are located or that are that belong to AT&T and then routes it further and you can see that it hits another three gateways uh, most likely um, in uh, on, on an AT&T server before it reaches its final destination this is still taking forever so once it's finished I'll I'll show you uh, what the end result is for anthem.com however I want to talk about a point of failure that may occur that may show up in trace route command. And here's a really good example. We can look at these AT&T switches here. So 11 through 13. Trace route is can tell you immediately whether something failed and in, in the path that it's taking. So it's we can imagine that in this example that number 12 here timed out. So let's pretend this one timed out, literally timed out, and we need to figure out where is it at, who, wh what's wrong with this. Chances are if it timed out that either it's blocking the uh, this type of uh, information from being sent back, which happens with my IP address here, uh, but however, if it's just kind of in the middle here, and we know kind of just kind of by intuition that it's supposed to take another route because it goes to the third one here but for some reason just one this one in the middle times out that's a clear indicator of a switch that is or the switch that is just bad so how do we find out you know if it's bad or not well we would have to reach out to this guy or this company and ask them okay well we need to get somebody from AT&T on the call or call them or contact them and say hey there's a problem here and they'll be like okay well let's send me the results of trace route from your location and they send it you send it to them and then suddenly they're like oh the number 12 failed but we still know it's kind of on their network because it keeps going to their network you see what i'm saying it goes to at&t we know all three of these hops are going to be at&t but the middle one fails that means it's still on their network and the problem is on their network and they need to look at this and they would know it would i know it would say timed out here but they would know what the next one would be or should be or whether there is a break of some sort that prevents everybody and that one switch is causing the problem so they would look at this and they say okay well we know it's on this network let's scour our network and look for this broken switch and that's the point of trace route. Of course, there could be other examples of that. And that is, let's say this one doesn't time out, but there is a huge, huge latency issue here. That would also indicate, that would also be indicated by trace route that there is a problem. So let's say their response time is like 100 milliseconds or even 80 milliseconds. This caused connection timeouts on the application and or a user end as well. So let's say there's a huge latency here. There's another reason why they would want to look at that switch or server and kind of see what's going on. The reason I say server is because it could be the final destination. We don't know. But in our case, we know it's not. It's just a switch that it's taking. And then with the trace route information, we can send forward this information to them and say, okay, well, you know, this is probably what's going on. Now this thing is going to time out and I'm going to kind of tell it to skip by hitting enter the attempt.
for some reason it gets stuck like this waiting to get a re uh, response from the switch and then I'm going to fast forward this to the end result so as the final result of the trace route is coming up we can see that the uh, anthem.com is just simply down this is what it tells us the normal response from the trace route when everything's okay is indicated in my other window here and you can see that the final hop gives us the final destination address in our case of anthem.com it doesn't it never reaches it and this is clear indication that there's something wrong at the web server level so the webmaster for anthem.com needs to look at it and resolve the issue at the server level so but you know when we know that the website is down for everybody this is not necessarily the reason we would use traceroute.com or traceroute command for we would simply just use ping command to see if it's up or down but if there is an issue of latency if there is an issue of website or an application working for some people but not others that are on a different network that's when we would use the trace route so it's for troubleshooting connection issues that are specific to a network you know meaning that just because I can reach it doesn't mean that some other people can as well so this is how you would use trace out to figure out where is the breaking point on their end and why can't they reach or why can't I reach a certain web server application server or what not and in today's video we're going to talk about reliability monitor it's one of those tools that comes with windows 10 that people don't really talk about or mention but it's actually a really cool monitor that kind of uh, filters everything out for you when it comes to system issues or system events so it's similar to event viewer except it's a little bit easier to follow a little bit easier to navigate through and I'll show you exactly what I mean so let's go ahead and pull up reliability monitor you can simply search for it and just type in reliability monitor and what comes up is view reliability history alternative way to get into it is through control panel if you go to control panel select security maintenance here and then expand maintenance and then from here we need to click on view reliability history we're going to click on that and now it expands our reliability monitor once more so what is again reliability monitor you can think of reliability monitor for example as a highly filtered version of event viewer so instead of giving you all the details for that one day on your computer um, it gives you kind of filtered version of it that's much easier to follow and it kind of mostly points out um, software updates and critical issues that may uh, happen on your computer it lists successful and failed software and driver installations as well crashes apps and programs that stopped responding and other errors of course on a time-based scale so what does that mean that means it shows you events for every viewer every day i'm sorry just like event viewer except it's a lot more sp simplified and it gives you this kind of a graph with dates aligned as this you can see the only main thing that keep in mind is that reliability monitor monitor only goes back as far as one month so it only gives you one month of uh, event viewing when it comes to issues on your computer which could be good enough to kind of troubleshoot all the computer issues that are happening so you don't necessarily need to go back over a month ago to figure out what is going on right now with your computer on top of that uh, reliability monitor it can often provide important clues about the cause of sudden changes in system behavior as well and that can be determined by the events that happened and it can also kind of gives you an idea why for example my computer is crashing what happened with the application why did it stop you know this and that so again it's an event viewer in a sense except it's a lot more user friendly if you will or IT support friendly so with a reliability monitor let's go ahead and look at an example and here's a good one it says here that on October 5th 2019 something happened so if we just click on this bar we can see that it gives you the details as well but it also points out a critical event with this circle with a, a red circle with the X in it 
and then we have the uh, warning one uh, war exclamation mark here which is in yellow and then we just uh, we have regular event here which is in blue so let's look at the first critical event and it says windows was not properly shut down and you can see how it's easily laid out for you and it gives you the date here and it says you know it's october 5th at 8 a.m and then of course on the right hand side of it you can click on view technical details which will give you more information on it if you select that so you can imagine you know your let's say your computer is unstable and says you know your computer is shutting down just randomly windows was not properly shut down so what does that mean it means that either somebody pulled the plug the power went out or something caused the crash so let's go ahead and click on view technical details and expands it and it gives you a little bit more information but as far as the computer knows it just it just knows that windows was not properly shut down so this could mean literally that it lost power and then it also in description it says the previous system shut down on uh, let, let's see what is this six days ago was unexpected so it gives you an idea that hey this happened also five days ago so that can give you a clue of what might be happening so you can either ask the user hey do you remember it shutting down before or you can simply confirm what the user is saying hey this happened before and then you look and look at it you, you can say hey did this happen about five days ago and then you can see that there's a pattern going on here so very similar to event viewer and of course I have a video on event viewer if you want to check that out I'll toss a link on the right hand side here so let's look at the uh, exclamation uh, one that it's just a warning and it says here Google update helper and it says unsuccessful application reconfiguration and it happened at on the same day at 8.08 um, a.m. So let's say somebody's complaining about Google Chrome for example because Google Chrome is the only product I have on this computer and of course it's going to have a Google update helper and then I can see well all right well something's going on here and then obviously it says here unsuccessful application reconfiguration so I'm going to click on view technical details and it's going to give me a little bit more of the information and again it kind of uh, repeats what it said earlier here and, and on the top and then in the description it says Windows installer uh, reconfigured the product and it gives you the product name and that is Google Update Helper and it gives you product version product language manufacturer Google LLC and then it gives you reconfiguration success or error status so at this point we don't know what happened because if it says unsuccessful uh, application reconfiguration as far as we know it could be just permission issues but at least we have an error status which is the error code 1638 so we can simply google this and find out on the internet what the what this error actually means but again it could be just simple permissions issue you know and if user is complaining about google not working properly or google chrome or this and that this kind of gives you a clue at least a starting point so let's just look at some of the uh, uh blue um, events that happened and informational events are down here and then again you can see there is uh, another Google update health uh, helper and then it says here successful application reconfiguration and it happened kind of exact same time uh, where the where it unsuccessfully did it so that means most likely that it did get its uh, permissions that it needed to do so and then it actually did it so we can kind of confirm here that that well that was successful and we can see that the error status is zero so right away we can see well that's not the problem just because it failed here it actually succeeded below here so we're done with the google issue here and then of course we just have a regular event and it says here cumulative update for uh, .NET framework for Windows 10 and it says successful Windows update so generally speaking informational events are just that it gives you information that something usually just happen normally and that is also good to know so that way we can kind of uh, exclude those things as possible problems for this PC so with this tool we can just keep going and scrolling through all the events you can see some of them are just blank there is basically just means there's no issues on those days and then we got again just the you know the blue event that happened and it's just normal but well, the ones we want to kind of concentrate on here are the ones that are critical events. For example, this setup host.exe stopped responding on October 13th at 
53 a.m. And then we can just keep going and kind of look at those issues and what see what happened as it kind of gives you a really good starting point when it comes to figuring out what is wrong with all of these computer issues that may be happening. And sure, I can go through all this stuff together with you. And let's just go ahead and take a quick look. This one looks a little bit different because it's a setup host.exe. And it says, again, stop responding at 8.53 a.m. And it gives you quite a bit more detail. And this is going to vary from program to program, of course. But again, it gives you starting place to help you troubleshoot what the issue is. And for example, this one says stopped interacting with Windows and it was closed. To see uh, more information about the problem, um, check the problem history in the security maintenance control panel. So it gives you another starting point here. It also gives you application path in some cases and you can see where this program is located and this is a Windows component. And then let's look at the same thing similar and it says uh, for this uh, yellow exclamation mark right underneath that it says notepad plus 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 unsuccessful application installation and uh, we can see more details of this one as well again this one happened on 8 51 a.m and it says windows install install the product blah 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 and then installation success or error status so this is most likely a failed installation and then we can look up again what the error is to clarify that information. Well, there you have it, guys. This is a very useful tool, in my opinion, if you don't want to look all the information um, in the event viewer. If you find that confusing, because I can see how event viewer could be uh, harder to navigate through, especially for new people to tech support. So, hey, if you get an issue from a user or a report or user reports an issue, it says, hey, my computer is unstable. I don't know what's going on. Reliability monitor, monitor is a good place to start to give you a quick look to see what's going on with that PC. All right, I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends. If you have any questions, please let me know. Leave any likes and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about VPN, Virtual Private Network. This video is really good for people trying to get into help desk or desktop support. First video or first part of this video is going to be a presentation on VPN. It's going to explain what VPN is, how it functions, why we use it, and this and that. The second video is going to be a VPN troubleshooting example on how to troubleshoot VPN, things to look out for. And the third part of the video is kind of a things to kind of watch out for when it comes to dealing with a VPN, especially when it comes to resetting passwords for users while they're on VPN connection. This is a really good and important video to learn, and I hope you find it very easy to follow. That being said, please take one second to click like on this button. It really means a lot to me when I when you guys do that. It really is just kind of a, a excellent and wonderful way that makes me happy that you guys do for me. I really appreciate it as always. Thank you so much. So what is VPN? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. And the way that usually works is, let's say you start working for some business, for some company, and they decide that they want you to work from home occasionally, right? So what they do is they give you a laptop. They give you a laptop or maybe even a desktop, but typically it's just a laptop. They give you a computer and they say, okay, take this home and then VPN from home so that way you can work for us. What does that mean? Well, they want you to connect from home to the company's network so you have access to all the resources that you normally do so that you can work from home, right? That's what the VPN is in the nutshell. So where can you VPN from? You can VPN from home, you can VPN from coffee shop, a restaurant, a store, um, you know, anywhere there is internet access, right? So this is how it kind of works. You create a virtual private connection from any other location that has access to the internet, which allows you to connect to the company's network. And I've, I will explain what how this works. Your company has a centralized computer that deals specifically for VPN. There are servers that uh, there are ACT, 
as a proxy, if you will, that allows you to have access to all of the other uh, computers on that same network, on your work network, right? So you have a, a server that's a VPN server that you connect to, and this allows you to have access to the company's network, right? VPN is encrypted and it's safe. It's fully encrypted and it's safe. This is where uh, authentication comes in um, in a couple of different uh, forms, right? Um, the first thing that we need to do and have is software, right? VPN uses software. You basically open up this software that's going to be installed on your computer. You open it up, and this software will typically ask you for authentication, meaning login and password. However, there is a little bit more to it, right? You come to this screen, and it says username and password. And, you know, you have your normal username password that you use for your normal computer, for, for your, you know, for your computer that you go to work. You know, you go to work, you, you know, you log in with your login and password, and that's fine. However, VPN is different. It's going to have a little bit more to it. Um, a lot of times, and I hope most of the time, there's a, um, a some form of token authentication involved, whether it's hard token or soft token. So what I mean by that is it's a generated, it's a randomly generated number that you use in combination with your password, right? You have your username that's most likely not going to change. It's your regular username. However, you'll have a password and combination of of the numbers that come from the token. So imagine a hard token is basically something that's kind of small, sort of like a thumb drive size, and has a randomly generated number on it that changes typically every 60 seconds. You can have the soft token that basically does the same thing. You open it up on your computer and it just displays a bunch of random numbers that change every 60 seconds. So you type in your username, your password, and the randomly generated number, and then you will log in. As a result, when you're authentica authenticated, now you have full VPN connection, which is encrypted. The company's network says, oh, okay, you're fine. Now you have full access to the network resources at the company that you work for. So it's the same as if you were sitting at the company's office, at your office, right? It's the same thing. You have full access to your work files, your emails, and everything else that's available to you at your office, right? That's the whole point of VPN. You have full access while you're at home when you create a VPN connection to all the resources at work. As somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company, you'll have people who work remotely. And nowadays, we have a lot of people working from home. So in order for them to actually be able to work, now they have to connect to the company's network. But now they can't work because they're not on the company's network. They're not physically there at the office. So they have to use VPN software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company. This is why they use VPN software to do so. Now, what I have up right now is just a home user VPN that anybody can use. Not to be confused with a business VPN. This is the reason I have it up. This is going to be totally different. This home one that you can go to google.com and download free VPN, all it does is just hides your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country. That's all it does. It's completely different from business VPN in the sense of access to, to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company. All right. So this is a sample of regular free VPN that regular people use, not workers. So let me show you. Here's the list of servers that they pick. So if they, for example, run this and they, for example, click Brazil, Suddenly, now they're going to look like they're connected to the internet from Brazil. So they're basically trying to hide their location. This is not the same thing as a business VPN. All right. That being said, let's look at a business VPN, how it kind of looks like. 
when it comes to business VPN, you typically get something similar to this. You launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this. And it asks you for your username, your password, and a second password. So what is this second password? We know this is pretty straightforward. The username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login ID. It's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office. So it's going to be the exact same thing most of the time. It's going to be the exact same thing as what they use at the office. Their username is going to be the exact same thing. I'm sorry for repeating that. I just want to make sure that you know this. And the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer. Second password, however, is different. This is usually an RSA token. So what is RSA token? RSA token is a one-time password that is always randomized. I think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password, and then it allows you to log in. You may have seen this with some websites. Some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts. It's very similar to that. So let's concentrate on this second password part of it first. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an old school way of getting that, that one-time password. It's a uh, token that is gen randomly generated. So basically what happens is you press a button, for example, like here or there, and it generates a random number that you use as the second password. A lot of times these are either hardware tokens. This is what they are. These are hardware tokens, but there are also software tokens. Let me just kind of scroll down to show you that. You can get a software token that kind of looks like this. Here it is, this one here, where it says VPN token. This is something that's installed on their computer as well. So they'll have an icon on their computer with the VPN software. So the VPN software is going to be separate, and now, but they have to launch this VPN token to get this random code to use as part of their login, login as the second password. It might be the way they put in the password, the second password for the VPN token might be slightly different varying from VPN software to another, but in the nutshell, they're going to need that VPN token or RSA token, if you will, in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the VPN or the network that they're trying to connect to. You can also have a mobile version of that. So you can have a mobile phone. I don't know if I have an example of that here, but you can install an app on your some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token so that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through vpn when it comes to customer connecting to the VPN. so this is the main thing that you see when it comes to vpn uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk there most of the time they're going to say i can't connect to the vpn the main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting. That's the main thing. Now let's move on to other things. Let's look at a VPN servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from. Let me see here from regular VPNs. This is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody, for example, working in the United States. When they will launch their VPN software, they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this. And they're all going to be in U.S. And all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company. So this is all the same network. They're all on the same network. They're just different location. This is very normal when they will launch their VPN software. They will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these. The reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down. It happens. Sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect, for example, to the same one. Let's look at the, let's look at the capacities here, for example. You can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one. So people automatically they tend to click on the very first server available. And you can see that in this example, there's 13% capacity already meaning that it has the most, well, this one has a lot too, 15%, but people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, VPN server for their company. Either way, 
If they're having trouble suddenly connecting to, for example, Los Angeles here, just ask them to connect to Miami, New York, San Jose, or Seattle. So that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues. Now, the other thing uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there. So you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software to reinstall VPN software for the user. And a lot of times what happens is a company will set up a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN. So, for example, what happens is they would get a link, they would type in that link, whatever that may be, get my VPN software. Dot com. For example, this is not, I don't even know if this is a real website or not, but this is kind of what would happen. They would get a link and keep in mind, they're, they're still there. At this time, they're not connected. Their problem is they cannot connect to VPN and they don't have software either. So they, what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to. And once they go to that link, they can download the software and install it. So you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges this and that that's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software but keep that in mind if they don't have it there has to be a way to get that VPN software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the VPN you, you see what I'm saying there has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation so that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards um, so they can just get back to work and start working. All right guys I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support. Let me know if you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN. I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN. Let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed. I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios, different options. But keep in mind, there are many, many different ways of initiating VPN. Companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software, you know, different prerequisites, meaning they may have a different uh, security so some companies, as far as I know, may not even require a second password or RSA token, which is kind of silly. But you do see that with smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and, you know, maintenance, do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff. So it's going to be, it's going to vary a little bit. But in general, what I've explained to you is exactly the main things. They're, they're exactly the, the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, you can literally go, for example, to an interview for a help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the Internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections, but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet while VPN for a business allows you connect, allows you to connect to the company's network so that way you have access to all of those resources so that way you can work, so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto vpn they can typically log into their computer but they can't get on their vpn because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all and they can not just do control alt delete this is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password they can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So the only thing they can do, as they typically do, is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call. And I hope you like my role playing. 
Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their passwords or they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir, but keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not, not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. Well, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need uh, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of uh, overview of what we gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or forced to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right. Let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select Users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the Users folder and select Find. 
in here you can type in the name of the user and he said Irvin underscore C A N so it's going to click find now and here it is we found the user we can simply select it double click it and it should pull up user's account so let's see what's going on with that he said he can't log in so the next thing we're going to look up is the password so we're going to click on the account if we suspect that user is locked in the account tab here we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account select apply or ok and this will unlock the user's account now we can get back to them and let them know to try again well there you go my friends this is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts of course there are other things you can look at if you go to the account you can make some changes to it when it related to password if you want to change their password you can change it here if you select user must change password at the next logon is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment so this is a part of security you want the user to have their own password so I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it you give them a temporary password they should be able to set their own in order to change the password we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password however this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users it may not be easy to find however if you do right click on the users folder select find and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user here since we found it already we don't have to dig through the actor directory a lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password is that now since you already found it you don't have to dig and kind of like you know your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user you can just find it here and then right click and reset password and we're going to change the password to something temporarily And then again make sure this is checked user must change the password at the next login and then if their account is locked as well you can check that as well and then just click OK and now it says the password for Irvin has been changed all right guys I hope you find this video useful please share it with your friends let them know about me and ask them what they think are these videos useful to you i think they are i appreciate you watching have a good day and don't forget to ask me any questions that you may have in the comments below thank you have a good day bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kuboman. In today's video we have another crash course of what I typically do every couple months and that is combine some of my most recent videos into one. So it's a single place to start watching everything that I made because I feel like it's important and maybe it's easier to find for people watching. So here we are. We have starting off a couple of videos on VPN. First VPN video talks about troubleshooting VPN. Some of the most common things to kind of look for and kind of explain to you what VPN is for those people who are new to IT. Video explains things to think about when it comes to working on VPN and especially when a user asks for a password reset. Following on that, we have Zoom troubleshooting setup and audio issues that you may come across when it comes to Zoom. Following that is a video on how to deal with a broken monitor and then after that we have a video on broken links, website links and the last video is basically about installing Windows 10. I hope you like it. Please take a moment to like this video and share it with your friends. If you have any questions I'll be glad to answer them as usual. Alright, let's get into it. As somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company, you'll have people who work remotely. And nowadays we have a lot of people working from home. So in order for them to actually be able to work, 
now they have to connect to the company's network but now they can't work because they're not on the company's network they're not physically there at the office so they have to use vpn software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company this is why they use vpn software to do so now what i have up right now is just a home user vpn that anybody can use not to be confused with a business vpn this is the reason i have it up this is going to be totally different this home one that you can go to google.com and download free vpn all it does is just hides your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country that's all it does it's completely different from business vpn in the sense of access to to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company all right so this is a sample of regular free vpn that regular people use not workers so let me show you here's the list of servers that they pick so if they for example run this and they for example click brazil suddenly now they're going to look like they're connected to the internet from brazil so they're basically trying to hide their location this is not the same thing as a business vpn all right that being said let's look at a business vpn how it kind of looks like when it comes to business vpn you typically get something similar to this you launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this and it asks you for your username your password and a second password so what is this second password we know this is pretty straightforward the username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login id it's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office so it's going to be the exact same thing most of the time it's going to be the exact same thing as what they use at the office their username is going to be exact same thing i'm sorry for repeating that i just want to make sure that you know this and the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer second password however is different this is usually an rsa token so what is rsa token rsa token is a one-time password that is always randomized i think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password and then it allows you to log in you may have seen this with some websites some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts it's very similar to that so let's concentrate on this second password part of it first this is kind of what it looks like this is an old school way of getting that that one-time password it's an uh token that is gen randomly generated so basically what happens is you press a button for example like here or there and it generates a random number that you use as the second password a lot of times these are either hardware tokens this is what they are these are hardware tokens but there are also software tokens let me just kind of scroll down to show you that you can get a software token that kind of looks like this here it is this one here where it says vpn token this is something that's installed on their computer as well so they'll have an icon on their computer with the vpn software so the vpn software is going to be separate and now, but they have to launch this vpn token to get this random code to use as part of their login login as the second password it might be the way they put in the password the second password for the vpn token might be slightly different varying from vpn software to another but in the nutshell they're going to need that vpn token or rsa token if you will in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the vpn or the network that they're trying to connect to you can also have a mobile version of that so you can have a mobile phone i don't know if i have an example of that here but you can install an app on your some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token so that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through vpn when it comes to customer connecting to the v so this is the main thing that you see when it comes to vpn uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk there most of the time they're going to say i can't connect to the vpn 
the main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting. That's the main thing. Now let's move on to other things. Let's look at a VPN servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from. Let me see here from regular VPNs. This is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody, for example, working in the United States. When they will launch their VPN software, they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this. And they're all going to be in U.S. And all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company. So this is all the same network. They're all on the same network. They're just different location. This is very normal when they are launch their VPN software. They will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these. The reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down. It happens. Sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect, for example, to the same one. Let's look at the, let's look at the capacities here, for example. You can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one. So people automatically tend to click on the very first server available. And you can see that in this example, there's 13% capacity already meaning that it has the most, well, this one has a lot too, 15%, but people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, VPN server for their company. Either way, if they're having trouble suddenly connecting to, for example, Los Angeles here, just ask them to connect to Miami, New York, San Jose, or Seattle. So that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues. Now, the other thing, uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there. So you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software, to reinstall VPN software for the user. And a lot of times what happens is a company will set up a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN. So, for example, what happens is they would get a link, they would type in that link, whatever that may be, getmyvpnsoftware.com. For example, this is not, I don't even know if this is a real website or not, but this is kind of what would happen. They would get a link, and keep in mind, they're, they're still, they're, at this time, they're not connected. Their problem is they cannot connect the VPN, and they don't have software either. So they, what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to, and once they go to that link, they can download the software and install it. So you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges, this and that. That's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software. But keep that in mind. If they don't have it, there has to be a way to get that VPN software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the VPN. You, you see what I'm saying? There has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation so that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards um, so they can just get back to work and start working. All right, guys, I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support. Let me know. If you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN, I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN. Let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed. I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios, different options. But keep in mind, there are many, many different ways of initiating VPN. Companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software, you know, different prerequisites, meaning they may have a different uh security so some companies as far as i know may not even require a second password or rsa token which is kind of silly but you do see that with smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and you know make do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff so it's going to be it's going to vary a little bit but in general what i've explained to you is exactly the main things they're, they're exactly the, the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, 
you can literally go, for example, to an interview for help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections, but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet while VPN for a business allows you connect, allows you to connect to the company's network. So that way you have access to all of those resources. So that way you can work so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires, their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto VPN. They can typically log into their computer but they can't get on their VPN because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all. And they can't just do control alt delete. This is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password. They can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So the only thing they can do, as they typically do, is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call, and I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password, so they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir, but keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. No, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need to, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. 
I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of a overview of what we gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or force to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right, thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select Users, you can see that bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the Users folder and select Find. In here, you can type in the name of the user, and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So let's go ahead and click Find Now, and here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double-click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in, so the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked, in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply or OK, and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find, and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user here. Since we found it already, we don't have to dig through the Active Directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password. Is that now, since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user, you can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. But before we do that, please take one second to click the like button. And as always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I will answer them. All right, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So here's what Zoom looks like when you install it. This is the Zoom application installed on your computer. When somebody gives you just a link and you've never used Zoom before, and chances are if they just sent you a link, you will simply click on the link and the link will say, hey, do you want to install Zoom? 
and then you click open Zoom or install Zoom and it's going to install it. And then what you get and what you actually see is this window. This is the window that you would typically see first time you use Zoom. And then you realize maybe my audio is not working, people can't hear me or people can't see me. We're going to definitely talk about that. But the, also a first pop-up that might you might see is it's going to ask you whether you want to use your computer uh, as audio. So you have to make sure that you click use my computer as audio. So that's going to pop up and you just click on that. And that's very simple. But then even then, if you don't have your audio set up correctly, it may not work. Let's look at the microphone uh, icon here. You can see there's activity there. That means it's detecting that there is a microphone that's picking up all those sounds from the microphones coming through. That's good. However, we may have multiple microphones. How do we know which one is being used correctly or if any? What if that's not happening? That means we need to tell it which microphone needs to be used. So if we click on this little arrow here, we're going to see a lot of stuff. And you can see I have a lot of stuff. The reason I do is because, you know, I'm a YouTuber. I have lots of equipment. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that shows up. If you simply have a headset, if you simply have a headset, all you got to do is find out what is the name of it. In my case, I have a headset and it's called Plantronics C610. So I'm going to make sure I select that as the speaker because otherwise I won't be able to hear people. So now my Plantronics C610 C610 is selected. So that's my speaker. That's what I'm going to hear inside of my Plantronics headset that I'm going to put on my head. And then same thing for microphone. I'm going to make sure that this microphone is selected. And notice it's still working. The reason it's working is because it's selected as the same as system. And I have multiple ones. So it's probably picking up my microphone that I'm speaking to right now, which is not my headset. But for Zoom meeting, I want to use my headset, so I'm going to select it. And then I'm going to double check here, make sure it's selected. And you can tell that it's selected by simple, you know, check mark that you have here. And that's one way to make sure that you're using a separate, like if you have multiple things like me, this way you can keep track and make sure that, you know, if you want to use it separate from other equipment, you just have to make sure that it knows what you want to use. And now my audio is set. This is if you're using a headset. If you're using like a laptop, if you have a laptop, you have to make sure that the microphones, laptop, and speakers are selected. So if you're not using a website and just your built-in laptop camera and the microphone, make sure that Realtek is selected for the speakers like this speakers and the camera. Since I'm not using a laptop, all you see is speakers and no cam no microphone here. But if I was to, for example, switch to my a, uh, webcam and like, for example, I have a uh, microphone on a webcam that is called HD Pro Webcam. And I'm going to select that if you want, if I want to use that camera. Now, this <laughs> webcam doesn't have speakers. So I'm going to make sure that Realtek is just enabled, which is my PC speakers, right? So again, don't pay attention to this last part too much unless you have these specific things. But if you're using a headset, make sure you select the correct headset in both of the, these menus. That way it makes it simple for you. But if you have a laptop, just a laptop, you won't have this many things in here. So just make sure that the Realtek is selected. But if you have a webcam, make sure that the webcam is selected and uh, the PC's speakers. So now you can see how I've selected the microphone for the Plantronics and it's actually picking up a little bit less of it because it's kind of uh, about a foot or so away from me. So it's picking up less of it. Right now I'm speaking into something else. Anyways, that's the audio. Uh, we can certainly test it. You can test it here, test speaker and microphone and it goes through this setup where it detects the levels of it and then it tells you, do you hear the ringtone? And it's a really good way to actually make sure that your headset or your audio is working. So I highly suggest you use that for testing. And then you can also have, if you have a phone embedded, that's another thing. Uh, but, you know, this is uh, this is video specifically for somebody who chances are just installed a Zoom for the first time. And this phone integration is something else. So I don't necessarily want to talk about this because it would be way too much and way too confusing. Um, and then 
uh, you can, if you click leave computer audio, uh, that means you can just like call into the meeting and use your like phone, like your cell phone, you know, or your, your home phone if you have them. And then if you want to really look at the audio settings, you can click on the audio settings here. And then you can see again what is selected in just a different separate menu. But it's the same thing we did earlier, except that you can adjust the output levels and this and that, you know. And then there are other things you can do, like use separate audio device to play a ringtone simultaneously. For example, if you have a headset, but you want your ringtone to come through the computer speakers, make sure that this is checked like that and then select speakers, real text. So now this time it, the ringtone is going to come through the PC speakers. There are a lot of issues, uh, a lot of issues, a lot of things you can do here. And then, you know, you just play with them and make sure, you know, kind of find out what your preferences are. And then, you know, like for example, you can automatically mute your microphone when you're joining meeting. These are all personal preferences. You can go to advanced and deal in, and, you know, adjust the background noise but this is fine as it is I wouldn't worry about it just kind of leave it at that otherwise you can just cause issues uh, more issues with the uh, audio and if it works you know don't try to fix what's not broken type of thing you know so just make sure that your proper microphone and speaker are selected do a quick test on them and make sure that works now let's look at the video video all right now I just have a picture there and if I click start video you can see me here talking and this is uh, <laughs> this is my puppet here, I guess, and I just have that for. And you can see me over here in the in the right hand corner, uh, right there. You can see me uh, just kind of talking and waving. So I'm the puppeteer, if you will. So my <laughs> video is enabled here, but if I want to stop at any time, I can just click stop. And then if I want to select a different camera, I can certainly do that. And for example, select this HD you know, uh, webcam or whatever your webcam is, it's going to be listed there. Now, keep in mind that if you have a camera open in another program, that it may not work at all. Like in this example, if I select my pro webcam here, it's not going to work because I have it open in another program. So if I click start, it just doesn't do anything. It's, it literally says cannot start video, fail to start video camera, please select another video and camera settings. I know you can't see that error pop up because it's on my second screen where my puppet is and I'm going to actually switch to it so maybe, maybe hopefully it stays there yeah you can see it right there that there is the error cannot start video because I had um, camera um, I clicked on a camera that's been used by something else so make sure that no other program is open and using your camera that's why you get that error you know otherwise it's you know it's pretty straightforward you select the camera you want to use and that's that. Now, and then you can look, I mean, let's look at the video settings here, what we have here. And uh, you can set different uh, options. Of course, select the camera you want to use again. But you can also see that you can change the aspect ratios, enable HD. You can mirror your video. You can touch up your appearance to make yourself look prettier. And, um, you know, different personal preferences that you want to show people about you. Camera is one of those things that is, you know, I don't like using it. Um, for obvious reasons because I'm ugly but you know you know some people like it some people like it so and that's fine um, I personally don't care for it here's a some kind of fun thing that you can look at and that is virtual uh, backgrounds so let me see if this works since I have a green screen going on I wonder if it'll actually detect it decently or do anything with it and I'm going to select that I have a green screen oh wow hey that's pretty cool actually look at that would y'all look at that? All right, all right. Let me let me close it here. I'm going to start video. Hey, that's not bad. So if you have a green screen, this works really cool, doesn't it? I like that. That's pretty cool. It looks like I'm in space and whatnot. Let's change to something else. Choose a virtual background. Ooh, at the beach. I wish I was at the beach right now. Look at that. Would y'all look at that? That's pretty cool. Oh, look, it's moving. <laughs> that's actually pretty fun I've seen other people's um, other people using virtual backgrounds and it kind of looks off because they don't have green screen but in my case I have a perfect green screen because it's softer there's no cloth behind me or anything like that it's just my puppet and he um, has a perfect green screen because it's 100% 
green ski. And let's do one other. Oh, okay. Uh, I think this one's the best, although it's not moving. And then there's none. You can see there's my perfect green screen over here, you know. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. I think it's really fun to actually create this video. I, uh, uh, it's it's cool. It's cool. Like, it's not that hard to use, but, yeah, you know, people still have issues. And that's understandable. It's okay to have these type of issues, you know. It's okay. As long as we know how to fix them, these are normal computer issues that happen all the time. All right, guys. So here's our ticketing system. If you haven't watched my videos on how to use ticketing systems, I certainly have them. Check out my help desk playlist. So in this case, uh, we're going to work on this ticket from uh, this gentleman here. And we're just going to select it because it's not assigned or anything like that. So the first thing we're going to do is assign it to ourselves. And I'm going to click over here real quick and I'm going to assign it to myself. So what do we have here? This ticket is about my monitor is not working and then there is a number and it says call me and this guy's name is Mike Moser. So in this case, this customer really wants us to call them. So in this case, we're not going to communicate via email or through the system or through an instant messenger or anything like that. This guy wants to be called. So we're going to call him and we're going to try to help him with a broken monitor now I know that a lot of uh, uh, people are working from home nowadays so in this case we're going to role, role play um, into assuming that this guy or this customer is actually working from home so that way we can kind of provide uh, at least current time type of uh, situation but then again of course when you do help this you will help people that are working from home as well. So let's give him a call and see how that goes. Hey, this is Mike. Hello, sir. This is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about monitor not working. Now, just to make sure, is this Mike Moser? Yeah, this is Mike Moser. All right, sir. I just wanted to see uh, what I can do to help you with this. Um, so your monitor is not working. Yeah, that's right. My monitor is not working. I don't know what's going on this morning. I uh, logged in and I couldn't, I don't know. It's just, it's just a blank screen. It's just black. It like, kind of looks like it's dead. So I'm not sure what I can do here. Sir, um, do you, um, when was the, no, just to make sure, is your monitor turned on? Like, is there a green light on it or like some kind of indicator that's turned on? Yeah, it does. It does look like it's turned on, but I don't know what's going on. All right. No problem, sir. Now, does your, uh, now just, I just want to make sure, is your computer turned on? Do you see any like indication on the computer itself that there's like a blinking lights or is there any activity on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's, uh, it, it's working. I uh, pressed the on button and uh, it, it's it turned on. Everything seems to be working. It's just the monitors. I, I can tell, I can tell that the, I can hear the noise whenever I turned on the, the, the computer, I heard the noise, you know, that, that, that noise that comes up every time you turn on a computer. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That, that's pretty good. Uh, that's a, that's um that's a good thing actually it's better than you know better for your monitor to be broken rather than the computer itself yeah 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 i know yeah so um do you by chance have two monitors yeah i i actually do yeah that's great sir so if you can um can you please unplug the one monitor that's not working yeah i can try that hold on Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So what's going on? Chances are that only one of the monitors is broken and not both of them. So if you unplug the one that's not working, the other one should come up with a picture. Uh, all right. All right. I'm, I'm going to try here. Hold on. All right. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it does. The second monitor does work. Yeah, I see. I see the where I can log in and stuff. Well, that's great, sir. So uh, thankfully, it's just one monitor that's broken. Um, in this case, it, it really does sound like the first one or the one that your main one is. It wasn't working. It was just kind of dead. And I know you didn't uh, unplug anything before that or anything like that. No, no, no. I didn't touch anything. It's just, you know, that's, I, I just, I, this morning is just not working. 
All right. So the reason I say it's good is because this way you can at least work with one monitor for, for now, but um, we can certainly replace your uh, broken one. So, I mean, there are a couple of ways of going about it. You can order a new one through the, the system that you have in place, maybe through the through the company's website or something. I think there's an ordering website, or if by chance you go to your local um, office uh, where they have the you know IT guys locally, maybe they can give you a new one or something like that. Because I know you work from home, so um, all right, all right. Well, I'm glad I got one working. Uh, all right, I guess I'll just deal with this one or just work with, with the one for time being. Uh, all right, uh, well, thanks for your help. Yeah, no problem, sir. If there is anything else that you need help with, please let me know. Uh, but yeah, it does sound like just one of those monitors is, is broken. And, ch you know, chances are that if it's an older one, that just happens all the time. Um, all right. Um, anything else? No, nah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for your help. All right, sure. No problem. You have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. All right. So now that we have finished talking to the customer, the next thing we have to do is uh, leave a uh, note or and even close the ticket in this case. So this is a good situation in which we can uh, do so. Uh, chances are, I mean, depending on the setup in your business environment, that you may want to route this ticket to their to his local support. It depends on whether he's going to actually go physically to the office where he works and get a monitor from there you know but we haven't since we haven't gone through that with him and he doesn't know for sure he can deal with that on his end but of course we're going to add a eternal note that simply says customers main monitor is not working um Let's see here. What what else can we say? Can we provide more detail or, or uh, about what we did? Or are we just going to say that we resolved it by unplugging it? Well, it's up to you. And this is about a style of you, how you work. So, But I like to provide details. So what I'm going to do is type in instructed Mike to unplug the first slash broken monitor after doing so it appears that the monitor is indeed broken and then we're going to type in workaround down here and again this is your personal preference on how you put these notes in but you want to put down what you did and how you resolved it that's for sure your, how you do it, it's up to you. This is what I'm going to do. Work around. He will use his second monitor for time being. Later, he will acquire a new monitor. And... That's pretty much what I'm going to leave here because what I did here is, you know, stated that indeed his monitor, main monitor is not working. Asked him to basically test it because uh, that's about the only thing you can do when you're not physically there. Asked him to unplug the first broken monitor. A lot of times you would just check the cables, see if everything is plugged in. But I kind of went with my guts here and just kind of asked him to unplug the first broken monitor. Because this situation also happens where people assume that their computer is broken, but it's actually not. What's going on is that their main monitor goes out, but their second monitor is actually just blank screen or it's just it's just black, right? So there's nothing going on. They assume their computer is broken. In this case, he kind of assumed it was a monitor and he was right. It's, it's the main monitor that's broken. And I instructed him to unplug the first broken one. And after that, it appears that the monitor is broken indeed. However, he has a workaround, which is his second monitor for time being. So we're going to save that, and uh, we're going to change the status to complete. And uh, I think that saved it. I, I always forget whether there's actually a save button, because I use a bunch of different ticketing systems. And uh, definitely at my main job, I use a different ticketing system, and there's actual save button that I have to click after I completed. Well, there you guys. 
there you have it guys uh this is how you resolve this simple monitor ticket but it's a good kind of um shows you how to deal with a customer in, in a sense and i hope you like my role playing obviously you can tell that it was me doing the voice i uh i i kind of went with um dr fauci's raspy voice if you recognize that uh, or if you see that in that <laughs> let me know but that's kind of what i went with it was the uh, I think his name is Anthony Fauci, right? You guys know what I'm talking about um, if you're up to date on the current situation in the world. All right, guys. So let's look at this ticket. I have a, this a mock-up ticket that I created in this uh, service desk system, and it's called My Email Is Not Work. The uh, description would say, Hi, my email is not working. This is my link. And then they show you a link, and there's a link right there. We can click on it. We can check it out. That's perfectly fine. And then we have an attachment of an error. And if we click on that, it gives us a lot of clues to what the problem is. So I love seeing attachments of the errors because they can save me a lot of time when it, when it comes to working tickets. And we already, you know, we can already guess what the problem here is because we've seen this type of website before many, many times. Chances are we all use this type of website. And we can see immediately why mail is not working. Their email is not working. And if we click on the link, Sure enough, it's not working because it's broken. But as as we can see here, we, we know that we are just missing the L there. So if we just type in L there, just a sec, type in L, we can see that the email is working. So we can simply come back to the customer or user and just say, here, this is the correct link, which is perfect and great. This is easy ticket to do. And it's no problem, right? The situation what I wanted to talk about is related to when a user or a customer reports a link not working of a website that you're not familiar with at all. So we can fix this one easily just by adding L. But when we go to a website, for example, imagine if this was the problem here, this link up here. Imagine if that was the problem. How would we even know that this part of it is not missing, just that eight. How do we know that? So we won't, we won't know that. It's not like we know every hyperlink for each website to know for sure whether the user is using that specific link. I mean, it can extend to, as far as we know, a limited length. So how do we deal with that specific issue? So let's pretend that this is a website that's not google.com. That's something totally different. Now we have to reach out to the customer. And preferably, this issue I would handle preferably over the IM or instant messenger if available within that company. If not, you may have to call the user and talk to them directly. That might be another option. And the way I would go approach this, I would reply to the customer. I would say, hello, my name is... Irvin with help desk. I have your ticket about broken link. And then if, if it's, again, if it's a website that we're not familiar with, we don't know for sure. Because the thing is, though, we click on the link and we also get the same error. So we don't know whether they're using the correct link or not, or if the website is down for sure. So we have to figure out first whether it's the broken link. Because... 90% of the time, it's the wrong link that they're using. And it's not necessarily their fault or anything like that. We have to make sure that we're respectful towards the user or the customer because this type of stuff happens, you know, especially if they're pushing back, saying that it's not, you know, it's, you know there, there, is, there is the correct link. But that's okay. We're going to get to that part here. So, hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about broken link. And then we can say, um, if we're suspecting a wrong link that they're using, is anybody else in your group having this issue? Or we can say, is anybody else in your group able to access this website? All right? So we can send that off to them and wait for their reply. But, you know, since since it's a website, we don't know. 
we, we kind of want to resolve this as quickly as possible. We don't want to necessarily wait for them to receive an email from the ticketing system for the notification, wait for them to reply, this and that. that. I mean, that's fine if you know or if they happen to be watching their email all the time. But chances are they're not. This is what I'm saying. You might want to reach them over the IM if possible or if you want to call them. So a lot of times they come back and say this, customer, yes, that is the correct link, right? So they may come back and just say that. Then, then what do you do? And if you're still suspecting uh, that it is the, you know, that it, that it is the wrong link, you can say, can you please check with one other person just to be sure? And then they might come back and say, uh, usually after a little bit, because they are, you know, chances are, they are probably checking, you know, and then, um, you know, if they come back and say, yes, it's working for them. So this is your clue right here immediately. We immediately have like even higher suspicion that it is indeed a wrong link, a wrong link that they might be using. If, is, if this is working for somebody else, and not for them, and it's obviously not working for us, that's because I, Irvin, and the customer, and the customer, we both have the wrong link that was provided by the customer. And then if they keep saying, if they keep insisting they are using the same link as me, you can say, can you please show me the screenshot of a working website? So you got to be, you got to be very careful with this. You got to be kind of uh, systematic in a way, but also respectful at the same time. You can't just tell them, no, you are using the wrong link. That's not, that's not the way you deal with the, uh, customers or users on the help desk so customer would you know reply with screenshot and then you would look at that screenshot and then chances are that that screenshot will have that clue to you of what the correct link so you're looking at it and then you're like well you are unfortunately you are using the wrong link because you're missing like an eight or in our case of the email here, you know, we can go back to this. If we look at it, we can say, well, in this case, you're missing an L. So that indeed is the wrong link, unfortunately. And that would resolve that. Sure, at some point, you will come across an issue where it's a website that, it, it you know, the website is down for everybody. So, and, and that's different, you know, if you, you know, especially if you're familiar with the website, you'll know, yeah, this is not normal, this and that. But in this case, this is how you deal with a customer or a user that simply has a wrong link for whatever reason. It happens. You just got to be respectful and be systematic about it and very professional about it. This comes up a lot on help desk, wrong link tickets. It's very, very common thing. All right, guys. I hope you, I hope you like this video. I tried to make it as as a real world example as possible and explain it in a way where it's easy to understand. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. If you have any questions, I have lots of help desk videos that are very, uh, very useful, very popular. A lot of people like them, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Okay. All right. I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Oh, wait, wait, I almost forgot to mention, guys, I have a lots of written stuff that's related to help desk, network administration, system administration, all kinds of IT topics. I don't even remember how many I got, but it's on my website. It's at CosmicNovo.com. So if you go there, you can see that I have a bunch of different written versions of all kinds of different IT stuff that you can read if, you're, if, you're, if you would rather read 
um, some of this stuff, then you can certainly do so on my website. So in my recent video, I was installing Windows 10 on the laptop that I've upgraded with an M.2 drive. And my excitement and happiness went quickly from that to being very angry at trying to install Windows 10 on it. I do realize that this version of Windows 10 is 1909. I feel like things changed or maybe I missed something. Please let me know. This video that you're about to watch is completely unedited aside from the part of me just adding this intro. But everything else is just straight through without cuts. And my experience was not not very good installing Windows 10. It, the, the stuff and the amount of things they were making me do just to get into the Windows 10 was very infuriating at some point. And uh, I hope that doesn't translate to you guys, but I just wanted to share it. You know, this is unedited. Uh, fairly long clip, so here you're going to watch me basically install Windows 10 on this laptop. Alright, here it comes. Uh, now we're going to see how quickly we can install Windows on it. Keep in mind that the USB stick that I put on there is, uh, that I plugged in, it's a very old one. That is super slow too, so, but you know, I digress. We'll see how fast we can install operating system on it. If it takes too long, I'll certainly uh, edit that out. But, hey, uh, who knows? Uh, maybe it's going to be pretty quick. All right. You know, select new install, by the way. If you're just, there's our drive. I'm going to create a new partition. I'm just going to leave it at default because I want to use all of it. And what was I going to say? So it creates a bunch of different partitions. One just has to be like that for... Um, just the way operating system works. Do you want to proceed? Yes. And, uh, yeah, very important. Otherwise, you won't be able to boot. And I get that question a lot from uh, my video on installing an M.2 adapter. Um, very popular video. I want to say it's almost 400,000 views at this point. People always ask me, can I boot? You know, can I boot OS through it? Well, if your computer supports uh, UEFI, then yes. Uh, that's that's definitely possible but not just the regular UEFI either sometimes you gotta have the most recent one most recent version I'm gonna get what was it the most current one 1.3 or 1.4 I'm not sure but um, this one is uh, definitely going fast considering it's it's loading from a USB 2.0 on a really old thumb drive that matter of fact I think I washed one time in my pants because it's one of those that you put on your keychain you know um, it, it it fell off the keychain and it stayed in my pants in my pocket but uh, I still use it it's an old 32 gigabyte drive it's slow but hey that's going pretty fast so I'm happy with that I um, what we're gonna do here I'm going to do a fresh install I'm going to install Crystal Disk, and we're going to run that right away. Matter of fact, I'm not even going to install any drivers for this Samsung NVMe. I'm going to test it without any Samsung drivers installed. Whatever Windows gives me, I'm going to test it with that. What happens, happens, right? And I'm going to make sure I disable uh, any... I'm going to put basically a laptop this into airplane mode so there's no Wi-Fi um, enabled. I'm only going to enable it just so I can install Crystal Disk, but I don't want any updates to start doing because that's the first thing that happens once you install a fresh Windows copy. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. Windows 10, if you already had Windows 10 on the computer, you can just reinstall it. And if you get that pop-up, do you want to register and whatnot? Uh, don't worry about that. As soon as you get on the internet, it's going to be, it's going to register it, you know, so because it knows it's hardware based. So it's okay for you to install a new hard drive. I mean, they know that you're going to install a new hard drive because it knows. Um, it's, it's basically going to know that it's the same computer and it's the same key, same key and same license. So you don't have to worry about, oh, am I going to be able to reinstall Windows on it? Yes, you can. I will definitely get a pop-up. Do you want to register it or, you know, this and that? But as soon as I get to the, on the Internet, get on the Internet, it's going to work. Um, same thing. If you're doing a fresh install on a brand new computer, if you have a Windows 7 key, you can also use that to, um, you know, to activate your Windows. That's what I meant to say. Register, activate, not register. 
you know, it's it's different. It's activate. Registering Windows is basically creating a Windows Microsoft account to register your product. But how long have I been speaking? This is almost done. It's 95%. And um, that's getting ready files for installation. We'll see how long it takes to install uh, everything else. But so far it's going really fast, considering it has to read from a, something super slow. But that's okay, you know. I, I think it's going to be really fast anyways. Wow, it instantly installed features. Uh, there's there can't you can't get any updates because it's not connected to the internet. And wow, that's it's going pretty fast. Let me do a little zoom out action here, so you guys can see the little progress bar down there. Oh wow, it's already done. Oh my god. Oh wow. Okay, okay. See, it's gonna restart up there. Oops, sorry about that. I didn't mean to shake the screen. I just accidentally hit the the tripod. So it's rebooting right now, and should I unplug it? No, I was thinking about my USB stick. Hopefully it doesn't, cause it's gonna, hopefully it doesn't try to boot from that again. I, uh, well, I'm just gonna let it be. If I have to remove the thumb drive in a second here, I'll certainly do that. All right, come on, baby, come on, come on, baby. Let's make it happen. Let's make it for the people. Let's make it happen for the people watching. By the way, guys, since we're waiting on this, come on, man, click the like button. Click the like button. I know you got one second. Okay, so he's trying to install it again. So I'm just gonna pull the hard, the uh, thumb thumb drive out, real quick, and I'm going to cancel this. It's what I should have done right away. So once I once it, this happens, it's it's going to, it, it's done. That that was, what was it? I'm gonna have to check maybe three minutes or something like that maybe three minutes to install from a slow thumb drive man I'm very optimistic to see how fast this is gonna go wow did you see that that went quickly all right now usually also whenever you create a new like a login account for somebody that can take a while too basically your login ID whenever you you know, trying to do something on the computer and you gotta have a login ID. We'll see how fast that goes. I suspect here very shortly it's gonna come up to that window where it's gonna ask me, do you want to activate all these Windows 10 features and whatnot, which I personally like to disable, but for the sake of moving this along, I'm just gonna leave it enabled. Later on I can disable it. I um I don't like I don't like all that you know too much data being sent over the internet to Microsoft or anybody else. And I like to keep things as private as possible. All right. The screen went dark and it rebooted once more. Give it a sec. Give it a sec here, guys. Give it a sec. It's almost there. It's almost there. All right. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. I sound like uh. <laughs> here we go. I was gonna say I sound like uh, Elvis, but I probably don't. Elvis Presley. There it is. Cortana. I'm Cortana. No, Cortana. No, come on, Cortana. How do I get an exit out of this? Use your voice or the keyboard along the way. Come on, Cortana. Like to stay quiet, just select the little microphone icon towards the bottom of your screen. Yes. Come on. Come on, Cortana. All right, cool. Sure. Skip. And uh, let's do, I, I do need to connect real quick to my Wi-Fi, which is this one. I'm going to put my password in. I think that's right. Sure, sure. Come on. Let's see how fast we can do this. By the way, By the way, this is like one of the record times for installing Windows 10, honestly. This is all real time. I haven't cut once 
I haven't cut even one time. I can't wait to see the uh, the test, the crystal disc test on this. I'm really curious. I don't want to see what's new on Windows. Come on, man. Just just get in there. Just a moment. All right. I'm waiting. All right. There it is. Nope. I'm not gonna use Microsoft account. No. No, 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 no. Come on. I don't want to use this. Come on, and back. Let's just do that. Come on, man. I don't want to, look, I hate this. Get a new one. Get, get a new create account. I'm trying to create a local account and it's being so so difficult. They changed it. Create an account. No. I'm not. Can't believe I'm spending so much time on this. This was, it was never like this, but I don't want to create a Microsoft account. This is ridiculous. Oh my god. Fine. Fine, create a new account. Unbelievable. Yes, I know. I already have it somewhere else. I'm not going to This is ridiculous. I'm going to create a local account later. Oh my god. I'm just going to put whatever. Oh, I probably shouldn't otherwise I won't be able to log in. No, no, I had enough spying of you. See what I'm talking about? Oh, get out of here, man. Oh, I'm just going to put in whatever. Jeez. Can't believe it's making me do all of this crap. I'm just going to pick whatever. Unbelievable. And now it's, look, this is so stupid. Now it's asking me for my phone number. 555-555-5555. Umba. Unbelievable, man. This is so ridiculous. It didn't do this before, I'm telling you. Oh, now he wants a pin? Now you want a, f oh. man. Zero 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 zero. Zero 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 zero. Oh my god. Can't believe you're making me do this crap. Unbelievable. I'm sorry guys, I didn't know it was gonna turn into this. What is the do you the more No. I didn't know it was gonna it it's this is I did, I did not think it was going to take more longer than installing the Windows operating system. I hate you, Cortana. This is so stupid. Oh, look, of course it's going to... No. Mm. Decline. Um, oh my, look at all this crap. Now look at all this crap. I wasn't going to talk smack about them, but look at all this crap. All of that stuff is, is spying on you. And trying to advertise to you and trying to sell you their service. I understand you got to have a business. But man, this is too much. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. My God. It really ruined my day, this, this, this crap. Hopefully the benchmark of this. And I'm, I guarantee you, I will disable all of that stuff. I just don't have time to show you guys this right now. But I'll disable all of those services. Everything. Everything's going to be disabled. This is ridiculous. I, man, I'm, I'm this close. I'm this close to switching to Linux. This close. It's ridiculous. 
may take several minutes. I better not. I just put in a new, new hard drive. New solid state M.2 PCIe NVMe drive. I hate you, Microsoft. Look at this. Wants to restart immediately. Hell no. Where's the store? Stupid store. We have to go to stupid store to install this thing. Search Crystal Disk. Come on now. Can you guys see that? Yeah, you can. Where is a crystal disk? I know it's there. No. Come on. I know it's your stupid thing. Oh my god. I misspelled it. There it is, Crystal Disk app. Look at that. They made it so difficult to find. No. Get. Can't believe it, man. I have to jump through all these hoops. Come on. Install. All right. This is insanely ridiculous. All right, I'm going to do Okay, airplane mode is on. I can hear the laptop going doing overtime. There's something going on here. Something is using power. Can you see that? Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kubelman. In today's video, we're going to talk about a practical way of troubleshooting somebody's computer remotely without using remote desktop software. So there is not going to be any RDP action, there's not going to be any third-party software that we're going to use to resolve this issue at all. We're going to use things that are at our disposal that we can do to potentially fix the problem. So this will be really good for somebody who does help desk or desktop support or even tech support at, for example, a local office or a branch. And if you got one second, please click on the like button. I really appreciate it. I promise you this is going to be a great video. And I always appreciate you guys doing that. Thank you. All right, here we go, guys. I've created a couple of tickets that we can work on. And the first one right here, it says, my program is not working. Now, keep in mind, again, we don't have access to remote desktop. We don't have any tools like VMware or VNC or anything remote that we can use or any third-party remote software that we can use in order to help this user with their issue. So their issue is here, my program is not working. And uh, in the description, it says here, every time I click on a program icon, nothing help, nothing happens. Please help me. Thanks, Larry B. So here's the thing. Uh, first thing we got to do is actually ask Larry what his PC name is. Once he comes back with that information, we can start to work with that. So you may have to call him, you know, talk to him and say, hey, Larry, uh, what is your PC name? So that way we can try to help you out. But of course, be more professional like you would call him and say hey this is for example for example this is Irvin I'm with end user support and I have your ticket about my program is not working I can help you but uh, can you please tell me what your PC name is so we're, we're, we're what we are going to do with that PC name is try to remotely access it however first thing first thing first we got to assign this ticket 
to ourselves, so I'm going to assign it to myself. <laughs> I, although this is not a ticketing video, I always want to make sure that that's happening. But so I'm going to actually reply here and also tell him, hello, this is Irvin with EUS end user support. Can you please tell me what your PC name is? So, of course, I wanted to give you as detailed as possible how you'd work this. So this is why I kind of put this note in, which in reality, it should send them a, an email or a notification of some sort so he can respond to you with that information. Or again, you can just talk to him, call him, you know, get in contact with him to get this information. So that way you can take a look and see what's going on. Again, we don't have RDP, so there is no GUI that we can look at here. Uh, and uh, we're just going to use uh, PC name as that. So let's go to the PC, the, the user's PC, so we can find that out real quick. So here we are. This is the user's computer. So while they're on it, you can just instruct them how to get their PC name if they don't know how to. So we can say, Larry, can you please go to your search bar? And the reason I'm going about it in this way is because users are very familiar with the search bar because they always look at it. And you can just tell them, click inside the search bar and just type in system or PC or, or whatever you feel comfortable with because there are multiple locations where you can find the PC name. So here's just the system that comes up and then you can tell them, hey, where does it say system name? And here it is. It says Kobuman 1. So once he gives you that information, we're going to go back to our computer. So now we know that the PC name is, I'm adding an internal note, PC name is Kobuman 1. Now we're going to try to access it. Now, of course, while we talk to Larry here, we want to make sure that we know what which which uh, program is not working. So we're going to access that um, access his computer uh, using just over that network using using a file explorer over the network. The way you do that is open a file explorer and just type in backspace or backslash backslash type in Kobuman one, and then another backslash. And then we're going to access his C share drive, which is should be enabled by default for your business. It may not be, but it really should be in, in a, a business type of environment. It should let you in. You may get a pop-up asking you to log in, and that's fine too. Just use your credentials, and if you have access, that's great. So once we're inside of C, right now we're connected to his PC over there. We can see that it's on the network connection right here. And then the name of his computer is Kobuman 1, and we're inside of his C drive. We're looking at his C drive um, just using a file explorer. So he's using a program, right? He's using a program, and we know it's not working. And then we're going to ask him, which program is it, right? And then, of course, since we don't have remote desktop, we can't initiate the repair. Normally, you can just repair the program, and a lot of times that would fix it. You know, uninstall it, reinstall it, and whatnot. But if you don't have that option, or user doesn't, you know, have the admin privileges to do it either, and again, you don't have a remote desktop of any type of software, we're going to try to fix that by going to his local profile. Because in this case, if we go back here, it says nothing happens when he runs the program. So what do you suspect? Suspect. I suspect some kind of configuration issue or just corrupted data or a cache uh, inside of his local profile where the configuration resides. So we're going to go inside of users folder and we're going to look for his local profile. We're going to ask him, what is your local profile name? And then he's going to tell you what his local profile name, which is going to be the same thing as his login. So we're going to pretend that his login is B-U-C-O. We're going to go inside of that. And typically, typically configuration data for any type of program that's run, there on, that's run under your local profile is going to be in app data folder. So we're going to click on app data. And then a lot of times it's either going to be in local or roaming. So let's have, let's go into local folder and see what happens. So let's say he has problems with Adobe. We can simply, uh, just to kind of clear the catch, we can simply rename this folder into Adobe old, for example. And as long as his program is not open, it's going to let us rename it like that. 
And this is okay uh, because once he launches Adobe, it's going to create a new version of the same folder. And just to kind of show you what's inside, we're going to go inside of this and you can see that if you kind of browse through, you can see that it's either empty and a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I pick this randomly, but there will be some configuration data like config files and this and that. But since it's at the local profile level, it's not necessarily something that's part of the program uh, as, as in program that it needs to function. It's something that's created for the local profile as the part of the configuration for that profile. And the same thing happens with anything else. For example, there's Google here. You know, if you go inside a Google here folder, uh, and if you go, you can see that it's a Chrome. And if you go inside of that, you can see there's user data. Again, this is what I talked about. And if you, for example, go to default, you can see that there is a cache data inside of it. And of course, you can find things like, uh, I don't know, their uh, favorites and stuff like that, which is, by the way, missing on this one. Uh, but that's okay. So let's stay on track here. Since we messed with Adobe, I'm going to tell them, go ahead and Adobe, uh, try to open Adobe again. So let's go back to the user's computer. All right, so we're back at the user's computer. We don't need this window anymore. Actually, I'm just going to, yeah, let's close it. We're going to close it. And then we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm, so in this at this point, I'm telling them, okay, go ahead and open Adobe. So he's going to type in Adobe and then... We're going to click Adobe Reader. We can see that Adobe Reader works fine. And let's kind of go back to our computer so we can see again what's going on from our point of view. We are now back at, you know, our point of view as a technician. And we can see that the new folder was created for Adobe, like I stated. So that created new. And you can see that here that the date is 6 10 2020 at 1 p.m. And if you look at the time here, it's 101 p.m. So that means it created just like I said it would. And what that does, it basically resets that program. And a lot of times it actually resolves the issue. All right. Now, just in case you actually had to go in and change registry settings, that's, a, that's something you can also do without having to have a remote desktop, as long as you have the proper credentials to do so. So on your computer, on your own computer that you're using, your work computer, you're going to open up a registry editor, and you have to run it as administrator. So remember how computer name for this gentleman was Kobelman1 here? And let's pretend that we have to go into registry and add some kind of a function, some kind of key to make it work. We can do that remotely as well. So we're going to take Kobelman1, which is the name of his computer, and we're going to connect to it over the network registry. So we're going to connect to his registry on his computer over the network. We're going to click network. We're going to put in Kobelman1. We're going to check name to see if we can actually find it on the network. And it usually takes a little bit, it depends, you know, on, on the setup. But you can see that it found it, and it's located on this work group. But a lot of times it would just be a domain name. It says new server zero. That's actually the name of my work group for my local computers at home. But it will be kind of the same deal when it comes to domain. It will be domain name first, followed by the computer name. So that means it found it. When it's underlined like that, it means it found it. We can click OK. And we are now directly connected into his registry. So let's go ahead and kind of navigate, see if we can find that Adobe. We're going to expand H key local machine. You know, it's a local machine on his computer. We, we are now connected to it. We're going to expand H key local machine. And guess the next thing we're going to do? We're going to use some logic here, guys, and we're going to just go to software. We're going to expand software because we know Adobe is software. Now, there are a couple of different places that it might be, depending on whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit software. But you can see right away that Adobe shows up here. So if you expand that, you can see that this is actually for Premiere Pro and After Effects. So that's not what we're actually worked on. We actually worked on Adobe uh, DC or Adobe Reader DC. So if we scroll down and expand... Wow 6432 node, which indicates that it's a 32-bit software. Uh, we can now look for Adobe here and expand that, and we can now see that there is Adobe Reader there, right there. And then if we expand that, there's DC, and inside of that we can, you know, whatever we need to make changes to, we can now go inside of its uh, remote registry settings and make 
any changes this, that we want. Once we make these changes, we can immediately ask them to try, ask the user to try to see if the issue was resolved. Okay, now let's look at another example here and another example of a ticket. Of course, finish up noting your ticket. I'm going to add internal note here first. I'm going to say issue resolved by configuration. And then depending on the environment that you work in, you may have to specify what you exactly did. In which case we did, uh, um, I don't know, reset config folder data. We're going to save it. And then we're going to mark it resolved, completed. And that's that. That ticket, oops. That ticket should be now gone out of our system, and we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket. All right, let's click on this ticket. This ticket is called, I am missing internet shortcuts folder. And then if you look in the descriptions, we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop. So in this case, there is a folder, or there was a folder on their desktop that you know, it was with deleted or just simply gone. Who knows? Maybe it was moved somewhere. That happens sometimes too. User would just accidentally, you know, for example, they would like, if you look at over here, they would drag it somewhere and it would go God knows where, you know. So typically you would say, hey, can you check your recycle bin? Go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there, you know, this and that. And yeah, definitely do all of that stuff. But if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of, you know, let's say you can't find it, and then, but you can find a copy of, you can ask them, hey, does anybody else have a copy of it? Maybe I can copy it over, because it's just internet shortcuts. We can certainly do that. Again, we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further. But we're going to role play, and then first thing, of course, we're going to do assign our ticket, assign a ticket to ourselves, and then we're going to reply to customer, hello, this is Irvin with... US, or you can say tech support, doesn't matter. You know, let's, let's do tech support. With tech support, or, you know, you can say help desk, you know, whatever your situation might be. Can you please provide your PC name so that I can restore your folder? Thanks, you. <laughs> Thanks, Irvin. Okay. So now user has been asked, or you can call them, you can talk to them. Again, we're going to go back to the user. And we, you know, we're going to get that PC name. And in this case, we're going to pretend that the same PC name is Kobuman. So we're going to keep doing that. The PC, let's do this, users. PC name is Kobelman1. All right. So, kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy-paste whatever it is that, that they need. So, let's pretend that... Uh, actually, let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called Inter... Net shortcuts, or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop. Okay, now let's go to his computer. Now we're at his computer, and we can say, Hey, can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back? And sure enough, there it is. But what if for some reason just using a PC name doesn't work? Some, there might be an issue with DNS, so just type in, in Kobelman1. And, you know, going inside of that, you know, shared drive or shared network connection, I should say, what if that doesn't work? Then we're going to have to get an IP address and see how that goes. So you can ask them too, hey, what is your IP address? And if they're like, uh, I don't know, uh, you can just ask them, okay, well, can you go command line this and that? But that's too complicated. So let's go back <laughs> and ask them to give us the IP address without any confusion but but let's see what else we can do you know 
before we do that, let's let's see what else we can do without actually confusing things and confusing the user. Because we don't we don't want to do that. We just want to find that out on our own. All right, let's go back to our own computer. All right, so let's say this this wasn't successful, and this didn't work, and for some reason we can't access it using you know Cobalman one, like so. Let's say that doesn't work. Let's say we're not able, we get an error, or it just doesn't, you know, it just says not found. Then we're going to find the, in, uh, their IP address and see if that works. So, of course, the first thing we can do is open our command line and do a quick ping. We're going to do a quick pingage. You're going to type in ping cobalman1. And here's our result. And guess what it is? It's an IP version 6. <laughs> it's an IP version 6. I, uh, if we do this, it's not going to work. Nothing's going to happen because this uh, systems are not set up to, you know, what I call backdooring into a computer. Some people may disagree, but this is what I call backdooring into a computer. You can just type in a usually, instead of just a, you know, PC name, you just type in the IP address and same deal. Let's see if we can get that C share. Yeah, it's not going to work. So now... We need to actually find what the IP version or translated or I guess translated in, in a way, but what we're actually looking for is an equivalent IP version 4 of this IP version 6 uh, IP address. So this is IP version 6 that we're looking at here, but we want to know what the standard is, what the standard IP version 4 is. So let's go back to the user's computer. You can say, hello, sir, can you please tell me what your IP address is? And you can just tell them, uh, can you please go to the search bar and then type in, I don't know, there are a couple of ways of getting to it. I'm just going to tell them to type in network. And then the first thing that comes up is network status. And I'm just going to tell them, uh, why don't you go ahead and click on change connection properties. And then if we scroll down, it gives you a bunch of different information. Now here's our IP version 6. Remember, this is our IP version 6 that we tried earlier. And it didn't work, but luckily we do have equivalent IP version 4, which is right here, and that is 192.168.1.102. All right, let's go back to our computer. All right, now let's try that. So we're going to backslash backslash 192, and you can see that I accessed it before. So 192.168.1.102, and then C dollar sign enter and there it is same thing uh, that we can do with uh, what you call it same thing we can do with the registry we can connect to using the IP address but let's go ahead and take care of this user real quick we're going to go and copy the internet shortcuts folder back into their desktop and now that we are back at users computer now we can see that internet shortcut has appeared now let's go ahead and do the registry edit thing, reg edit. And then we're going to use that connect network registry. Let me just minimize this stuff real quick here with this so it's out of the way. 192.168.1.102. Okay. And again, it takes just a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on. And now it's actually asking me for login ID. So I'm going to use, typically you can use your domain login, but since I'm not on a domain, I'm just going to use a local admin, uh, a local admin ID and password. And there it is. We're back at the same thing, except now we're accessing it using an IP address. So there you have it, guys. There are many, many different ways to deal with this. I, uh, these are just the typical ones that I go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever I'm working tickets, whenever, you know, I work as a business system analyst, but I do work on tickets, especially nowadays now that we're working from home, so they need more assistance. So this is what I do mostly nowadays, uh, simply because different times, you know, different times, guys. So now I'm just gonna finish our my ticket here you know, made a copy of internet folder to desktop. 
whatever you want to put in there as long as it's and detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete all right that's that guys i hope you like this video please share it with friends let me know if you have any questions just want to say hi i like the, making these videos and again i appreciate you guys liking the videos they are um th that what you do really really motivates me so much so much all right you guys stay safe take care and have a wonderful day bye bye hello my friends my name is Irvin, also known as kobo man in today's video we're going to talk about windows updates windows updates is one of those things that happens in the background people don't really think about it too much but when it comes to desktop support, it's incredibly important to know what they are. Especially if you're the guy that pushes all the Windows updates to all the computers in a business environment. What we're going to do in this video, we're going to talk about Windows updates, what they mean, how you can find what they're about before you actually push them to all the computers in your business. We want to make sure that we don't break all the computers before we do anything like that. So it's it's incredibly important to know this type of stuff. This is going to be one of those fun videos, not just for desktop support, but also for help desk. If you like to learn about IT, stick around as we are going to go through this and we're going to explain all things that we need to know about Windows updates and all the things that we can pretty much find out when it comes to Windows updates. All right, guys, if you get one second, please click the like button. It really means a lot to me. That way I know you guys like my stuff and I'll keep making more videos because of that. Thank you so much and let's get into it. All right, guys, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video. Windows updates. What do we need to know about Windows updates? Let's have a look on Windows updates, how they look like on your computer. I'm sure you already know this, but this is how you get to them. If you click on the start button and then click settings, and then if you click update and security and that's just one way of getting to windows updates so this is what you see nowadays this is, has changed a lot from windows 7 and it kind of looks like this now where it gives you a little bit more options right now i have paused windows updates and for the right reasons because i wanted to show you uh, how it looks like when it starts updating in case you're not aware most of you, I'm sure, have seen this happen on your computer, but a lot of times it just happens in the background and it just kind of does its thing. So here's an example of security intelligence update here for Microsoft Defender Antivirus. So what that was actually was an update for your built-in Windows antivirus software. And we, could, we saw the, what they called a KB, which is a knowledge base article about that. Here's another one here, and this one is a update for Windows 10 version 19.09 for X64 based system. And here's the KB number for it. So, so KB, we're going to copy this KB, the whole thing. So it's KB4497165. And then we're going to look it up on the internet to see exactly what this is. But we can tell kind of here what it might be kind of in just general so it's kind of vague right now all it tells us it's update from windows 10 version 1909 and down here you can see that it's a fairly large uh, or an important update that it requires a restart so there's a pop-up here that says restart and of course we have a you know big old restart button here so let's kind of dig into this version 1909 why does it say version 1909 well let's see what our windows version is so if you go to search button and just type in w-i-n-v-r v-e-r i'm sorry so if you hit enter it gives you the windows version so here it is it's our version 1909 microsoft version 1909 and again it's pretty vague and it just tells us that it is update for that specific os build so it's uh, Windows uh, version 1909. All right, so if you do me a favor and pause the video here and kind of check which version you have on your computer, and I'm really curious to which version you guys are using, you'd be surprised. I bet some of you have a version like 1809 or even something else. Let me know in the comments. I'm really curious about that. All right, so we have copied our KB. Now we're going to open up, let me see here, you know what, let's just open Edge, see if it works. I've actually seen Edge work sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just crashes out of the blue, but that's okay. We're going to just open it up, and we're going to go to Google Edge and search for our 
knowledge article is what I call them. Um, don't know exactly what they would call it. Hey, there is no connectivity, which is really, really surprising because I know I do have connectivity. Huh, cannot connect securely to this page. Oh, there it is. That was really bizarre, guys. I'm not sure. It could be my internet that is causing this issue. Although I did get a new modem just literally last week. Maybe it's my router. Maybe I need to change some uh, router setting. So here, here's our uh, KB here, and it's 4497165. Let's see if it refers to that. 4497165. We have double-checked that. And here is a knowledge article from Microsoft. Here it is. It's a Intel microcode updates. And now we can kind of dig into this and kind of see what this is about. Again, this is good to know for somebody who is working desktop support before you push these type of updates to all the computers in the environment or a business environment. So let's look at what kind of it's in what this is about from top to bottom. So you can see that it's an article and that there is a title of it. And it says here applies to Windows Server applies to Windows Server version 1903, all editions, Windows 10 uh, version 1903, all editions, Windows Server, and Windows version 1909, and then all editions, and then there is more. So basically, it's an update for all versions of Windows that are 1903 through 1909, okay? And in the summary, it says, it, you know, basically, it's a description of it, and it's an upgrade. It's an update to Intel Microcode for the following products of, of CPUs. Basically, is what they're talking about. So here are different types of CPUs. These are all different types of Intel CPUs, and that's what the updates is for. So it's we got Deverton, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge E, Valley View, Whiskey Lake U. And then there's these other ones. We got Haswells, Haswell desktops, a lot of server type of stuff. So in the nutshell, this article tells us a lot more information than what we see here in just a basic kind of title of Windows updates. And as desktop support, you want to look and read this whole thing the whole thing before you actually decide to push this update. And of course, you want to test it in a business type of in, in environment. Uh, basically, you want to test it on a computer that you have, like in a lab that you're testing before you, you know, push these. It's probably okay. You know, these are all just, you know, just a microcode update for, you know, CPUs. And They've, obviously, they've been tested by Microsoft before they decided to update. But this is the same type of thing you have to do as somebody who does desktop support as well. So that's a, a one important thing. This example just happened to be this microcode update, and it's a good example because you don't want to, like, you know, you don't want to brick all your system by installing a new microcode on your computer. But let's kind of look at an update history so we can look at another example of a Windows update. All right, so I'm going to close this. We're going to restart a little bit later, but I first want to show you this other. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt the video here, but I just want to pause it real quick and just kind of clarify that where I'm going right now is a place where Windows updates can be removed. The reason I'm going to this tab or this area is because it's easier to kind of talk about installed updates that are already on there. However, if you want to see the full history of updates on this computer, you can just kind of pay attention to this arrow that is pointing to that. So we wouldn't necessarily go anywhere else from this tab if you just want to see the updates that are on there. You know, some updates are not removable, but the page I'm going to are the ones that you can remove them. Uh, type of Windows update. So to see those, we actually have to go to Apps and Features. So I'm going to right click our little Start button here. We're going to click Apps and Features. And it's not going to be here. We're going to have to go to our other old school type of uh, add remove software or program that you probably are familiar from Windows 7 and older operating system. So right here, we're going to actually click on programs and features. This is going to take us to a place that gives us a lot more details of what it's installed. And I personally like it better because it's kind of a smaller font. It's more compact and you can see a lot more. 
So this is a typical place where you would see all the things that are installed on your computer, whether it's just some programs, some distributor packages, you know, everything that you've pretty much installed manually and things that have installed automatically. But that's not exactly what we are looking for here. We are looking for actual updates. And that is actually located right here, right above Turn On Windows Features On and Off. There's a button called View Installed Updates. So we're going to select that and check it out. Now I'm going to kind of move this around a little bit here so I can show you something very interesting. I'm going to squeeze this here. Oh, okay, that's good enough. So I wanted to show you, remember the uh, KB that we looked at first? It was KB4497165. Well, here it is. It's actually here on the bottom. And on the right side here, if you notice, there is no installed on date. So there is the installed on column. And there's no install on date because we still haven't rebooted here. We're still waiting for it to actually fully install. And once that's done, we're going to have an actual installed on date here. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is what this is the uh, order uh, that it's... Um, sorted out by default so once you open this the bottom one is always going to be the most current most current uh, windows update so we're going to start looking from the top and that's the first thing that in was installed and it was uh, on june 18 2018 and the first thing that got installed was kb2565063 which is just basically a microsoft visual c plus plus 2010 redistributable so what that is, it's just a package that you that is required to run a certain program. Some programs require this, and this is what that is. It's kind of self-explanatory. We can look it up just to confirm. So it's 2565063. Let's go back to our Google. I'm going to type in 2565063. Is that what it was? That's right. 256. 5063. 256. 5063. And here it is, the first update for Microsoft Windows. And it's very vague. We don't know what this is. So this is our good opportunity to figure out what that is. So it's KB4556799. Alright, let's see. 455. See. My short term memory. It's really early in the morning, so I can't <laughs> exactly sometimes six seven nine nine six seven nine nine. <laughs> I had my coffee, but my short memory is not that great. So let's see here again. Uh, March March twelfth. That's when it was created, and it's four five five six seven nine nine. We're going to click on that. I'm going to move it up here and see what that is. All right, so here's a, here it is. It's kind of the same thing. We can see here what it applies to again, and uh, you can certainly read that as well, and you can see the actual release date on it. My computer got it, let's see here, eight days later. Did I say March? I'm sorry. It was actually May that it installed on. <laughs> um, now, this one is actually also vague, which is kind of very disappointing. I wish we could get more information on this. But if we scroll down and we can see that there are highlights for this knowledge base article, and all it is, it, it just tells us that it's updates to improve security when using Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge, updates to improve security when using input devices, and updates to verify user password. So these are just regular updates to the basically kind of security settings that are kind of used in Windows operating system. And you can see how it goes on, improve security when using Microsoft Xbox, Windows, uh, improve security on Windows perform basic operation. So these are just regular things that they keep updating to kind of make sure that everything stays secure on your computer. And that's what this update is about. It's very vague. It's not a like critical update or anything like that. It's just something that they keep doing and doing to kind of improve things on the operating system. So here's a security update that I wanted to show you, and it's KB4552152. Uh, Let me see if I can remember that. 21552. Nope. I need more coffee, guys. 4552152. Two one five two. Okay, there it is. All right. So 
We're going to click on this one. There it is, 455-2152. And again, we can go through this and verify what it is. And this update makes a call the impermis to service stack, which is the components that installs Windows updates. So this is an update to Windows update. <laughs> okay, all right, sure. And it's labeled a security update. All right, I mean, I'm not sure about these labelings that they're using at this point, but the point is of this whole video is that you want to look up as much information and find out as much information about any Windows updates before you push them to mass computers and definitely want to test them out. <laughs> There's not much we can do when it comes to kind of digging really deep into this and looking at the code and this and that. And when it comes down to it, it's up to, it's up to uh, Microsoft to share this information. And it, again, this is kind of disappointing, but it is very, very vague, very vague. Um, when you do desktop support, you will have control of which updates are installed at which times and you know this and that, which is a great thing. Otherwise, I'm not sure how, how else you could deal with this. Now, when it comes to these type of updates, Microsoft is 100% in control. And, and when it comes to what they are actually working on and what they're fixing, and you, as somebody who does desktop support, would just have to make sure that they're safe. And you would have to do some testing before you actually deploy them. And that can take sometimes up to a month or even more, depending what the update is. But you definitely want to figure out as much as possible what it's about and do extensive testing when it comes to some of this stuff. And yes, I know most of these things you can just literally you know, just install and test it. If it's a minor update or it's just update, you know, this and that, you still don't want to, like, install it and say, hey, it works fine on this computer. No, you want to kind of hang in there for at least a week, I want to say, with some computers being used, actively used to see if everything is okay, just to make sure that that is cool. All right, guys, I want to wrap this video up especially because I hear uh, construction work right now. I don't know if you guys can hear that. There's a jackhammer outside right now. Uh, they're working on the road here in front of my house. So I'm going to wrap this up. And I hope you like this type of content. I will definitely have more, and I'll have more packages, kind of more crash courses. I see that more, more and a lot of people like this type of stuff. And I thank you so much for watching. Tell your friends about me if they like IT stuff, and I'll talk to you next time. Take care now. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about VPN, Virtual Private Network. This video is really good for people trying to get into help desk or desktop support. First video or first part of this video is going to be a presentation on VPN. It's going to explain what VPN is, how it functions, why we use it, and this and that. The second video is going to be a VPN troubleshooting example on how to troubleshoot VPN, things to look out for. And the third part of the video is kind of a things to kind of watch out for when it comes to dealing with a VPN, especially when it comes to resetting passwords for users while they're on VPN connection. This is a really good and important video to learn, and I hope you find it very easy to follow. That being said, please take one second to click like on this button. It really means a lot to me when I when you guys do that. It really it's just kind of a, a excellent and wonderful way that makes me happy that you guys do for me. I really appreciate it as always. Thank you so much. So what is VPN? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. And the way that usually works is, let's say you start working for some business, for some company, and they decide that they want you to work from home occasionally, right? So what they do is they give you a laptop. They give you a laptop or maybe even a desktop, but typically it's just a laptop. They give you a computer and they say, okay, take this home and then VPN from home so that way you can work for us. What does that mean? Well, they want you to connect from home to the company's network so you have access to all the resources that you normally do so that you can work from home, right? That's what the VPN is in the nutshell. So where can you VPN from? You can VPN from home, you can VPN from coffee shop, a restaurant, a store, 
um, you know, anywhere there is internet access, right? So this is how it kind of works. You create a virtual private connection from any other location that has access to the internet, which allows you to connect to the company's network. And I've, I will explain what how this works. Your company has a centralized computer that deals specifically for VPN. There are servers that uh, there are act as a proxy, if you will, that allows you to have access to all of the other uh, computers on that same network, on your work network, right? So you have a, a server that's a VPN server that you connect to, and this allows you to have access to the company's network, right? VPN is encrypted and it's safe. It's fully encrypted and it's safe. This is where uh, authentication comes in um, in a couple of different uh, forms, right? Um, the first thing that we need to do and have is software, right? VPN uses software. You basically open up this software that's going to be installed on your computer. You open it up, and this software will typically ask you for authentication, meaning login and password. However, there is a little bit more to it, right? You come to this screen and it says username and password and you know you have your normal username password that you use for your normal computer for for your you know for your computer that you go to work you know you go to work you you know you log in with your login and password and that's fine however vpn is different it's going to have a little bit more to it um a lot of times and i hope most of the time there's a um a, some form of token authentication involved, whether it's hard token or soft token. So what I mean by that is it's a generated, it's a randomly generated number that you use in combination with your password, right? You have your username that's most likely not going to change, it's your regular username. However, you'll have a password and combination of, of the numbers that come from the token. So imagine a hard token is basically something that's kind of small, sort of like a thumb drive size, and has a randomly generated number on it that changes typically every 60 seconds. You can have the soft token that basically does the same thing. You open it up on your computer and it just displays a bunch of random numbers that change every 60 seconds. So you type in your username, your password, and the randomly generated number, and then you will log in. As a result, when you're authentica authenticated, now you have full VPN connection, which is encrypted. The company's network says, oh, okay, you're fine. Now you have full access to the network resources at the company that you work for. So it's the same as if you were sitting at the company's office, at your office, right? It's the same thing. You have full access to your work files, your emails, and everything else that's available to you at your office, right? That's the whole point of VPN. You have full access while you're at home when you create a VPN connection to all the resources at work. As somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company, you'll have people who work remotely. And nowadays we have a lot of people working from home. So in order for them to actually be able to work, now they have to connect to the company's network but now they can't work because they're not on the company's network they're not physically there at the office so they have to use vpn software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company this is why they use vpn software to do so now what i have up right now is just a home user vpn that anybody can use not to be confused with a business VPN. This is the reason I have it up. This is going to be totally different. This home one that you can go to google.com and download free VPN, all it does is just hides your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country. That's all it does. It's completely different from business VPN in the sense of access. To, to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company, all right? So this is a sample of regular free VPN that regular people use, not workers.
So let me show you. Here's the list of servers that they pick. So if they, for example, run this and they, for example, click Brazil, suddenly now they're going to look like they're connected to the internet from Brazil. So they're basically trying to hide their location. This is not the same thing as a business VPN. All right, that being said, let's look at a business VPN, how it kind of looks like. When it comes to business VPN, you typically get something similar to this. You launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this. And it asks you for your username, your password, and a second password. So what is this second password? We know this is pretty straightforward. The username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login ID. It's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office. It's going to be the exact same thing most of the time. It's going to be the exact same thing as what they use at the office. Their username is going to be the exact same thing. I'm sorry for repeating that. I just want to make sure that you know this. And the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer. Second password, however, is different. This is usually an RSA token. So what is RSA token? RSA token is a one-time password that is always randomized. I think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password, and then it allows you to log in. You may have seen this with some websites. Some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts. It's very similar to that. So let's concentrate on this second password part of it first. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an old school way of getting that, that one-time password. It's a uh, token that is gen randomly generated. So basically what happens is you press a button, for example, like here or there, and it generates a random number that you use as the second password. A lot of times these are either hardware tokens. This is what they are. These are hardware tokens, but there are also software tokens. Let me just kind of scroll down to show you that. You can get a software token that kind of looks like this. Here it is, this one here, where it says VPN token. This is something that's installed on their computer as well. So they'll have an icon on their computer with the VPN software. So the VPN software is going to be separate, and now, but they have to launch this VPN token to get this random code to use as part of their login, login as the second password. It might be the way they put in the password, the second password for the VPN token might be slightly different varying from VPN software to another, but in the nutshell, they're going to need that VPN token or RSA token, if you will, in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the VPN or the network that they're trying to connect to. You can also have a mobile version of that. So you can have a mobile phone. I don't know if I have an example of that here, but you can install an app on your some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token so that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through vpn when it comes to customer connecting to the VPN. so this is the main thing that you see when it comes to vpn uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk they're most of the time they're going to say i can't connect to the vpn the main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting. That's the main thing. Now let's move on to other things. Let's look at a VPN servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from. Let me see here from regular VPNs. This is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody, for example, working in the United States. When they will launch their VPN software, they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this. And they're all going to be in US. And all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company. So this is all the same network. They're all on the same network. They're just different location. This is very normal when they will launch their VPN software. They will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these. The reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down. It happens. Sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect, for example, to the same one. Let's look at the, let's look at the capacities here, for example. 
you can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one. So people automatically they tend to click on the very first server available. And you can see that in this example, there's 13% capacity already, meaning that it has the most, well, this one has a lot too, 15%, but people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, VPN server for their company. Either way, if they're having trouble suddenly connecting to, for example, Los Angeles here, just ask them to connect to Miami, New York, San Jose, or Seattle. So that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues. Now, the other thing uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there. So you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software to reinstall VPN software for the user. And a lot of times what happens is a company will set up a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN. So, for example, what happens is they would get a link, they would type in that link, whatever that may be, get my VPN software. Dot com. For example, this is not, I don't even know if this is a real website or not, but this is kind of what would happen. They would get a link and keep in mind, they're, they're still there. At this time, they're not connected. Their problem is they cannot connect the VPN and they don't have software either. So they, what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to. And once they go to that link, they can download the software and install it. So you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges this and that that's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software but keep that in mind if they don't have it there has to be a way to get that VPN software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the VPN you, you see what I'm saying there has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation so that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards um, so they can just get back to work and start working. All right, guys, I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support. Let me know if you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN. I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN. Let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed. I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios, different options. But keep in mind, there are many, many different ways of initiating VPN. Companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software, you know, different prerequisites, meaning they may have a different uh, security so some companies, as far as I know, may not even require a second password or RSA token, which is kind of silly. But you do see that with smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and, you know, maintenance, do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff. So it's going to be it's going to vary a little bit. But in general, what I've explained to you is exactly the main things. They're, they're exactly the, the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, you can literally go, for example, to an interview for a help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the Internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections, but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet while VPN for a business allows you connect, allows you to connect to the company's network so that way you have access to all of those resources so that way you can work, so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto vpn they can typically log into their computer but they can't get on their vpn because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all and they can't just do control alt delete 
this is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password they can't do that because they're not on vpn yet they are disconnected at this time so the only thing they can do as they typically do is just call help desk and ask for a password reset but we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first let's have a look how i handle this call and I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password, so they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. Well, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need to, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of a overview of what we've gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they're not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or force to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. 
All right, thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the users folder and select find. In here, you can type in the name of the user and he said Irvin underscore C-A-N. So it's going to click find now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double-click it and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in, so the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked, in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply or OK, and that will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that, you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin C-A-N, so we can find this user here, since we found it already, we don't have to dig through the Active Directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password, is that now, since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user. You can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then, again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. All right, guys. I hope you find this video useful. Please share it with your friends. Let them know about me and ask them what they think. Are these videos useful to you. I think they are. I appreciate you watching. Have a good day and don't forget to ask me any questions that you may have in the comments below. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about three different videos, three different topics for desktop support, and if you're also learning help desk. Very useful stuff. The first one is about ping command, how to use ping command and how to resolve issues using it. Second one is about trace route. Ever heard about trace RT command? Well, I'm going to talk about it and we're going to learn about it. Very cool and interesting stuff. Last thing we're going to talk about is reliability monitor. A lot of people don't know about it, but reliability monitor is kind of like software, but it's actually built into Windows. I know it's actually software, but it's part of Windows. And uh, we're going to learn about it because it's kind of cool and not many people know about it. And it can help you resolve weird computer issues that are kind of apparent and easy to actually visualize using Reliability Monitor.
It really tells you what's going on. All right, guys, let's check it out. But before we do that, please take one second to like this video. It really makes a big difference to me and my channel. It really helps me grow and whatnot. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing that. So if you're doing tech support or desktop, desktop support or what have you, chances are you'll be using pin command. So what is pin command and its use? I'm going to talk about the first part of it and explain the whole thing. But my written answer here is, Generally, the ping command is used to determine whether your computer has access to external resources or the internet. So anything that is considered external resources is anything that's outside of the connection of your computer. So let's say you're using a desktop PC at work or a laptop, and then you're trying to access an external resource like a shared drive or a server or a website, whether it's internal or external, and you are you can't connect to it or there's a you know issue with latency or lag of some sort, it's running slow, that's how ping command would be used. And all these things are considered as external resources. So something that your computer connects to over the network. Okay? Now through command prompt, CMD you can type in, for example, ping www.microsoft.com. And this is an example of a ping command. So let's go ahead and open up CMD. I'm going to top, open up command line, command prompt, or whatever you call it. I keep saying command prompt, command line. I use Linux too, so sometimes I forget which one is which. Anyways, we're going to use this example that we have here, and it's ping www.microsoft.com. So let's see what happens when a normal working website is up and running and see the result from it. Did I misspell that? Of course I did. Microsoft.com. I'm trying to multitask here, so <laughs> you will forgive me. <laughs> okay, so one of the first things that comes up that you will notice here is a number, which is an IP address, which is uh, controlled by the DNS, and the DNS, basically what it does is takes a domain name, in this case, Microsoft.com, and translates it into a, an IP address, which is the location of this website on a server. So the server for Microsoft.com is located at 23.45.133.21. So that's the IP address for the server, uh, of the server for, the, for Microsoft.com. Okay, so now these are real results of the ping command for a normal running website that is up and running and there are no problems. So what happens is ping command sends four packets of data. So you can see here that it sent four packets. They are size of 32 bytes. And then it waits for a response and how long it takes to respond, which is shown here in milliseconds. So this is the first attempt from uh, off the ping to this IP address. And we can see that the response time here, that it took 14 milliseconds to respond. And then the ping command does it again, which is the second time. And this time it replied in 15 milliseconds. And then the third time, also 15 milliseconds. And then fourth time, also 15 milliseconds. Hence, four packets sent, right? Very, very easy to understand. But of course, for it to actually respond, for actually to have a response of any sort, it has to send back four packets as well. So you can see here that the server at 23.45.133.21 also sent back four packets which were received at the same size. And then we can see that lost zero, that means it was successful. That means none of the packets failed that all the four pings were successful. That's a, an example of successful ping command. We know everything is okay with this website. So let's go find a website that doesn't work. So I went to this website and this website kind of tells you of some of the you know, big websites that are down. So let's kind of pick a random one here. Let's pick Trivago.com here. That's a safe website. We're going to type in ping Trivago. Well, let's do www.trivago.com. Now, 
if this website is down, like it says it is, we're going to get some negative results, which would be a good example of use, of, of how you use a ping command and how to help you troubleshoot the issues. So, so far, we can see that it's timing out. What does that mean? That the first packet was sent and it didn't connect. It waited a certain amount of time, didn't connect to the server, or the server didn't reply, I should say, and then it timed out. And then the second time as well, I'm sorry, first time, second time, and we're waiting for the third one. Third one timed out. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go all full screen here. Let me kind of move some of this stuff out of the way so it's easier to see. And we can see that all four packets sent timed out. That means that the server just, we you know, the, the ping, you know, waited waited you know we waited and the server didn't respond time out there's only a certain amount of time ping command will wait for a response and that's what happened and we can again see here that four packets are sent so and then zero received and in this example trivago.com is located at this ip address that's the server that's the web server for the trivago.com and now we can see that we sent four we waited we waited nothing happened we received zero because it's down and then we lost four that means we sent four and they never came back which gives us 100 percent loss of packets so how does this help us well for for one thing we know the website is down or you know a server that you're trying to access at your job is down Right, we can, you know, web server or some some other network component, some other network resources. You know, if you have the name for it or the IP address, you can just ping the IP address. If you wanted to, you can just type in ping, you know, IP address, three five one seven nine dot zero zero two dot two zero zero. And here we go again. We're pinging Trivago's server again, except we're just directly bypassing the domain name. Now we're bypassing the DN. Well, we're not necessarily bypassing, the, but we're bypassing the uh, domain name. We're going directly to pinging the server itself. And again, it's timing out, which is another indicator that the website is down. So, going back to the uh, my question of how does this help us aside from knowing that the website is down? So, if it's an external website. What we would have to do is find the web uh, webmaster for it or a person who has access to the server. Same thing goes for if it's ex internal website. So let's say your business the, or the business that you work for has some kind of internal website that everybody goes to, everybody uses it, you know, this and that. And, you know, you don't have necessarily access to it. You would find that webmaster and contact them. So how would you go about that? Well, if you know who the owner of Trivago.com is, you would contact them directly, obviously. But if you don't know who the owner is, based off the, the name of the Trivago.com, based off the domain name, you can see who the owner is of this IP address. And this is something that uh, this is something that your company would provide this to you if you're doing tech support. So you would basically have a tool that lets you tool or you know some kind of notes or something i don't know if this is all depends on this varies from place to place you know but for example at my main job i know i will know who owns this ip address so not only can i look up to see who owns trivago.com for example i can also look up who owns this ip address and then i would contact that guy who is the owner of this ip address or a guy or a gal or whatever, um, I, I would contact them and say, hey, this website is down. But the only time I would do that is if I don't have direct access to this. So let's say it, this is a server that I have, you know, that I'm running and everybody in the business here is using it as just a storage location. You know, let's say this is just a web server that hosts files for everybody in my building that I support. Well, I would simply just try this, you know, if I don't have physical access to it, I would open up remote desktop connection, type in 8.35.179.200, see if I can connect to it. 
you know, and it's going to fail because obviously I don't have access to it. And, you know, that's okay. But if I have physical access to it and I know where it's located in the data center or in the server room or whatever it is, chances are this, you know, this server might be just turned off or, you know, there might be something else bad with it. But at least I will know that there is something wrong going on by using the ping command and that will get me to either me fixing it or finding who can fix it. And that's how you would use ping command in a business environment. Either way, uh, for this, we're going to need a command line, which we're going to open up right now. So in order to use traceroute, we're basically going to use the example from the article. It's simply typed in trace RT, <coughs> pardon me, trace RT, followed by the name of the website you're trying to reach. This doesn't have to be a website. It could be a server of some sort or a switch, or I should say just an IP address of uh, a network uh, component or a location. So, and that gets me into why would you want to use trace RT before I even hit enter here and then a bunch of stuff comes up. I want you to understand why you would want to use it. So let's say at your work, at your office. For some reason, you cannot reach CosmicNova.com. However, from your phone, which is, by the way, on a network, on a different network entirely, you can reach Cosmic Novo just fine. Also, another example is an application that uses um, network connection to work. For example, an application that has to reach to a database that could be located in totally different state, country, this and that. It could be at the end of the world. It could be that it's not working. That's another reason you would want to use Traceroute. Or simply there is a server somewhere we can't reach, whether it's used for storage or this and that. We would want to use Traceroute to figure out why you can't reach it from your office network, but you can reach it from any other network. So what it does in the nutshell, Traceroute it traces all the routes taken on the network to reach CosmicNovo.com in this example. So it's going to map it out for me. <clears throat> so think about it this way. Let's say you have a date or you are going somewhere that you've never been before. You open up your phone, you go to Google or Apple or whatever it is that you're using, you type in in your navigation the address that you want to visit. And it gives you all these routes that it takes. You know, it says go straight, go left, go right, this and that. The trace route kind of does the same thing in a sense. However, trace route, it will tell you whether there are certain roads or routes that you cannot take or that they're broken or non-existent. So that's a very simple explanation of what trace route does. It tells you whether a certain turn is broken or non-existent, hence the name Traceroute. I hope that's an easy one to understand there. So we're going to see an example of this. As soon as I hit enter here, we're going to see what happens and I'm going to explain uh, all the steps that it's going through. All right, hitting enter. With Traceroute executed, this is typically what happens. It takes maximum of 30 hops as in 30 roads or 30 paths, if you will, in order to reach the final destination, which is this IP address for this website. And this may take a while. This is why I have a finished trace route of all the routes taken for that website. And I will show you what that is right now. So let's have a look at some of the things that kind of stand out. The first thing, the first hop that shows up is basically pinging my IP address of the local computer. So the computer I'm using right now, local um, IP address for that is 192.168.1.1. So that's a typical local IP address. Second hop is basically trying to ping my IP address, external IP address for the internet. So my internet provider, which is Charter, is actually blocking that information for security reasons. It automatically blocks it 
there's nothing I can do about it, but it's perfectly normal to see a second hop fail timeout like this. And then you can see that hops three through eight are all from my internet provider, charter.com. Is Charter is my internet provider. And you can see all these, if you will, switches that it takes in order to access the internet that goes the outside of the Charter's network. So it goes through all of these and it seems everything seems fine, so that's perfectly fine. And then finally it reaches the internet and then it has to go through this switch here. And again, it looks normal, this route is normal. And then it goes to the number 10. Again, it's normal. Then we look at 11 and we can see that there's increased millisecond response not necessarily too bad because we're not talking like 80 milliseconds, 100 plus or something like that. However, something does stand out here and that there is a third, on, on the third response or third attempt ping of it is there is no response whatsoever, a timed out. So if we are having issues connecting to the final destination, potentially we could look at the switches or servers that are located at these two IP addresses. So the first one is 7214.232, um, I'm sorry, dot seven zero, and this other one that starts with 172. So because we see uh, no response here at all for the third uh, ping there, we can kind of possibly assume that there might be some kind of a latency issue with these two switches or nodes, if you will, or they could be server or whatever it is that they are we can look at that because it could be a server somewhere and the reason I say server is in a sense depending on which type of thing are we troubleshooting are we troubleshooting a website are we troubleshooting application connection this and that so it could be a you know part of the final destination of like for example application that maybe uses some kind of database that is located at this server or whatnot or server itself could be the firewall we don't know but we need to know kind of why, what's causing this, you know, delay or lack of response whatsoever, if there is a problem, right? But typically that's associated with higher millisecond response time. So in our case, this is probably just normal. And chances are that these servers here just have a limit of how many times you can ping it. So we're going to move on from that. And then it goes through a bunch of different nodes here, which could mean that it's just blocking. This is very typical that these nodes are literally just blocking these type of um, connection requests, which is fine. We can, this is pretty normal, but every time you see a gap in between where it fails somewhere, this is something we would have to be concerned about. And we'll potentially look at that here in a moment, but this is an example of a good trace route response. And then it finally reaches uh, the uh, destination of 130.211.160.1 uh, which is where cosmicnovo.com is located as you can see here. So it took all the routes and it took it 23 routes to get to the final destination and we know that everything is okay here. All right, so I found a website that's supposed to be down, a safe website. And let's see, do I have that going here? Yep, I had it uh, tested. It's Anthem.com, which is basically insurance provider, health insurance provider. And I saw that it's down. Let me just double check here one more time. I'm going to ping it one more time to, double sh to, to make sure that it's down. And then we're going to do a trace route on it to see if we can figure out what's uh, causing the problem. Chances are it's the web server itself, but it could be something in between too. So I'm going to do a trace out on that as well. And then I'm going to, and you can see that it failed. You know, sent for, received zero, it's timing out, definitely down. So we're going to do a trace route, RT, anthem.com and see what kind of response we can get. Again, this may take a while, which I will just fast forward to the results so we can see what's going on with that. So as we are looking at the results of Anthem.com, you can see that 
they are similar to what we had earlier in the sense that it's taking same routes initially. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about. See, this is the first one, and we can tell that it takes, you know, hits my LAN, and then it goes through all of these charter uh, switches, if you will. And if we go back here, we can see that the, they are the same switches, and it takes that same route. However, after it hits those, it decides to go another way, which was indicated, which was dictated by a this switch. This switch says, okay, well, now, you know, you're done with the charter network. Now you have to go through this something else. So let's look at the previous one. I'm sorry. Let's look at the previous one here. And did we take the same 15166? So in our case, after the 166, Charter sent us to this other one, which ends with 1, 2, which, by the way, is probably next to it. So there is a switch probably next to it in the same data center. You can see how it's only off by three IP addresses. Anyways, it decided, in this case, for the Anthem.com, which is this top one, it decided to bypass the next switch, which typically would have been this one, to route to CosmicNova.com. Um, well, it, well, it had to take another one here. So instead of going to any of these other ones, you can see that this one just said, okay, well, this is going somewhere else. And it takes a different route, and it goes to this other, probably, internet provider of some sort, which I'm assuming is related to AT&T. And it doesn't say that here, but the reason I know is if you look at these 7 through... 10. You can see that the switches' names are STL, which is, stands for St. Louis, ORD probably stands for Orlando, Florida, and uh, you can see that they're called atlas.cogento.com, and you can see the IP address that are connected to there. However, if you look at number 10, you can see that it says ATT here, so which is AT&T, probably Orlando, so it goes through Florida somewhere, and then it continues with switches that are located or that are that belong to AT&T and then routes it further. And you can see that it hits another three gateways, uh, most likely um, in uh, on, on an AT&T server before it reaches its final destination. This is still taking forever, so once it's finished, I'll, I'll show you uh, what the end result is for Anthem.com. However, I want to talk about a point of failure that may occur that may show up in trace route command. And here's a really good example. We can look at these AT&T switches here. So 11 through 13. Trace route is can tell you immediately whether something failed in in the path that it's taking. So it's we can imagine that in this example that number 12 here timed out. So let's pretend this one timed out, literally timed out, and we need to figure out where is it at, Who, wh what's wrong with this. Chances are if it timed out that either it's blocking the uh, this type of uh, information from being sent back, which happens with my IP address here, uh, but however, if it's just kind of in the middle here, and we know kind of just kind of by intuition that it's supposed to take another route because it goes to the third one here but for some reason just one this one in the middle times out that's a clear indicator of a switch that is or the switch that is just bad so how do we find out you know if it's bad or not well we would have to reach out to this guy or this company and ask them okay well we need to get somebody from AT&T on the call or call them or contact them and say, hey, there's a problem here. And they'll be like, okay, well, let's send me the results of Traceroute from your location. And they send it, you send it to them, and then suddenly they're like, oh, the number 12 failed, but we still know it's kind of on their network because it keeps going to their network. You see what I'm saying? And it goes to at and T 
healthy, we know all three of these hops are going to be AT&T, but the middle one fails. That means it's still on their network, and the problem is on their network, and they need to look at this. And they would know. It would, I know it would say timed out here, but they would know what the next one would be or should be, or whether there is a break of some sort that prevents everybody, and that one switch is causing the problem. So they would look at this and they say, okay, well, we know it's on this network. Let's scour our network and look for this broken switch. And that's the point of traceroute. Of course, there could be other examples of that, and that is, let's say this one doesn't time out, but there is a huge, huge latency issue here. That would also indicate, that would also be indicated by traceroute that there is a problem. So let's say their response time is like 100 milliseconds or even 80 milliseconds. This caused connection timeouts on the application and or a user end as well. So let's say there's a huge latency here. There's another reason why they would want to look at that switch or server and kind of see what's going on. The reason I say server is because it could be the final destination. We don't know. But in our case, we know it's not. It's just the switch that it's taking. And then with the trace route information, we can send forward this information to them and say, okay, well, you know, this is probably what's going on. Now, this thing is going to time out, and I'm going to kind of tell it to skip by hitting enter the attempt. For some reason, it gets stuck like this, waiting to get a re uh, response from the switch. And then I'm going to fast forward this to the end result. So as the final result of the trace route is coming up, we can see that the... Uh, Anthem.com is just simply down. This is what it tells us. The normal response from the trace route when everything's okay is indicated in my other window here. And you can see that the final hop gives us the final destination address. In our case of Anthem.com, it doesn't. It never reaches it. And this is clear indication that there's something wrong at the web server level. So the webmaster for anthem.com needs to look at it and resolve the issue at the server level. So but you know when we know that the website is down for everybody, this is not necessarily the reason we would use traceroute.com or traceroute command for we would simply just use ping command to see if it's up or down. But if there is an issue of latency, if there is an issue of website or an application working for some people, but not others that are on a different network, that's when we would use the trace route. So it's for troubleshooting connection issues that are specific to a network. You know, meaning that just because I can reach it doesn't mean that some other people can as well. So this is how you would use trace route to figure out where is the breaking point on their end and why can't they reach or why can't I reach a certain web server, application server, or what not. And in today's video, we're going to talk about Reliability Monitor. It's one of those tools that comes with Windows 10 that people don't really talk about or mention, but it's actually a really cool monitor that kind of uh, filters everything out for you when it comes to system issues or system events. So it's similar to Event Viewer, except it's a little bit easier to follow, a little bit easier to navigate through. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. So let's go ahead and pull up Reliability Monitor. You can simply search for it and just type in Reliability Monitor and what comes up is View Reliability History. Alternative way to get into it is through Control Panel. If you go to Control Panel, select Security Maintenance here and then Expand Maintenance. And then from here, we need to click on View Reliability History. We're going to click on that. And now it expands our Reliability Monitor once more. So what is, again, Reliability Monitor? You can think of Reliability Monitor, for example, as a highly filtered version of Event Viewer. So instead of giving you all the details for that one day on your computer, um, it gives you kind of filtered version of it that's much easier to follow. And it kind of mostly points out 
um, software updates and critical issues that may uh, happen on your computer. It lists successful and failed software and driver installations as well crashes, apps, and programs that stopped responding and other errors, of course, on a time-based scale. So what does that mean? That means it shows you events for every viewer, every day, I'm sorry, just like event viewer, except it's a lot more sp simplified and it gives you this kind of a graph with dates aligned as this. You can see the only main thing that keep in mind is that reliability monitor, monitor only goes back as far as one month. So it only gives you one month of uh, event viewing when it comes to issues on your computer, which could be good enough to kind of troubleshoot all the computer issues that are happening. So you don't necessarily need to go back over a month ago to figure out what is going on right now with your computer. On top of that, uh, reliability monitor, it can often provide important clues about the cause of sudden changes in system behavior as well. And that can be determined by the events that happened. And it can also kind of give you an idea why, for example, my computer is crashing. What happened with the application? Why did it stop? You know, this and that. So again, it's an event viewer in a sense, except it's a lot more user friendly, if you will, or IT support friendly. So with a reliability monitor, let's go ahead and look at an example. And here's a good one. It says here that on October 5th, 2019, something happened. So if we just click on this bar, we can see that it gives you the details as well. But it also points out a critical event with this circle with a, a red circle with the X in it. And then we have the uh, warning one, a war exclamation mark here, which is in yellow. And then we just we have regular event here, which is in blue. So let's look at the first critical event. And it says Windows was not properly shut down. And you can see how it's easily laid out for you. And it gives you the date here. And it says, you know, it's October 5th at 8 a.m. And then, of course, on the right-hand side of it, you can click on view technical details, which will give you more information on it if you select that. So you can imagine, you know, your let's say your computer is unstable and says, you know, your computer is shutting down just randomly. Windows was not properly shut down. So what does that mean? It means that either somebody pulled the plug, the power went out, or something caused the crash. So let's go ahead and click on view technical details and expands it, and it gives you little bit more information but as far as the computer knows it just it just knows that windows was not properly shut down so this could mean literally that it lost power and then it also in description it says the previous system shut down on uh, let, let's see what is this six days ago was unexpected so it gives you an idea that hey this happened also five days ago so that can give you a clue of what might be happening. So you can either ask the user, hey, do you remember it shutting down before? Or you can simply confirm what the user is saying, hey, this happened before. And then you look and look at it, you, you can say, hey, did this happen about five days ago? And then you can see that there's a pattern going on here. So very similar to Event Viewer. And of course, I have a video on Event Viewer. If you want to check that out, I'll toss a link on the right hand side here. So let's look at the uh, exclamation uh, one that it's just a warning and it says here Google update helper and it says unsuccessful application reconfiguration and it happened at on the same day at 8.08 um, a.m. So let's say somebody's complaining about Google Chrome for example because Google Chrome is the only product I have on this computer and of course it's going to have a Google update helper and then I can see well all right well something's going on here. And then obviously it says here unsuccessful application reconfiguration. So I'm going to click on view technical details and it's going to give me a little bit more of the information. And again, it kind of uh, repeats what it said earlier here and, and on the top. And then in the description, it says Windows installer uh, reconfigured the product and it gives you the product name and that is Google Update Helper and it gives you product version product language manufacturer, Google LLC. And then it gives you reconfiguration success or error status. So at this point, we don't know what happened because if it says unsuccessful uh, application reconfiguration, as far as we know, it could be just permission issues. But 
at least we have an error status which is the error code 1638 so we can simply google this and find out on the internet what the what this error actually means but again it could be just simple permissions issue you know and if user is complaining about google not working properly google chrome or this and that this kind of gives you a clue at least a starting point so let's just look at some of the uh, uh, blue um, events that happened and informational events are down here and then again you can see there is uh, another Google update health uh, helper and then it says here successful application reconfiguration and it happened kind of exact same time uh, where the where it unsuccessfully did it so that means most likely that it did get its uh, permissions that it needed to do so and then it actually did it so we can kind of confirm here that that well that was successful and we can see that the error status is zero so right away we can see well that's not the problem just because it failed here it actually succeeded below here so we're done with the google issue here and then of course we just have a regular event and it says here cumulative update for uh, .NET framework for Windows 10 and it says successful Windows update. So generally speaking, informational events are just that. It gives you information that something usually just happened normally and that is also good to know so that way we can kind of uh, exclude those things as possible problems for this PC. So with this tool, we can just keep going and scrolling through all the events. You can see some of them are just blank. There is basically just means there's no issues on those days. And then we got, again, just the, you know, the blue event that happened and it's just normal. But well, the ones we want to kind of concentrate on here are the ones that are critical events. For example, this setup host.exe stopped responding on October 13th at 8 53 a.m. and then we can just keep going and kind of look at those issues and what see what happened and it kind of gives you a really good starting point when it comes to figuring out what is wrong with all of these computer issues that may be happening and sure I can go through all this stuff together with you and let's just go ahead and take a quick look this one looks a little bit different because it's a setup host.exe and it says again stop responding at 8:53 a.m. and it gives you quite a bit more detail and this is going to vary from program to program of course but again it gives you starting place to help you troubleshoot what the issue is and for example this one says stopped interacting with windows and it was closed to see uh, more information about the problem um, check the problem history in the security maintenance control panel so it gives you another starting point here it also gives you application path in some cases and you can see where this program is located and this is a windows component and then let's look at the same thing similar and it says uh, for this uh, yellow exclamation mark right underneath that it says notepad plus 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 unsuccessful application installation and uh, we can see more details of this one as well again this one happened on 8 51 a.m and it says windows install install the product blah 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 and then installation success or error status so this is most likely a failed installation and then we can look up again what the error is to clarify that information. In the event viewer, if you find that confusing, because I can see how event viewer could be uh, harder to navigate through, especially for new people to tech support. So, hey, if you get an issue from a user or a report, a user reports an issue, it says, hey, my computer is unstable. I don't know what's going on. Reliability monitor monitor is a good place to start to give you a quick look to see what's going on with that PC. All right, I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends. If you have any questions, please let me know. Leave any likes and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, welcome my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobu Man. Today's video is all about the virtual machines. I'm going to explain what the virtual machines are, how they function, how they're set up, and how you can install them to play around with different operating systems for yourself. 
In this case, we're going to use Microsoft's Hyper-V software that comes with Windows Operating System. It doesn't come installed by default, but you can install it as part of Microsoft Operating System. And I will show you how to do that. It's pretty simple. However, I believe it only comes with Microsoft Windows 10 Professional and or Enterprise. I don't think it comes with Home, but it will show you how to install it nonetheless. It's pretty simple, but it's also really fun, especially if you want to experiment with different operating system and like to learn about them. Really cool stuff. All right, guys, if you got one second, please click the like button. It only takes one second, and it really makes a big difference for me, especially if you appreciate this type of content. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, first thing first, here is our computer that we're remoted in that we're going to use for our virtual machines. And uh, we got to install Hyper-V because in this video, we're going to talk about Hyper-V. We're going to uh, install this program, which will allow us to run these virtual machines so that way we can play around with them. The way you install Hyper-V in Windows operating system is if you go to your apps and features, and then you go here into programs and features. This is the old school of add, remove, or uninstall programs that you will uh, normally see in like older operating systems like Windows 7. And what we are looking for is actually turn Windows features on or off. Remember how I said it's actually part of Windows operating system? This is exactly what I meant. So it's very simple. From here on, you have to make sure that Hyper-V right here is selected like so. And then once you click OK, it's going to download it, install it, and it's going to reboot your computer. The reason it's going to reboot your computer anytime you install a virtual uh, virtual machine software is because it has to use your hardware as an extension in order to work. So, for example, things like network adapters, uh, you know, CPU, RAM, a video card memory, and all that type of stuff. So, it has to do a quick reboot so that way it knows how to create an extension of those into those virtual machines because we're making a virtual PC and it has to have some kind of hardware associated with that to work. Okay, once you do that. We're going to open up Hyper-V. This is how it looks like for me right now, but this is how it's going to look like for you the first time you open. This is exactly how it's going to look like. There's not going to be anything installed on it or anything like that. Okay, so what you see here under the Hyper-V manager is name Koboman1. So what is this Koboman1? Well, that's my computer. That's my physical computer, and that's the name of my computer that I'm using right now. So you can tell also by where it says here that I am remotely desktop into a Kobuman 1 computer. And just to kind of show you one, one example, one other example here is that in Windows properties and computer properties, you can see that the computer name here is Kobuman 1. So what that is, if I click on it, it's my computer. This software is literally using my physical computer, my actual hardware as an extension to create these virtual machines. So Again, once you install Hyper-V or even, for example, Oracle VirtualBox, which is also pretty good software, it's going to, again, reboot your computer because it's going to use your computer as an extension to run these virtual machines. So all these virtual machines are part of your physical machine. It's just they're creating these extensions to use in order to function as if it's its own thing, you know? And it is. Virtually speaking, it's its own thing. This is why you can have a server somewhere in a data center. For Imagine a rack server. I'm going to put a picture of it right now. This is kind of what it looks like. These, these servers are just on racks in big data centers somewhere in some building where AC is running really cold to keep him cool. And these servers can have many, many different virtual machines on them. And that's the whole point of creating a virtual machine is that, for example, you can have 10 different websites. You can have 10 different web servers, for example, running on a single server. And that's the great thing about virtual machines. If you have enough RAM, if you have enough processing power, you can run as many virtual machines as possible. So instead of just having one computer that's not using all of its resources, now you can have multiple virtual computers on that one computer or a server. So let me just kind of show you here just a brief example of what, kind of, what I kind of mean here. You can see that, that I have a CPU here and... This CPU has eight processing threads. It says eight logical processors right here. 
and it's an i7, and this is why it has this. This is an older i7, but it's still a pretty good processor, but it has eight logical processors. On these eight logical, you can potentially run four different instances of virtual machines because you can literally split those into two for each. So two times four is eight. You can have four different virtual machines running off of this one single CPU as long as they're not super intensive. And of course, you got to have enough RAM. And you can see here that I have um, a total of 16 gigabytes of RAM, and then you can split that RAM amongst those servers. You know, in a real realistic scenario, since this is not a server computer, in this case, if I wanted to have really good, two really good virtual machines, I would just run two to three maybe, because you can see that the system itself is using up quite a bit of RAM just to kind of function, you know what I mean? And that's, you know, but if I added more RAM, I can, of course, even make that even greater. So that explains the hardware part of it, of how virtual machines are created on actual hardware. So it creates those mini copies of themselves, if you will, that are not as good, but they're good enough to do certain things. Again, it, you know, I used an example of a web servers, which is very typical to see if you if you uh, if you're familiar with the cloud cloud storage and cloud computing. This is that's all they are. They're all virtual machines running off of different servers and different hardware platforms. But when it comes to setup, is something we're going to talk about right now. All right. So when you initially start this, it's going to be blank here. There will be no virtual machines, but you can click Create New. So we're going to click Quick Create New. Once this loads up, you can see that it actually offers you some, you know, typical stuff you can install on a virtual machine. This is just the kind of a thing that you can just literally click Create Virtual Machine. It's going to create it, and it's going to be these specific ones. It's what it's going to do is basically download these um, ISO images. Uh, you know, operating system images, and they're going to install them for you. And that's fine. If you want to try these and you don't want to really install anything else, you can certainly do that. But I wanted to show you that you can actually do it also by using your own image. So we're going to click local install source, and then we're going to specify different things. The first two we're going to install is Windows 10 and then Windows server 2019 so we're going to just kind of make sure that this is still checked here that what it says this virtual machine will run windows enable windows secure boot that's fine you can leave that like that and then we're going to click change installation source and now we're going to tell it to go to our desktop which is where our virtual machines are you can see right here we're going to select this one here so we're going to select that one so we're going to do windows 10 real quick and we're going to click create virtual machine so what this is doing is just kind of give you an option that says hey virtual machine already created you know it's already done and but that was really quick it yeah sure enough it created a virtual machine virtual computer but we haven't installed anything yet it just created some basic settings and we can click connect and it's going to keep those basic settings for the hard drive for you know how much ram is being used you know everything else but we kind of want to learn more about this. So we're going to click Edit Settings instead of Connect. We're going to click Hardware. So if we click here on the firmware, it kind of gives you an idea of what is selected for our drive and for our network adapter. And that's kind of a kind of main things right now that we're looking at here. We can tell that we already selected the Windows ISO image, and that's fine. It's inserted in virtual DVD drive. And we can see that it created a new virtual machine hard drive. And we'll look at that as well. And it created also a network adapter, which is using a default switch, basically an extension of our network adapter that we're already using. Moving down, if we click on security, we can see that secure boot is enabled. And then we can just kind of leave it here if you're using Microsoft Windows. That's fine. Uh, these are just some of the basics we're going to talk about. I don't want to talk about super in detail because this is just video on virtual machines. If we click on memory here, we can see that it specified two gigabytes of RAM, which is fine. That's that's what I would do with 16 gigabytes of RAM. Maybe add a little bit more depending on what I'm doing with the virtual machine. But for now, two gigabytes is fine. And then we're going to go click on the processors here. And we can see that we have number of virtual processors selected as four. We can adjust this to whatever we want. We can even do one if we really wanted to. But so so it installs faster on a computer. We're just going to leave it at three. I'm going to leave it at three so that way I have at least, uh, you know, uh, 
that after I do two uh, virtual machines, I'll have two processors running just for the base of my machine. So that way I don't use all eight uh, processing threads. So I'm going to change it to three. And then let's see here. I'm going to click apply here just in case. You can, you can change the resource percentages, this and that, and that's something advanced you can kind of fiddle with, but I wanted to show you some main stuff. If we click on the hard drive, you can see that it's using a virtual SCSI controller. It really doesn't matter. Um, the virtual hard disk that it's using here, there are different options of virtual hard disk you can create. Uh, if we click on edit, we can create our own virtual disk. And, you know, it really doesn't matter. I really haven't found that there makes any difference when it comes to performance or not because it's all virtual anyways. So there might be certain situations where you might want to look into this, but this is not the video about that. And then the other thing we can look at, I mean, we can look at the DVD drive. I already said it's, it's the DVD drive, virtual DVD drive that has Windows operating system inserted in it. And then we can look at the network adapter and it's using a default a switch, which, you know, you can disable it if you want but that's pretty much what it is to it. I don't want to talk about anything else because it's going to kind of take away from the point of this video. All right, so this is how your hardware looks like. We're set to install our virtual machine, and that's what we're going to do for our other machines that we, we create. All right, I'm going to click Connect. Where it says here the virtual machine is turned off, we can just click Start. So what it's now doing is basically post. You know, it's going to say, hey, do you want to <laughs> boot? Uh, see, I missed it. See, now it's trying to boot over PXE, over the network. But right, what it was doing here, actually, was trying to boot from the CD that we've inserted. So where is that? Where can we actually remove that? Because you don't want to keep this in there all the time once you install the computer. Otherwise, it's going to come up all the time. It's actually right here. So what I'm going to do is pause the machine. I clicked pause there. And I'm going to look at the DVD drive here. Well, I'm sorry. I'm going to turn it on. And we have to look at the DVD drive here, and then we can see here that we can eject that Windows ISO. So you want to do that after you install the operating, just like normally you would do. You don't want to boot from it all the time and try to install it. So uh, this is how we did it earlier. We can just simply click Insert Disk. Now we're going to go back to our desktop. We're going to specify our Windows again. And once we finish installing it, we're going to remove it. We're going to eject it, just like you would on a regular PC. So what I'm going to do here is actually reset the machine so that way we get a chance to actually hit any key here. I'm going to click reset and I'm going to hit any key and here it is. It's going to start our Hyper-V virtual PC and the virtual machine and here it is. Here's our Windows operating, Windows operating system install. And from here, you know, you can just install operating system, click install. It's just like you would normally do with any time you install Windows 10. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, turn this off and uh, or switch our ISO. We're going to switch to a different ISO. We're going to eject this one, and then we're going to install, insert different disk, and we're going to select this one, which is the uh, Windows Server 2019. I'm going to reset it, and I'm going to hit any key. And see how this one looks a little bit different. It's going to start our server 2019 operating system install. And then again, you just got to go through the motion, install Windows Server 2019, and then you'll have a virtual PC running. And I already have that installed, and I'll show you how that's running. So this is how I'm going to cancel this. I'm going to select, I'm going to eject this one. I'm going to insert our Linux one. And here's a Linux Mint. I just picked a random one. So I got to be honest. I tried to install Linux Mint on there, and it didn't work because it's corrupted. My ISO is corrupted. You can see here that it's only 354 megabytes. I don't know why it showed up as completed or downloaded like that, but it's supposed to be around 2 gigabytes. I'm almost done um, downloading a slightly different version of, of uh, Mint, so we're going to try that in, um, in this situation here. I'm going to move it to desktop. Not that it really matters, but anyways, let's try this again. We're going to create a do a quick create, and uh, and this time we're going to click local installation source as well. And I'm going to uncheck this because it's not Windows. So I'm going to uncheck secure boot. I'm going to change installation source. I'm going to go back to our desktop, and we're going to select Linux Mint which is Mate version rather than Cinnamon. Either way, I just wanted to see, uh, I wanted to show you how, you how you can install this, how you can, you know, install 
uh, whatchamacallit, uh, Linux distribution on this, and just, you know, it's really good for learning. All right, let's go quick overview. My main thing to kind of check is to make sure I have at least two gigs of RAM, and then processors, I'm going to back change down back to three, uh, just to kind of, you know, keep it like that. And yeah, everything looks fine. So I'm going to click connect. And just to kind of show you here, this is what, what I would have done earlier. I'm going to eject this, go back here, just like I did with the previous one, insert disk, and then again, you know, check or uh, select the Linux version. So now it's going to run just fine. I'm going to launch this bad boy, and I'm going to start installing Linux. I'm going to hit enter here. Or you can see that it's just going to install it as we are just kind of looking at it. And um, I wanted to show you the running virtual machines. I'm thinking, should I just kind of minimize this, let it, let it do its thing? Okay, let's try this one here. I'm going to run it just to show you a running virtual machine. This is either Windows 10 or Windows Server 2019. Either should work, connect. And it kind of asks, and let me log into this. If I can remember my password. But you can see it's just Windows operating system. And this is Windows Server. 2019 well see you can see this one is actually really responsive which is good and that uh, goes to show that you can run these type of machines and be pretty useful pretty pretty fast you see whatever I'm clicking on it's no problem whatsoever I went full screen on this everything is responsive everything's fine I don't know control panel file explorer it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It works pretty good. And let me see if I can just do uh, open just actor directory users and computers. There you go. It's snappy. It's working. And you can play around with it. When it comes to Linux stuff, you can just try different versions and see which one you can get going. Um, they're all going to be different. You know, obviously, some of them don't even have GUI at all. There's no desktop per se, or ver, you know, like a visual desktop. And, you know, there'll be a lot of command line action going on. But this is virtual machines in the nutshell for people to kind of get introduced to virtual machines and install their own and play around with. And there you go. I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. Today's video is on Zoom. The reason it's on Zoom is because it's currently a very popular platform that people use for video conferencing meetings, even just meetings with their family. So yeah, we're going to talk about Zoom because it's very popular, a lot of people are using it. So we need to know how to fix certain things like audio and video or camera issues if you will. We're certainly going to talk about all of that. But before we do that, please take one second to click the like button. And as always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I will answer them. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So here's what Zoom looks like when you install it. This is the Zoom application installed on your computer. When somebody gives you just a link and you've never used Zoom before, and chances are if they just sent you a link, you will simply click on the link and the link will say, hey, do you want to install Zoom? And then you click open Zoom or install Zoom and it's going to install it. And then what you get and what you actually see is this window. This is the window that you would typically see first time you use Zoom. And then you realize maybe my audio is not working. People can't hear me or people can't see me. We're going to definitely talk about that. But the, also a first pop-up that might, you might see is it's going to ask you whether you want to use your computer uh, as audio. So you have to make sure that you click use my computer as audio so that's going to pop up and you just click on that and that's very simple but then even then if you don't have your audio set up correctly it may not work let's look at the microphone uh, icon here you can see there's activity there that means it's detecting that there is a microphone it's picking up all those sounds from the microphones coming through that's good however we may have multiple microphones how do we know which one is being used correctly or if any so what if that's not happening that means we need to tell it 
which microphone needs to be used. So if we click on this little arrow here, we're going to see a lot of stuff. And you can see I have a lot of stuff. The reason I do is because, you know, I'm a YouTuber. I have lots of equipment. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that shows up. If you simply have a headset, if you simply have a headset, all you got to do is find out what is the name of it. In my case, I have a headset and it's called Plantronics C610. So I'm going to make sure I select that as the speaker because otherwise I won't be able to hear people. So now my Plantronics C6, C610 is selected. So that's my speaker. That's what I'm going to hear inside of my Plantronics headset that I'm going to put on my head. And then same thing for microphone. I'm going to make sure that this microphone is selected. And notice it's still working. The reason it's working is because it's selected as the same as system. And I have multiple ones, so it's probably picking up my microphone that I'm speaking to right now, which is not my headset. But for Zoom meeting, I want to use my headset, so I'm going to select it. And then I'm going to double check here, make sure it's selected. And you can tell that it's selected by simple, you know, check mark that you have here. And that's one way to make sure that you're using a separate like if you have multiple things like me this way you can keep track and make sure that you know if you want to use it separate from other equipment you just have to make sure that it knows what you want to use and now my audio is set this is if you're using a headset if you're using like a laptop if you have a laptop you have to make sure that the microphones laptop and speakers are selected so if you're not using a website and just your built-in laptop camera and the microphone, make sure that Realtek is selected for the speakers like this, speakers and the camera. Since I'm not using a laptop, all you see is speakers and no, cam no microphone here. But if I was to, for example, switch to my a, uh, webcam and like, for example, I have a uh, microphone on a webcam that is called HD Pro Webcam. And I'm going to select that if you want, if I want to use that camera. Now, this webcam doesn't have speakers, so I'm going to make sure that Realtek is just enabled, which is my PC speakers, right? So, again, don't pay attention to this last part too much unless you have these specific things. But if you're using a headset, make sure you select the correct headset in both of the, these menus. That way, it makes it simple for you. But if you have a laptop, just a laptop, you won't have this many things in here. So just make sure that the Realtek is selected. But if you have a webcam, make sure that the webcam is selected and uh, the PC's speakers. So now you can see how I've selected the microphone for the Plantronics. And it's actually picking up a little bit less of it because it's kind of uh, about a foot or so away from me. So it's picking up less of it. Right now I'm speaking into something else. Anyways, that's the audio. Uh, we can certainly test it. You can test it here test speaker and microphone and it goes through this setup where it detects the levels of it and then it tells you do you hear the ringtone and it's a really good way to actually make sure that your headset or your audio is working so I highly suggest you use that for testing and then you can also have if you have a phone embedded that's another thing uh, but you know this is uh, this is video specifically for somebody who chances are just install the zoom for the first time and this phone integration is something else so I don't necessarily want to talk about this because it'll be way too much and way too confusing um, and then uh, you can if you click leave computer audio uh, that means you can just like call into the meeting and use your like phone like your cell phone you know or your, your home phone if you have them and then if you want to really look at the audio settings you can click on the audio settings here and then you can see again what is selected in just a different separate menu but it's the same thing we did earlier except that you can adjust the output levels and this and that you know and then there are other things you can do like use separate audio device to play a ringtone simultaneously for example if you have a headset but you want your ringtone to come through the computer speakers make sure that this is checked like that and then select speakers real tech so now this time it the ringtone is going to come through the pc speakers there are a lot of issues uh, a lot of issues a lot of things you can do here and then you know just play with them and make sure you know kind of find out what your preferences are 
And then, you know, like, for example, you can automatically mute your microphone when you join a meeting. These are all personal preferences. You can go to advanced and deal in, and, you know, adjust the background noise, but this is fine as it is. I wouldn't worry about it. Just kind of leave it at that. Otherwise, you can just cause issues, uh, more issues with the uh, audio. And if it works, you know, don't try to fix what's not broken type of thing, you know. So just make sure that your proper microphone and speaker are selected. Do a quick test on them and make sure that works. Now, let's look at the video. Video, all, right now, I just have a picture there. And if I click Start Video, you can see me here talking. And this is... Uh, <laughs> this is my puppet here, I guess, and I just have that for a bit. And you can see me over here in the in the right hand corner, uh, right there. You can see me uh, just kind of talking and waving. So I'm the puppeteer, if you will. So my <laughs> video is enabled here, but if I want to stop at any time, I can just click stop. And then if I want to select a different camera, I can certainly do that. And for example, select this HD you know, uh, webcam or whatever your webcam is, it's going to be listed there. Now, keep in mind that if you have a camera open in another program, that it may not work at all. Like in this example, if I select my pro webcam here, it's not going to work because I have it open in another program. So if I click start, it just doesn't do anything. It's, it literally says cannot start video, fail to start video camera, please select another video and camera settings. I know you can't see that error pop up because it's on my second screen where my puppet is and I'm going to actually switch to it so maybe, maybe hopefully it stays there yeah you can see it right there that there is the error cannot start video because I had um, camera um, I clicked on a camera that's been used by something else so make sure that no other program is open and using your camera that's why you get that error you know otherwise it's you know it's pretty straightforward you select the camera you want to use, and that's that. Now, and then you can look, I mean, let's look at the video settings here, what we have here, and uh, you can set different uh, options. Of course, select the camera you want to use again, but you can also see that you can change the aspect ratios, enable HD, you can mirror your video, you can touch up your appearance to make yourself look prettier, and, um, you know, different personal preferences that you want to show people about you. Camera is one of those things that is... You know, I don't like using it um, for obvious reasons because I'm ugly. But you know, you know, some people like it. Some people like it. So, and that's fine. Um, I personally don't care for it. Here's a some kind of fun thing that you can look at, and that is virtual uh, backgrounds. So let me see if this works since I have a green screen going on. I wonder if it'll actually detect it decently or do anything with it. I'm going to select that. I have a green screen. Oh wow. Hey, that's pretty cool, actually. Look at that. Would y'all look at that? All right, all right. Let me let me close it here. I'm going to start video. Hey, that's not bad. So if you have a green screen, this works really cool, doesn't it? I like that. That's pretty cool. It looks like I'm in space and whatnot. Let's change to something else. Choose a virtual background. Ooh, at the beach. I wish I was at the beach right now. Look at that. Would y'all look at that? That's pretty cool. Oh, look, it's moving. <laughs> That's actually pretty fun. I've seen other people's, um, you other people using virtual backgrounds, and it kind of looks off because they don't have green screen. But in my case, I have a perfect green screen because it's software. There's no cloth behind me or anything like that. It's just my puppet, and he um, has a perfect green screen because it's 100% green ski. And let's do one other. Oh, okay. Uh, I think this one's the best, although it's not moving. And then there's none. You can see there's my perfect green screen over here, you know. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. I think it's really fun to actually create this video. I, uh, uh, it's, it's cool. It's cool. Like, it's not that hard to use, but, yeah, people still have issues. And that's understandable. It's okay to have these type of issues, you know. It's okay. As long as we know how to fix them, these are normal computer issues that happen all the time. Trust me. So that being said, I'm going to wrap it up. Please take a moment to like the video. And if you have any questions, let me know. Bye-bye.
Hi there, are you looking to get an IT job? Well, I can help you with that. My website, CosmicNova.com, can prepare you for the most important part of getting that IT job. Sure, you can apply for the job, you can get your resume straight, you can get that interview, but can you pass that interview? That's the most important part of it. Sometimes it comes down to just personality, but what else can you do with that? Well, I can prepare you exactly for those specific IT jobs. For example, I have videos and articles on that. My website, CosmicNova.com, links to everything that you need to get that IT job. Are you applying for a help desk? Are you applying for system administration, desktop support, network operations, network administration, or other ones? It doesn't matter. I can prepare you for all of those. Check out my website, CosmicNova.com, or just follow the link below. I will help you with not only written material, but I also have videos on it specifically made and voiced by yours truly. It's all professional, guys. Come check it out, and it's free. What do you got to lose? Just click on the link and stop by. I wish you best of luck. Oh, hey, looks like you decided to check out my channel. You probably watched one of my other videos, and there might be something that you liked. And now you're maybe considering, uh, you know, subscribing and whatnot. But, you know, check out my other stuff first. I don't want you to, like, subscribe to me at all unless you like some of my other stuff. Check it out. I got more IT stuff. I don't know if you watched that or not, but I got a lot more of hardware stuff. So if you liked any of that, I, uh, you know, I have plenty of more of that and I have plenty of more coming your way. So what are you waiting for? Either check them out or subscribe because there will definitely be more. And, uh, you know, I try to explain this stuff as best as I can. So it's easy to understand whether it's IT or the hardware stuff. My way of explaining things is very unique and different from anybody else. So keep that in mind. And uh, while you're here, I want to say that I love you. And thank you for watching my stuff and doing any type of other interaction that you did with my video. Like, you know, stuff that people ask you to do. Like, hey, can you click like? Can you leave a comment? This and that. Look, if you felt like I deserve any of that stuff, I'm sure you already did all that stuff. And again... I always say this in all of my video videos is that if you need help with anything, you let me know. Also, this is my this is my uh, logo. By the way, my name is Irvin, also known as Couple Man. I probably should have said that in the beginning, shouldn't have I? Oh well. Anyways, I guess you would already know that. You know, what am I doing with this hand? Doesn't this look like I'm? Doesn't this look like I'm holstering like one of those revolvers in those Western movies? You know, like pew, 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 bang, bang, ba bang, 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 bing, bang, pew, pew, bang. Okay, it got really weird at that point. I'm sorry, guys. But anyways, bang, you're it. I don't know what that means, but I'm being really goofy. And you know what? I'm just going to leave it like this. I don't care. It is a trailer after all, and chances are you haven't watched the whole thing anyways. So, bye. Bye again. I think it just got weird, didn't it? Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Men. This is a Getting Started with Azure video, which is a combination of two videos that I previously made on Microsoft Azure as part of introduction to this Microsoft system. First part of this video talks about basic navigation on the Azure platform. Introduction talks about what Azure is, what it's used for, and then getting started with virtual machines as a starting point. Towards the end and second part of this video it talks about storage containers and creating shared drives which are then applied to the machines. Microsoft Azure is a web-based or a cloud-based platform, if you will, that allows you to deploy different type of applications using Microsoft's service or Microsoft's processing power. So just imagine a bunch of different locations all around the world that have server rooms inside of them. All of those servers you are able to access through the Microsoft Azure and set up or deploy any application that you may even think of. And I'll show you, there are so many options that you can use. There are so many different things that you can go through and I will show you step by step on how to do this, whether it's deploying certain applications or running different services. I will show you from the beginning 
to the end for each video so that way there is no confusion. Friends, if you like this type of content, please take one second to click the like button. I really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference for me. All right, so before you can get started, uh, you have to create an Azure account and have a Microsoft account. But before you can activate your Azure account or have full access to it, you need to provide identity, verif identity verification and they want or require a credit card for you to use to verify your identity. All right, so let's go ahead and have a quick look at how it looks like. This is me logged in into Microsoft Azure, and there are a couple of things that you notice first. This is the home page, and typically in the home page, what you see is different uh, applications or things you've installed recently, and that would be under recent uh, resources. Above here, you have Azure services, and from here, you simply select a service that you want to deploy. And don't worry, I'm not going to confuse you with any of this, but I just kind of want to show you what's there available. And I'm going to click on more services as I did over there, just to show you that there is a massive amount of different things you can learn. Here are some examples. Here are the categories. Uh, there are general, there are networking, storage, web, uh, you know, there's uh, analytics, there is even AI machine learning, there is uh, mixed reality, security, monitoring, all kinds of different things you can learn. So if I expand this even further to see all services, you can see that there is just a massive amount of different things you can learn. However, that being said, in the first two videos, we're going to concentrate on creating some virtual machines that I will show you how to access, how to monitor, and how to configure. And after that, the second video will be about uh, file storage and storage containers and how you can install them and run them using scripts through the PowerShell. All right. I hope I hope you're still with me because I promise it's not going to be uh, confusing or uh, super complex or anything like that. This is just a brief introduction to Microsoft Azure of the things that I will be uh, looking to show you. All right, so now that we're done with the brief introduction, we're going to start from scratch. So in order to start from scratch, we have to start with a resource group. So what the resource group is, and here you can see it right here, resource group is, you can think of it as a container that will have all the services, all the applications that you run in that one spot. So it's a form of, um, it's a way to organize everything in one place in order for things to function and of course things to be built properly because these are web services that you pay for typically and if you want to especially keep them running you're going to want to, you're going to have to pay to Microsoft to run all these services. For example, let's say you want to install a web server and you want to deploy virtual machines and run Apache on it, you're going to have to, you know, they want to know uh, they, they, they need to have a way to kind of keep track of all of that. So that's what the resource group is. So I'm going to click on that and we're going to create a new one. You can see there are three different ones that I've created here. But let's go ahead and create one from a scratch. Again, this is just uh, basically, it, think of like creating a package of some sort. And the, for the package, you need that outside shell or outside box. So right now we're creating the box for our... Uh, services that we're going to run. So this is going to be outside of it. No labels on it yet or anything like that, but we're going to uh, start creating that right now. The first thing that asks here is a subscription. And again, that kind of ties in into what thing I was saying about them, you know, charging you. In my case, um, I'm using the Azure subscription one. So this is just a way of you know, a subscription, you know, if you will, just like a Netflix subscription, you would just kind of pick the subscription that you have currently right now. And this is the free one that I'm using right now. There are $200 in credits available for it. So I'm going to click that so that way, um, you know, th th that's simply it is. You just kind of tell it, I want to use this subscription. And anything that's inside of this resource group is going to be charged under that subscription. This is incredibly important to know. So that way you know what you're uh, getting into and where the charges are coming from as well. All right. And then we're going to name this new resource group. So we're going to name it something that is appropriate for this tutorial. And we're going to just name it um, Azure Tutorial. We're going to name it that. Resource, next thing is resource details. This is also incredibly important. You want to make sure that everything that you deploy is in the same region. And you can see if you expand this that there are so many different regions. You got East, uh, US, 
um, U.S. East, I should say, and then Europe North, uh, U.S. Central, Africa, Asia, Canada, and, you know, a bunch of different ones. I'm going to stick to U.S. Central. So everything that I create in this has to be in the same region. Think about networking in a sense, especially if you, when you're trying to sync different services with one another, you want them to be in the same region, otherwise they may not work properly. Okay, now just keep that in mind. I'm going to click Review and Create, and after that I'm just going to click Create. So here is our box, guys. This is the box that we've created, and now we're going to um, add more things to that box and the first thing we're going to do is create a virtual machine the reason I wanted to start with virtual machines is because most people are familiar with that especially if you're a system administrator of sort and uh, you know it's kind of simple to um, configure and install and most people understand what that is because it's you know most of the time it's just a you know operating system that you are familiar with all right now the, the way I'm going to add a virtual machine. I'm going to click on this little hamburger uh, icon here so I can have an expanded menu. And from here, we can also select different services, not just from home. This is where we were at initially, but you can also select some of the serv you know, from the left hand side. This is what I like to use for quick access. So I'm going to go down and simply just select a virtual machine. I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to click on here to create a virtual machine. And then we're going to create, I'd say about three different ones, just to show you. So we're going to, here we are in a, in a familiar window that we've seen earlier. Again, we have to, you know, make sure that we have the uh, proper subscription selected. This is, you know, again, we're, this is how they're going to charge us for the service. And again, we have resource group. And remember the one we created here? We can just simply select that we're going to select our Azure tutorial. This is our group. And then we're going to name our virtual machine. So let's see, what's the most common operating system that people are using right now? And that would be Windows, right? So let's go ahead and type in Windows 10 VM. We're going to create one of those. And luckily our region is automatically populated. So we, you know, we just have to make sure it is that and it is indeed central US. So it does memorize that, which is really good. And then uh, I'm not going to talk about infrastructure redundancy. I'm just going to leave it like that. It's just a you know virtual machine. And then here for the image, by the way, you can use your own image if you'd like. It says here browse all public and private images. That's just a you know a bunch of different things that they have available. But from our understand, you can use your own image as well. But we're just going to use what they have here pre-built for now. And then we're going to select Windows 10 and we're going to go with Windows 10 Pro version 1809, which is a little bit behind. Uh, the current version is 1909, I believe. But that doesn't matter. Uh, we can certainly update that later if, if needed. But for now, you know, we want to, uh, we're just going to select that. And here it is our size. Size, but that means what it is, is just the type of uh, CPU and RAM and system resources we want to use for this virtual machine. And here it gives you an idea of what two virtual CPUs uh, cost with seven gigabytes of memory. And it's $183 a month. So we're going to click change. And we're going to select a different option that's going to be more affordable. In, this, in the change window, we have all kinds of different uh, options. And as soon as the loss loads here, here it is, and costs a month, we can select something that's a bit more affordable. And uh, for that, I'm going to just click this first one, which is just two gigs of RAM, one virtual CPU, and that's going to be good enough for our testing purposes, of course, testing purposes only. And I do, again, I have that $200 credit, but, you know, I'm just going to show this in case, uh, uh, in case there's some confusion about billing or whatnot. Anyways, so I'm going to choose one, and here you see how it says $47 a month. This is estimated usage. A lot of times, and I'm not 100% sure if it the case is with Azure, but I use uh, Google services for a uh, Google Cloud service for my website. They will a lot of times give you different discounts. So, you know, I'm not sure if that's 100% the case with Azure, but I, I suspect it is. It is just depending on what kind of a you know thing you're using uh, their services for. And of course, you can use you know the cheap one, which is here eight dollars a month, but this is incredibly slow, so I wouldn't even. Um, 
I worry about that too much. Um, if you look at it closely, it gives you kind of a, a, a limits and how much storage you have. You can certainly look at those things uh, on your own, and it's going to be uh, dependent on your personal preferences or what what kind of a you know system that you need. Uh, but I'm just going to use it, you know, this general purpose one. I'm going to leave it at that, and then I'm going to click select. All right. Now we have our virtual machine set up. This is our this is going to be our settings for it. So the next thing we have is creating administrator account so that we can log into it. Uh, and we're going to log into it using remote desktop. This is pretty cool that they have it set up. So I'm going to type in Kobuman and I'm going to type in my password. They really want a super long password which is perfectly okay. So I'm going to type it in, type it in twice. All right, and here, uh, here are the inbound rules. Select which virtual machine networks, uh, network ports are accessible from the public internet. You can specify more limit or gradual network access to the network tab. So I'm going to leave it uh, at RDP, so that way we can use RDP. So I'm just going to leave it at that. And then here it says save money. You already have Windows Enterprise. So they're asking you about the license, whether you have a license or not. Uh, this is something. You know, if, if you're seriously going to run this, you can look into later, but for now, it's just going to let us install it. So I'm just going to click Review and Create. And um, as soon as it approves the deployment, we're going to click Create Deployment. And after that, we're going to um, create a couple of more virtual machines. So here's our overview of the things we've selected. By clicking Create, you basically you know agree to the terms of service, this and that, blah 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 blah. If you're interested in more details for that, you can certainly um, you can certainly um, take a look for yourself. Again, we're just kind of trying to keep this as simple as possible, and then depending on what we want to do with this, we can kind of look at the more details later. Okay. Now, once we create this, as you can see, it's initializing deployment. It's going to start deploying it. What happens, it actually creates a virtual network automatically for you, and it places this machine into a virtual network for you, for, for your uh, container that we kind of talked about. So now, like kind of going back, that uh, resource um, that, um, container that we created is that box that we have. Now we're starting to put things inside of this box. So everything that's inside of this box is the network that everything's going to be um, on and you know again we kind of made sure that we picked US Central in our case so everything that we put in there is going to be inside of that one box and everything is going to be connected and attached to itself all right so the deployment is underway so we can actually get out of this window and proceed to create a couple of more virtual machines so let's go ahead and do that we're going to create a virtual machine uh, server so I'm going to create a new one I'm going to click on there and you can see it's processing over here and that's perfectly fine we already told it go ahead and do this and it already has its settings and it's just doing its thing in the background we're going to do the same thing for uh, let's see here we're going to just pick a server we're going to uh, I think I want to do 2019 uh, so again if we go to do a resource group we're going to select Azure tutorial and I'm going to name it Windows serve 2019 VM make sure it's US Central and I'm going to select Windows Server 2019 data center I'm going to go back here and change to our standard if available we're going to standard uh, type of CPU processing and it's this one that's the first one I'm going to select that and again, if you're creating a server and you needed to do a certain uh, um, amount of processing, you can certainly change this at any time, even after you deploy it. So you can stop the service and later on change these settings on any of these virtual machines. We're going to create our you know, administrator password and login. Just a moment here. I'm trying to remember there are thousands of passwords that I have. For a bunch of different things trying to get a unique password for everything is a bit difficult so again we're going to leave the rdp open so that way we can access it and i'm going to click review and create and um, yes you can go um 
you can go into more detail and specify the type of uh, things you want on it. What does it say? It errored out. Required information is missing. What did we miss? Uh, basics. Oh, <laughs> I made it too long. The name of the virtual machine. All right. Anyways, we're going to click review and create. So yeah, you can go in there and specify the disk sizes and which network you want to use. But again, this is going to automatically put it into uh, the same the network that you need to. But if you want to go in and specify disks, you can go in there and specify type of disk you want. If you want the premium, you can certainly do so. You can add, uh, attach a disk on it. This is all virtually, uh, you know, you, you can virtually do this in in any type of. Uh, um, virtual machine that you set up and then if you go to networking you can specify the network but again it's automatically going to put you into the correct network so I'm not too worried about that and there are some other things you can you know check and, and adjust but again I want to keep this very simple so that anybody can get this going on their own all right so review and create now it should let us uh, it should approve the deployment of it once uh, it thinks about it a little bit here and then we're going to click click create excuse me and then we're going to deploy this machine as well it may take a little time you know these are not the fastest when it comes to uh, when it comes to creating virtual machine but it is pretty I should say it's pretty common to have this type of a uh, thing happening whenever you're using Google no oh, I say Google because I use Google uh, quite often but um, when you use uh, cloud services of this sort but you know you know I digress uh, it is pretty fast uh, considering that it installs an operating system on a virtual machine okay let's see what our process or what our status is it's still deploying the first one let's see here now you can see right here that uh, once I clicked on the little bell that I have 197 dollars in credit remaining I'm just going to leave it here for in this window for a minute and you can see here what it's kind of doing when it's deploying it's creating that you know the virtual machines and then it's reserving an IP address for it as well and it's kind of uh, telling you that it is putting it in the correct network all right let me see here you know what let's go ahead and, and do another virtual machine but this time we're going to do a Linux machine and uh, yeah, this the first one is still creating. While we do that, I'm going to execute the other one. I uh, execute the uh, deployment of our third virtual machine, which is going to be Linux. So here we are again, resource group. We're going to make sure we check check uh, Azure tutorials, and I'm going to type in Linux for the name of this virtual machine, and I'm going to actually label it Ubuntu because I'm going to select Ubuntu. Region is U.S. Central again. And then we're going, I'm just going to leave it here on Ubuntu server 18.04. And again, you have you know different options for different types of Linuxes. And I'm going to go back here and select our standard type of machine for Linux. And I certainly don't want to use the slowest one. And, yep, that's the one. I'm going to select that. And um, when it comes to Ubuntu or Linux there are a couple of different ways you can access it you can use SSH public key so this is kind of confusing and this is another topic that you we would have to talk about and explain but it's just a different way of encrypt uh, encryption access that you can use and then use that a, a key to access it but that's confusing I don't want to um, talk about that I'm just gonna keep it to simple username and password just like we have on the other one just to keep it simple and the reason I'm doing this guys is because I have people who are new to computers that watch my content uh, you know it's I can talk about SSH public keys and and this and that but let's let's keep it simple guys I'm just gonna keep it simple so here we can change it uh, different sendings for the inbound ports uh, by the way if you are going to run a web server here, you can select 
to have it open for those as well here. This will allow all IP addresses to access your virtual machine. Now, if you're going to use this type of uh, uh, setup, you don't have to. If you don't want to, typically you would just leave the SSH because you don't want to keep yourself, you know, get, you know, open yourself up for the intrusion. Once you set up a web server, you'll have a way to access it um, through the web server interface. So you don't necessarily have to have these HTTPS open at this time at all. So you can leave just SSH because that's typically how you would access a Linux server because it's a command line anyways. So I uh, would just kind of leave it at SSH and, and for that. Um, once you deploy a web server, for example, you can block access to SSH externally. There are different ways of doing it. You can use it um, to, uh, you can use a configuration on the server itself to block access to SSH ports. But again, we're going to uh, just kind of leave it at that for now. I'm going to click review and create. And then once it approves our deployment, we're going to click Create. So keep it moving. Otherwise, this video would have been God knows how long if I kept talking about every detail of things. And it would be confusing as well. Okay, let's see. I'm just waiting for this window to go to the next window to kind of uh, confirm to me that it's submitted for deployment. And hopefully, hopefully our Windows 10, the first virtual machine, is deployed already. Now I'm just kind of checking to see if everything is going right. Okay, good, good. Your deployment is underway. All right, so I'm gonna go back home. I'm going to click on home. You can go, go back to home and see the things that we've touched on recently. And uh, it takes a while to update actually right here. It takes a bit to update, but this is what would have show up typically of the new things that we've touched on or created or adjusted. And it also does that in the dashboard. If we go to the dashboard, okay, good. We got a message here that deployment succeeded for one of our virtual machines. We're going to check that here in a minute, but you know what, let's, let's pin it to dashboard because I wanted to go to dashboard anyways. That was my next, I'm going to pin it to dashboard. So let's see what that is. So next thing under home here is dashboard. So we're going to click on dashboard to see what's there. All right, looks like our Windows server is deployed. Oh, where's our Windows 10? That's kind of weird. Didn't we have Windows 10 machine deployed as well? Did that succeed or not? Uh, all right. Well, let's go to resources. I'm going to click on go to resources, Windows Server 2019. Oh, this already deployed, but not the Windows 10 that I asked for. Okay. Well, let's go to our virtual machines again and see if it's there. Oh, it's still creating it. That's interesting. So Windows Server 2019 actually deployed faster than Windows 10. It's still creating it. Huh, that's very interesting. Anyways, let's go ahead and see the overview of Windows Server 2019. So again, we are on virtual machines and this will show you all the other ones that we created as well. So we're missing a Linux here, which is still being created. And it takes a while to refresh to see. So we're going to click on Windows Server because supposedly that one is already deployed. We can see our public IP address of it and we can here connect to it. But I kind of wanted to show you overview of it in the sense to see what is there for you to actually look at besides just regular information that is there. I mean, yeah, sure, you can see the IP address on it, you can see the subscription, subscription ID, you know, computer name if available, uh, but, you know, and, and then type of uh, type of um, CPU that you're running and this and that. And you should be able to change this once you click stop, and th that's a topic for another video. But right now I wanted to show you what is kind of important as an Azure administrator, and that is monitoring. Now. You can see that there are four different, uh, four different graphs here, and that are kind of the reason there are four and these specific ones because there are kind of the most important ones that you would want to look at. First one is being CPU average. This is the usage of your CPU, and the next one is network usage, disk bytes, which involves read and write bytes at any given time. You can see it's it gives you how much on the left column here and on the bottom it tells you the time of it and also 
it gives you this disk read and disk write in bytes. And uh, then on the other one, on the other one here, over here next to it, it says disk operations per second on average, and it gives you different times. The reason this is important to have is that if you suspect something suspicious going on, for example, let's say you're running a website or a web server, or you suspect attack on your server, you can look at the different times and this different CPU usage, different um, different uh, operations on it that are happening at certain times. And uh, this doesn't give us a good example here because it's a brand new one. But let's go ahead and connect to it, and we're going to do some stuff on it. So that way, it's going to give us some data here, which we can get back to, and I can kind of talk about it a little bit more. Because right now, it doesn't really give us enough for me to talk about. So let's go ahead and click Connect here, and we're going to select RDP. All right. So what this does, it's going to download an RDP uh, file for us that we can just simply click and use it just a regular you know windows remote desktop uh, remote desktop protocol so we're going to click on that and it's going to save it i'm just trying to check in okay you don't see the pop-up but there's actually a pop-up that says uh, do you want to save this file or just open it i'm going to click open it i'm going to click connect i apologize you guys don't see the login on this recording but it is there so what I'm doing is just typing in the password and the login that I showed you before that I've set up upon the creation of this and I'm going to click OK I will show you the the uh, whatchamacallit the remote desktop as well as soon as I get it going here okay just a moment please bear with me I just need to add a different source, window capture. I need to capture that window just a moment. Please bear with me. Here we go, remote desktop. Here we are. All right. There you guys. There you go. I hope you can see it. It's loading right now. So I'm going to let's see here. Hope it doesn't break the. The stupid recording window software is not is not being good to me. All right, looks like it's showing the RDP there, and it's creating it. You know the typical thing: the first time you log in, it's going to create your local profile, and it's going to take a bit to load. It's you know th this is very typical. Uh, you just kind of have to wait for it to start and get going and here it is finally coming up so this is our windows server machine pretty soon we're going to see that windows server setup configuration there and then it's just like using a you know regular windows server machine you is if you were there you guys know what remote desktop is but then again you have this goes to show you that you have full access to it Okay, now I'm going to go back to that overview and kind of look at those graphs with you and tell you kind of for the things to, to kind of look for when it comes to monitoring this type of a system. And then I'm going to show you the other machines as well, depending how long this takes. And see here it is, here's that typical thing where it asks you to, do you want to allow this PC to be discoverable? And we're going to click yes for that so there you go this is typically what happens or what you see when you install Windows Server and uh, I'm just going to minimize this and go back to our Azure window okay there we are okay so we're going to click on overview again just so you can see all the things that are be that are happening on the window uh, on the um, Windows uh, 2019 server. So since we've logged into it, we saw more activity. Now we can see that at this time, which is at 12:13 p.m., we can see that there is more CPU activity. As a matter of fact, they spiked to almost 100%. And at the same time, you can see that it kind of moves the other 
uh, diagrams or uh, graphs at the same time so that way you can see what is going on at the same time so it kind of aligns it for you and now now you can see there is more read and write which is pretty normal it gives you the disk reads down here where it says 137 megabytes and then disk writes of 483 megabytes so this is happening as we are creating our local profile and at the same time we see some network activity and that is you know it says windows server is network in total is 147 megabytes and network out total is uh, let's see it's still happening it's at 1.27 megabytes so it downloaded 147 megabytes of data and it uploaded 100, uh, 1 megabyte uh, 1.27 megabytes and then it, we get the more disk operations so why is this important why am I telling you about this if you suspect somebody hacking into your system you might want to kind of look at the spikes in the graph otherwise you'll be just normal or just a little jagged like this normally this is pretty normal operation just kind of idling but when it comes to huge spikes like this you want to kind of look at this and see what is happening now if it's just a web server and you see increase in traffic you know people using your website and you see a spike like this but then you look at your other monitoring tools for the live traffic of people coming through and you see a spike on your server that's not normal right but if you suddenly see a spike at a certain time then you might want to see if there is some kind of a you know attack on your server or whatnot or if there's some kind of a you know who knows maybe even a virus happening on your computer if you have abnormal disk reads of bytes or cpu usage all right so the next thing i'm going to do is look at other things that are here under the overview there are a bunch of different things here that we can look at that help you deal with this type of stuff and things that you can change so if you click for example on networking here under settings you can look at the network settings of it and gives you more information on it you can add inbound port rules if you want to open up uh, you know uh, different uh, ports or not you can at the same time you can disable one so here's our rdp here and we can disable it if we want so if you're occasionally accessing this Windows Server using the RDP, you might want to delete it so that way you're, you know, you're more protected. Nobody can really, you know, try to access it afterwards. And then same thing uh, when it comes to disks. If you click on disks here, um, you can, you know, make changes to it if you'd like. Uh, a lot of times we have to stop the, um, the service from running. I'm not exactly sure if that's the case here with the Azure systems. We can certainly try that. And then we got a bunch of different monitoring uh, things that we can look at. So one of the things that I showed you there are those graphs. And there is a different way to look at that as well. If you want a more customized and cleaner way of doing it. If you click on the little hamburger thing, uh, assign, you can go down here and select monitor. And you can look at uh, monitoring uh, metrics of it so if you click here explore metrics you can add different graphs that you can look at again I don't want to confuse you too much with this again this is just another way of looking at the same thing except in a more detailed manner where you can make adjustments and change the different metrics that you want to look at and here's a, just a real quick if we click here on the scope this allows you to select our resource so if we select our Azure subscription one we know this is where our resource group is at and then we can click Azure tutorial and then we're going to look down here for our server and for some reason it's not scrolling down but that's okay no problem we know that we have that service and to click on resource type I'm going to uncheck select all I'm going to just click virtual machines because that's the only thing I want to look at for now and I'm going to close that and now it's going to come up and say well you have three virtual machines which ones do you want to monitor I'm going to click I'm going to click Windows Server 2019 I'm going to select that and now it's asking me to select a metric so we can kind of replicate to you know what we've seen previously we can kind of select I don't know let's see disk read operations per second uh, we had that over there and then the graph is going to come up and show us you can see here and there's that then we can you know add more to it or we can add another metric and uh, in a way where you can just select what was the other one network out total let's see where's our network network in total I should say and there was an out as well and it gives you that and it those they give you kind of side by side but if you want them to you know uh, kind of stack on top of each other you can certainly do that as well I'm just gonna move it to the right here to move the timeline but again 
there's not much going on right now, so there really isn't much to look at. And let me just try one more here. CPU, there's, I want to look for the uh, CPU one, percentage CPU, here we go. Average, okay. And it gives you, see, it's, it's just not enough for us to kind of visualize. Anyways, the machine is just too new for us to actually, for this to work properly, because it hasn't even replicated completely. We know there's a lot more going on, it's just that it takes time, and these things kind of take time to replicate for you to use this properly. But anyways, it's all here, it's just a different way of looking at it, and if you want to get a more you know, in-depth analysis of what's going on with the usage of that machine, you can certainly do that. Alright, let's go to other virtual machines. Uh, we can look at Windows 10, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I went ahead and stopped it early. I don't know if you guys seen that, but I went ahead and stopped it from working. But it's because the way I access it is the same as Windows Server 2019. I just wanted to show you that you can deploy that. Let's go ahead and click our Linux Ubuntu machine. The way you can connect to this is if you click on the connect, you can use SSH, you can use RDP. But if we click on RDP, you can see that we have to install certain things on our computer in order to access this. This is not going to actually work. So if I click download RDP, it's not going to actually let me work to it. Typically you would, um, and it's closed. We know that the port is closed anyways. So uh, we can choose to connect with SSH with the key thing, this and that, but you know, I don't, I don't wanna do that. There's an easiest way to connect to this. And if you scroll down under this, all the way down, there is a thing called Serial Console. So if we click on that, it will give us the same access as if it was SSH, I believe. Now, uh, it's going to ask us for our password so we can actually have access to our console. But once we go in there, uh, it's just an easier way to accessing it. As soon as it comes up here, it's going to ask us for our password and we're going to be able to, you know, browse it. Uh, it's just that, you know, once you, the way, the only difference is that it's it's not a pop out the window, you know. And for me, it actually works out for me to show you like this. And uh, okay, log in. I'm going to type in my login name, and I'm going to type in my password. I'm going to hit enter. And as soon as it thinks about it, we will have access. And there it is. We have full access to this server. So if we do, for example, ls-a, it's going to show us what's inside of these different uh, folders and we can make adjustments, you know, update it, do all kinds of different things. We can create more monitoring, we can install different uh, Git app um, system analysis monitoring things that we can do. Okay, anyways, this is how you can access the Linux server and just kind of, you know, go through it and, and, and look at different things. This is a continuation of Microsoft Azure platform. We're going to be learning new things today. In the previous video, I've talked about on how to create different virtual machines on the Microsoft Azure platform, how to create them, how to configure them, and how to monitor them for different issues. Amongst other things that I've talked about in the video, it's really good idea to actually look at that and watch that first video in order to get a really good introduction of what Microsoft Azure is. As promised in that video, I'm going to continue with the second video that will be about storage accounts, and we're going to create file shares inside of that storage accounts, and then we're going to add those file shares into our virtual machines, which are going to appear as shared drives. So if you do tech support, you're familiar with shared drives, which is something that you would add to the users a computer in order for them to access it for storage. So again, I highly recommend that you watch the previous video as an introduction so that way you can follow along. Of course, I will have a pop-up link right here on the right-hand side that you can simply follow and at the end of this video. All right, guys, that being said, please take one second to like my video. That really makes a huge difference for me. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support on this. All right, guys, let's get into it. And here we are in our home uh, page of Microsoft Azure. From here, we can click storage accounts, but another way to find storage accounts is to click on the little hamburger icon 
and just go down and select storage accounts. So let's go ahead and click storage accounts and we're going to create one. You already can see that I already have one and that's related to the fact that you got to have one in order to store your virtual machines or anything else that you create that requires taking up space or storage, right? So of course we're going to have to have, um, you know, a storage account already. But for this we're going to create a special one just for file storage. So from here we're going to click add and then we're going to create one and the reason we're creating one is related to billing mostly. So Microsoft wants to know you know what are you using things for just like we created different resource groups for our virtual machines Microsoft wants us to create a separate group for the storage accounts so it's kind of related to billing so that way they know what that is used for so that way they can bill you for it kind of similar to what we had in our virtual machines the first thing that comes up is to select our subscription and again subscription is basically the subscription that we're using for the Microsoft Azure platform a way to bill you basically just like you have for example Netflix subscription or anything else so you tell it okay I want to use this one in our case it's already selected and then here we're going to select resource group as I mentioned in the previous video every time you create a resource group which is what we've done in the previous video you want to make sure that everything else that you want it to be connected to that you want to make sure you select the same one and in the previous video we created a group called Azure Tutorial. So we're going to select that and just to kind of quickly overview why we're doing this, when you make sure that you are selecting the same resource group, you also make sure at the same time that you're putting everything on the same network. So with this way it's going to make sure that the, you know the uh, that the network connections between all those virtual machines and the storage is also working in the sense that they are on the same network it's going to reduce the fact that you may need to configure different security settings this and that it kind of puts it in the same network you will have connections to it and that way you are good to go especially when you create later on a sync uh, storage which basically what it does it creates a backup of the storage that you're uh, creating otherwise it's not going to work so you got to make sure that is in the same resource group and in our sense we're kind of concerned about the same network so that there is connectivity all right we're good there and now below we can select a uh, storage account name we can type it in we're just going to call, call it um, new storage and it doesn't like the caps so we're just going to use lower letters new storage is already taken we're going to call it new storage one all right we're going to we're going to name it something specific we're going to call it azure storage let's see if it likes that tutorial is already taken all right well let's just leave it that azure storage toot we're gonna leave it at that so uh, yeah it's very picky and uh, which is pretty common so that's good so the next thing we're looking at is performance it kind of depends on what you're looking at if you want the standard performance you can leave it at that if you want the premium you can certainly select that as well depending on your business needs but we're just going to keep it standard for the purpose of the tutorial and that's going to be fine and then we can click next here so you can see the networking but if you just leave it at default it should work fine it says here public endpoint all networks all networks meaning that all the network that you've created um, you can leave it at that and then if we click next advanced you got different things that you can adjust but as I've mentioned in my previous videos I like to keep things simple so that way it's easier to follow so we're just going to cl simply click review and create all right now it just says it that deployment is complete we can certainly click on go to resources and go to it right away but what I want to do actually real quick is make sure that at least one of my one of my virtual machines is turned on so that we after we configure our file share we can go inside of it and use PowerShell to add that um, that access to the share that we create so I'm going to click on the you know the little hamburger icon I'm going to go down to my virtual machines and I'm going to make sure that at least one of them is running and looks like my Windows Server 2009 is uh, 2019 is running which is good we're going to access that in a little bit here 
All right, I'm going to go home here. And as you noticed in our home page, it gives you access to the most recent things that you've worked on. And here's our Azure storage uh, tutorial account. We're going to click on that. So from here, we're going to click on file shares. I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not going to talk about anything else that that it isn't a topic of this video. If you have special requests, please let me know. So we're going to simply click on file shares because that's what we're creating. We're going to click a little file share button here. And on the right hand side, we're going to, it's going to ask us for a name. So we're going to type in file share drive. And then right below it, it's super simple. I really like this. It gives you the ability to add the quota. So the size of the file share. So we're just going to make it 10 gigabytes. All right, we're going to go down here. I'm going to click create. And something very cool happens once you create it. Uh, it it's very simple. It just kind of allocates you know, shared space. It's going to be super fast and it's already done. So we're going to click on that and see what's inside of that. So all right, so with our file share drive selected, what we're going to do here is add a directory. So that way there's something in there. We're going to call it uh, user storage. Storage. Going to click OK. So it's going to create just a folder called user storage. So that way, once we go in there, we're going to be able to see it once we connect to it. And we're going to click connect. We're going to pick our J drive here so that we know it comes up. Then we're going to click copy the clipboard. We're going to back to our Windows server. We have PowerShell open and we have File Explorer open. You can see that there is no shared drive named J inside of it. So we're going to paste our script in there and this is going to add, once it connects to it, it's going to add our J drive into it. So just kind of bear with me here in a moment. Uh, the virtual machine is kind of running slow. I'm not sure what's going on, but it will add it there eventually. So once it's done, I will show you that it did it. All right, so you saw that it was uh, waiting for response, waiting for connection, and then verified the credentials, and then you can see that it added that uh, J file share drive into here, and then it came up in our file explorer right here, and it says, you can see that it says here 10 gigabytes. And if we go inside of it, we should be able to see that directory that we created. And from here, we can literally just put anything we want that we can create. I don't know. Let's create a document. Test. Doc. All right. And then once we get out of it, in order to do this administration of it, if we go inside of user directory, we can see that test document that it came up. So as one of the last things I kind of wanted to show you that is really cool about these storage accounts is that you can actually monitor them just like those virtual machines that I showed you before. So let's go on back to it. And then if you scroll down, we selected that our Azure Storage Toot here. If you scroll down, you can, you know, monitor the uh, its usage. So you can, just like with the virtual machines, you can monitor different usage and access at specific times and periods. All right. So, why am I teaching you this? Uh, well, obviously, so you can learn how to use it and how to administer Azure storage accounts. But there is another reason for implementing this type of shared drive is that, you know, you can simply take that script if you want people to connect to it. And um, you can create that script. You can pass it on to people manually or... You can create the script and set it up in Active Directory for a for a certain group of people um, that work. For example, let's say you're in a business environment. There are five different groups. So let's say there is collections department. Let's say there is accounting department. Let's say there is a uh, I don't know some kind of a tech department, and they all are going to be in different groups in Active Directory. Well, you can set up a script, what they call a post logon script that will add these type of shared drives to them automatically upon login. So you can use this script, you can implement it within Actor Directory to run it for that specific group or even specific user if you want. But let's stick to the group. So let's say you want all you know, collections departments to have access to the specific storage that you've just created. So the way you would add it into Actor Directory, you would set up the script, it's very simple. And um, 
every time they log in, it's going to run that script and make sure that they have that drive added. I mean, you can certainly you can specify it in different ways. You don't have to use this specific script, but this is an option, and um, it would just happen. They would get this storage attached. They don't have to worry about trying to add it, the network drive or the share drive themselves. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Uh, again, if you want to check out my intro, I highly recommend that. Thank you so much for watching. Please take a moment to like, share, and leave any comments that you may have. Thank you for watching, and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. This is a continuation of Microsoft Azure platform. We're going to be learning new things today. In the previous video, I've talked about on how to create different virtual machines on the Microsoft Azure platform, how to create them, how to configure them, and how to monitor them for different issues. Amongst other things that I've talked about in the video, it's really good idea to actually look at that and watch that first video in order to get a really good introduction of what Microsoft Azure is. As promised in that video, I'm going to continue with the second video that will be about storage accounts, and we're going to create file shares inside of that storage accounts, and then we're going to add those file shares into our virtual machines, which are going to appear as shared drives. So if you do tech support, you're familiar with shared drives, which is something that you would add to the user's a computer in order for them to access it for storage. So again, I highly recommend that you watch the previous video as an introduction so that way you can follow along. Of course, I will have a pop-up link right here on the right-hand side that you can simply follow and at the end of this video. All right, guys, that being said, please take one second to like my video. That really makes a huge difference for me. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support on this. All right, guys, let's get into it. And here we are in our home uh, page of Microsoft Azure. From here, we can click storage accounts, but another way to find storage account is to click on the little hamburger icon and just go down and select storage accounts. So let's go ahead and click storage accounts, and we're going to create one. You already can see that I already have one, and that's related to the fact that you got to have one in order to store your virtual machines or anything else that you create that requires taking up space or storage, right? So, of course, we're going to have to have, um, you know, a storage account already. But for this, we're going to create a special one just for file storage. So, from here, we're going to click Add, and then we're going to create one. And the reason we're creating one is related to billing mostly. So, Microsoft wants to know you know, what are you using things for? Just like we created different resource groups for our virtual machines, Microsoft wants us to create a separate group for the storage accounts. So it's kind of related to billing, so that way they know what that is used for, so that way they can bill you for it. Kind of similar to what we had in our virtual machines, the first thing that comes up is to select our subscription. And again, subscription is basically the subscription that we're using for the Microsoft Azure platform, a way to bill you, basically, just like you have, for example, Netflix subscription or anything else. So you tell it, okay, I want to use this one. In our case, it's already selected. And then here we're going to select a resource group. As I mentioned in the previous video, every time you create a resource group, which is what we've done in the previous video, you want to make sure that everything else that you want it to be connected to that, you want to make sure you select the same one. And in the previous video, we created a group called Azure Tutorial. So we're going to select that. And just to kind of quickly overview why we're doing this, when you make sure that you are selecting the same resource group, you also make sure at the same time that you're putting everything on the same network. So with this way, it's going to make sure that the, you know, the, uh, that the network connections between all those virtual machines and the storage is also working in the sense that they are on the same network. It's going to reduce the fact that you may need to configure different security settings, this and that. It kind of puts it in the same network. You will have connections to it, and that way you are good to go, especially when you create later on a sync uh, storage, which basically what it does, it creates a backup of the storage that you're uh, creating. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So you got to make sure that it is in the same resource group. And in our sense, we're kind of concerned about the same network so that there is connectivity. 
All right, we're good there. And now below we can select a storage account name. We can type it in. We're just going to call, call it um, new storage. And it doesn't like the caps, so we're just going to use lower letters. New storage is already taken. We're going to call it new storage one. All right, we're going to we're going to name it something specific. We're going to call it Azure Storage. Let's see if it likes that tutorial. Is already taken. All right. Well, let's just leave it that Azure Storage Tut. We're going to leave it at that. So, uh, yeah, it's very picky, and uh, which is pretty common. So that's good. So the next thing we're looking at is performance. It kind of depends on what you're looking at. If you want the standard performance, you can leave it at that. If you want the premium, you can certainly select that as well, depending on your business needs. But we're just going to keep it standard for the purpose of the tutorial, and that's going to be fine. And then we can click next here so you can see the networking. But if you just leave it at default, it should work fine. It says here, public endpoint, all networks. All networks, meaning that all the network that you've created, um, you can leave it at that. And then if we click next advanced, you got different things that you can adjust. But as I've mentioned in my previous videos, I like to keep things simple so that way it's easier to follow. So we're just going to cl simply click review and create. All right, now it just says it that deployment is complete. We can certainly click on go to resources and go to it right away. But what I want to do actually real quick is make sure that at least one of my one of my virtual machines is turned on so that we after we configure our file share, we can go inside of it and use PowerShell to add that um, add access to the share that we create. So I'm going to click on the you know, the little hamburger icon. I'm going to go down to my virtual machines and I'm going to make sure that at least one of them is running and looks like my Windows Server 2009 is uh, 2019 is running, which is good. We're going to access that in a little bit here. All right, I'm going to go home here. And as you noticed in our home page, it gives you access to the most recent things that you've worked on. And here is our Azure storage uh, tutorial account. We're going to click on that. So from here, we're going to click on file shares. I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not going to talk about anything else that, that it isn't a topic of this video. If you have special requests, please let me know. So we're going to simply click on file shares because that's what we're creating. We're going to click a little file share button here. And on the right hand side, we're going to, it's going to ask us for our name. So we're going to type in file share drive. And then right below it, it's super simple. I really like this. It gives you the ability to add the quota. So the size of the file share. So we're just going to make it 10 gigabytes. All right. We're going to go down here. I'm going to click create. And something very cool happens once you create it. Uh, it it's very simple. It just kind of allocates you know, shared space. It's going to be super fast and it's already done. So we're going to click on that and see what's inside of that. So all right, so with our file share drive selected, what we're going to do here is add a directory. So that way there's something in there. We're going to call it uh, user storage storage. I'm going to click OK. So it's going to create just a folder called user storage. So that way, once we go in there, we're going to be able to see it once we connect to it. And we're going to click connect. We're going to pick our J drive here so that we know it comes up. Then we're going to click copy the clipboard. We're going to back to our Windows server. We have PowerShell open and we have File Explorer open. You can see that there's no shared drive named J inside of it. So we're going to paste our script in there and this is going to add, once it connects to it, it's going to add our J drive into it. So just kind of bear with me here in a moment. Uh, the virtual machine is kind of running slow. I'm not sure what's going on, but it will add it there eventually. So once it's done, I will show you that it did it. All right. So you saw that it was uh, waiting for response, waiting for connection, and then verified the credentials. And then you can see that it added that uh, J file share drive into here. And then it came up in our file explorer right here. And it says, see, you can see that it says here 10 gigabytes. 
And if we go inside of it, we should be able to see that directory that we created. And from here, we can literally just put anything we want that we can create. I don't know. Let's create a document. Test. Doc. All right. And then once we get out of it, in order to do this administration of it, if we go inside of user directory, we can see that test document that it came up. So as one of the last things I kind of wanted to show you that is really cool about these storage accounts is that you can actually monitor them just like those virtual machines that I showed you before. So let's go on back to it. And then if you scroll down, we selected that our Azure storage toot here. If you scroll down, you can, you know, monitor the uh, its usage. So you can, just like with the virtual machines, you can monitor different usage and access at specific times and periods. All right. So, why am I teaching you this? Uh, well, obviously, so you can learn how to use it and how to administer Azure storage accounts. But there is another reason for implementing this type of shared drive is that, you know, you can simply take that script if you want people to connect to it. And um, you can create that script. You can pass it on to people manually or you can create the script and set it up in Active Directory for a for a certain group of people um, that work. For example, let's say you're in a business environment. There are five different groups. So let's say there is collections department. Let's say there is accounting department. Let's say there is a uh, I don't know some kind of a tech department, and they all are going to be in different groups in Active Directory. Well, you can set up a script, what they call a post logon script that will add these type of shared drives to them automatically upon login. So you can use this script, you can implement it within Active Directory to run it for that specific group or even specific user if you want. But let's stick to the group. So let's say you want all you know, collections departments to have access to the specific storage that you've just created. So the way you would add it into Active Directory, you would set up the script, it's very simple. And um, every time they log in, it's going to run that script and make sure that they have that drive added. I mean, you can certainly you can specify it in different ways. You don't have to use this specific script, but this is an option. And um, it would just happen. They would get this storage attached. They don't have to worry about trying to add it, the network drive or the share drive themselves. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Uh, again, if you want to check out my intro, I highly recommend that. Thank you so much for watching. Please take a moment to like, share, and leave any comments that you may have. Thank you for watching, and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we have introduction to Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure is a web-based or a cloud-based platform, if you will, that allows you to deploy different type of applications using Microsoft's service or Microsoft's processing power. So just imagine a bunch of different locations all around the world that have server rooms inside of them. All of those servers you are able to access through the Microsoft Azure and set up or deploy any application that you may even think of. And I'll show you, there are so many options that you can use. So without getting into too much of a detail, I will go ahead and show you on how to do certain things when it comes to Microsoft Azure and the things that are kind of related mostly to administration of the Azure web uh, interfaces and whatnot. There are so many different things that you can go through and I will show you step by step on how to do this, whether it's deploying certain applications or running different services. I will show you from the beginning to the end for each video so that way there is no confusion. Friends, if you like this type of content, please take one second to like the but to click the like button. I really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference for me. All right. So before you can get started, uh, you have to create an Azure account and have a Microsoft account. But before you can activate your Azure account or have full access to it, you need to provide identity, verif identity verification and they want or require a credit card for you to use to verify your identity. And if they give you $200. Uh, in, in credits in, uh, for first 30 days to use for all the testing that you want to do or deploy any type of services. And after that, I believe it's free for 12 months, but it um, I'm not sure what the limitations are after that, but if you want to you know go in there and set up an account for 
you know, testing purposes, for learning purposes, you would need a credit card to get going. They don't charge you, as far as I know, maybe charge like a dollar just to, you know, kind of make sure that you are that, per, you know, the person that holds that credit card. Anyways, I don't want to get into that. That's not what this video is about. We are here to learn about Microsoft Azure. All right, so let's go ahead and have a quick look at how it looks like. This is me logged in into Microsoft Azure, and there are a couple of things that you notice first. This is the home page, and typically in the home page, what you see is different uh, applications or things you've installed recently, and that would be under recent uh, resources. Above here, you have Azure services, and from here, you simply select a service that you want to deploy. And don't worry, I'm not going to confuse you with any of this, but I just kind of want to show you what's there available. And I'm going to click on more services as I did over there, just to show you that there is a massive amount of different things you can learn. Here are some examples. Here are the categories. Uh, there are general, there are networking, storage, web, uh, you know, there's uh, analytics, there is even AI machine learning, there is uh, mixed reality security monitoring all kinds of different things you can learn so if i expand this even further to see all services you can see that there is just a massive amount of different things you can learn so that being said if you want me to talk about specific things that you want to learn when it comes to microsoft azure please let me know in the comment box below because i really you know it's, it's kind of hard to come up with topics especially when there are so many things to talk about so you know, there's no point of me doing a video on everything that you see here if, if there is not enough interest. So if there's enough enough, if there's enough interest for a specific topic, please let me know in the comments below. However, that being said, in the first two videos, we're going to concentrate on creating some virtual machines that I will show you how to access, how to monitor, and how to configure. And after that, the second video will be about uh, file storage and storage containers and how you can install them and run them using scripts through the PowerShell. All right. I hope I hope you're still with me because I promise it's not going to be uh, confusing or uh, super complex or anything like that. This is just a brief introduction to Microsoft Azure of the things that I will be uh, looking to show you. All right, so now that we're done with the brief introduction, we're going to start from scratch. So in order to start from scratch, we have to start with a resource group. So what the resource group is, and here you can see it right here, resource group is, you can think of it as a container that will have all the services, all the applications that you run in that one spot. So it's a form of, um, it's a way to organize everything in one place in order for things to function and of course things to be built properly because these are web services that you pay for typically and if you want to especially keep them running you're going to want to, you're going to have to pay to Microsoft to run all these services. For example, let's say you want to install a web server and you want to deploy virtual machines and run Apache on it, you're going to have to, you know, they want to know uh, they, they, they need to have a way to kind of keep track of all of that. So that's what the resource group is. So I'm going to click on that and we're going to create a new one. You can see there are three different ones that I've created here. But let's go ahead and create one from a scratch. Again, this is just uh, basically, it, think of like creating a package of some sort. And the, for the package, you need that outside shell or outside box. So right now we're creating the box for our... Uh, services that we're going to run. So this is going to be outside of it. No labels on it yet or anything like that, but we're going to uh, start creating that right now. The first thing that asks here is a subscription. And again, that kind of ties in into what thing I was saying about them, you know, charging you. In my case, um, I'm using the Azure subscription one. So this is just a way of you know, a subscription, you know, if you will, just like a Netflix subscription, you would just kind of pick the subscription that you have currently right now. And this is the free one that I'm using right now. There are $200 in credits available for it. So I'm going to click that so that way, um, you know, th th that's simply it is. You just kind of tell it, I want to use this subscription. And anything that's inside of this resource group is going to be charged under that subscription. This is incredibly important to know. So that way you know what you're uh, getting into and where the charges are coming from as well. All right. And then we're going to name this new resource group. So we're going to name it something that is appropriate for this tutorial. And we're going to just name it um, Azure Tutorial. We're going to name it that. Resource 
Next thing is resource details. This is also incredibly important. You want to make sure that everything that you deploy is in the same region. And you can see if you expand this that there are so many different regions. You got East, uh, US, um, US East, I should say, and then Europe North, uh, US Central, Africa, Asia, Canada, and you know, a bunch of different ones. I'm going to stick to US Central. So everything that I create in this has to be in the same region. Think about networking in a sense, especially if you, when you're trying to sync different services with one another, you want them to be in the same region, otherwise they may not work properly. Okay, now just keep that in mind. I'm going to click Review and Create, and after that I'm just going to click Create. So here is our box, guys. This is the box that we've created, and now we're going to um, add more things to that box and the first thing we're going to do is create a virtual machine The reason I wanted to start with virtual machines is because most people are familiar with that especially if you're a system administrator of sort and uh, you know, it's kind of simple to um, Configure and install and most people understand what that is because it's you know most of the time It's just a you know operating system that you are familiar with All right now the, the way I'm going to add a virtual machine. I'm going to click on this little hamburger uh, icon here so I can have an expanded menu. And from here, we can also select different services, not just from home. This is where we were at initially, but you can also select some of the serve, you know, from the left hand side. This is what I like to use for quick access. So I'm going to go down and simply just select a virtual machine. I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to click on here to create a virtual machine. And then we're going to create, I'd say about three different ones, just to show you. So we're going to, here we are in a, in a familiar window that we've seen earlier. Again, we have to, you know, make sure that we have the uh, proper subscription selected. This is, you know, again, we're, this is how they're going to charge us for the service. And again, we have resource group. And remember the one we created here? We can just simply select that we're going to select our Azure tutorial. This is our group. And then we're going to name our virtual machine. So let's see, what's the most common operating system that people are using right now? And that would be Windows, right? So let's go ahead and type in Windows 10 VM. We're going to create one of those. And luckily our region is automatically populated. So we, you know, we just have to make sure it is that and it is indeed central US. So it does memorize that, which is really good. And then uh, I'm not going to talk about infrastructure redundancy. I'm, I'm just going to leave it like that. It's just a you know virtual machine. And then here for the image, by the way, you can use your own image if you'd like. It says here browse all public and private images. That's just a you know a bunch of different things that they have available. But from my understand, you can use your own image as well. But we're just going to use what they have here pre-built for now. And then we're going to select Windows 10 and we're going to go with Windows 10 Pro version 1809, which is a little bit behind. Uh, the current version is 1909, I believe, but that doesn't matter. Uh, we can certainly update that later if, if needed. But for now, you know, we want to, uh, we're just going to select that. And here it is our size. Size, but that means what it is, is just the type of uh, CPU and RAM and system resources we want to use for this virtual machine. And here it gives you an idea of what two virtual CPUs uh, cost with seven gigabytes of memory. And it's $183 a month. So we're going to click change. And we're going to select a different option that's going to be more affordable. In, this, in the change window, we have all kinds of different uh, options. And as soon as the loss loads here, here it is in costs a month, we can select something that's a bit more affordable. And uh, for that, I'm going to just click this first one, which is just two gigs of RAM, one virtual CPU, and that's going to be good enough for our testing purposes, of course, testing purposes only. And I do, again, I have that $200 credit, but, you know, I'm just going to show this in case, uh, uh, in case there's some confusion about billing or whatnot. Anyways, so I'm going to choose one, and here you see how it says $47 a month. This is estimated usage. A lot of times, and I'm not 100% sure if it the case is with Azure, but I use a Google services for a Google Cloud services for my website. They will a lot of times give you different discounts. So, you know, 
I'm not sure if that's 100% the case with Azure, but I, I suspect it is. It is just depending on what kind of a you know thing you're using uh, their services for. And of course, you can use you know the cheap one, which is here eight dollars a month. But this is incredibly slow, so I wouldn't even um, worry about that too much. Um, if you look at it closely, it gives you kind of a, a, a limits and how much storage you have. You can certainly look at those things uh, on your own, and it's going to be uh, dependent on your personal preferences or what what kind of a you know system that you need. Uh, but I'm just going to use it, you know, this general purpose one. I'm going to leave it at that, and then I'm going to click select. All right. Now we have our virtual machine set up this is our this is going to be our settings for it so the next thing we have is creating an administrator account so that we can log into it uh, and we're going to log into it using remote desktop this is pretty cool that they have it set up so i'm going to type in kobuman and i'm going to type in my password they really want a super long password which is perfectly okay so i'm going to type it in type it in twice all right, and here, uh, here are the inbound rules. Select which virtual machine networks, uh, network ports are accessible from the public internet. You can specify more limit or gradual network access to the network tab. So I'm going to leave it uh, at RDP, so that way we can use RDP. So I'm just going to leave it at that. And then here it says save money, already have Windows Enterprise. So they're asking you about the license, whether you have a license or not. Uh, this is something you know, if, if you're seriously going to run this, you can look into later, but for now, it's just going to let us install it. So I'm just going to click review and create. And um, as soon as it approves the deployment, we're going to click create deployment. And after that, we're going to um, create a couple of more virtual machines. So here's our overview of the things we've selected. By clicking create, you basically you know agree to the terms of service, this and that, blah 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 blah. If you're interested in more details for that, you can certainly um, you can certainly uh, take a look for yourself. Again, we're just kind of trying to keep this as simple as possible, and then depending on what we want to do with this, we can kind of look at the more details later. Okay. Now, once we create this, as you can see, it's initializing deployment. It's going to start to deploying it. What happens, it actually creates a virtual network automatically for you, and it places this machine into a virtual network for you, for, for your uh, container that we kind of talked about. So now, like kind of going back, that uh, resource um, that, um, container that we created is that box that we have. Now we're starting to put things inside of this box. So everything that's inside of this box is the network that everything's going to be um, on and you know again we kind of made sure that we picked US Central in our case so everything that we put in there is going to be inside of that one box and everything is going to be connected and attached to itself all right so the deployment is underway so we can actually get out of this window and proceed to create a couple of more virtual machines so let's go ahead and do that we're going to create a virtual machine uh, server so I'm going to create a new one I'm going to click on there and you can see it's processing over here and that's perfectly fine we already told it go ahead and do this and it already has its settings and it's just doing its thing in the background we're going to do the same thing for uh, let's see here we're going to just pick a server we're going to uh, I think I want to do 2019 uh, so again we're going to do resource group we're going to select Azure tutorial and I'm going to name it Windows serve 2019 VM make sure it's US Central and I'm going to select Windows Server 2019 data center I'm going to go back here and change to our standard if available we're going to standard uh, type of CPU processing it's this one that's the first one I'm going to select that and again, if you're creating a server and you needed to do a certain uh, um, amount of processing, you can certainly change this at any time, even after you deploy it. So you can stop the service and later on change these settings on any of these virtual machines. We're going to create our you know, administrator password and login. Just a moment here. I'm trying to remember there are thousands of passwords that I have 
for a bunch of different things. Trying to get a unique password for everything is a bit difficult. So again, we're going to leave the RDP open so that way we can access it. And I'm going to click review and create. And uh, yes, you can go. Um, you can go into more detail and specify the type of uh, things you want on it. What does it say? It errored out. Required information is missing. What did we miss? basics oh <laughs> I made it too long the name of the virtual machine all right anyways we're going to click review and create so yeah you can go in there and specify the disk sizes and which network you want to use but again this is going to automatically put it into uh, the same the network that you need to but if you want to go in and specify disks you can go in there and specify type of disk you want if you want the premium you can certainly do so you can add uh, attach a disk on it this is all virtually uh, you know you, you can virtually do this in, in any type of uh, uh, virtual machine that you set up and then if you go to networking you can specify the network but Again, it's automatically going to put you into the correct network, so I'm not too worried about that. And there are some other things you can, you know, check and, and adjust. But again, I want to keep this very simple so that anybody can get this going on their own. All right. So review and create. Now it should let us, uh, it should approve the deployment of it once uh, it thinks about it a little bit here. And then we're going to click, click create, excuse me, and then we're going to deploy this machine as well it may take a little time you know these are not the fastest when it comes to uh, when it comes to creating virtual machines but it is pretty I should say it's pretty common to have this type of a uh, thing happening whenever you're using Google no I say Google because I use Google uh, quite often but um, when you use uh, cloud services of this sort but you know you know, I digress. Uh, it is pretty fast, uh, considering that it installs an operating system on a virtual machine. Okay, let's see what our process or what our status is. It's still deploying the first one. Let's see here. Now you can see right here that uh, once I clicked on the little bell that I have $197 in credit remaining. I'm just going to leave it here for in this window for a minute and you can see here what it's kind of doing when it's deploying it's creating that you know the virtual machines and then it's reserving an IP address for it as well and it's kind of uh, telling you that it is putting it in the correct network all right let me see here you know what let's go ahead and, and do another virtual machine but this time we're going to do a Linux machine and uh, yeah, this the first one is still creating. While we do that, I'm going to execute the other one. I uh, execute the uh, deployment of our third virtual machine, which is going to be Linux. So here we are again, resource group. We're going to make sure we check check uh, Azure tutorials, and I'm going to type in Linux for the name of this virtual machine, and I'm going to actually label it Ubuntu because I'm going to select Ubuntu. Region is U.S. Central again. And then we're going, just going to leave it here on Ubuntu server 18.04. And again, you have, you know, different options for different types of Linuxes. And I'm going to go back here and select our standard type of machine for Linux. And I certainly don't want to use the slowest one. Yep, that's the one. I'm going to select that. And um, when it comes to... Ubuntu or Linux. There are a couple of different ways you can access it. You can use SSH public key. So this is kind of confusing and this is another topic that you we would have to talk about and explain. But it's just a different way of encrypt, uh, encryption access that you can use and then use that a, a key to access it. But that's confusing. I don't want to um, talk about that. I'm just going to keep it to simple username and password just like we have on the other one just to keep it simple and the reason I'm doing this guys is because I have people who are new to computers that watch my content uh, you know it's I can talk about SSH public keys and and this and that but 
let's let's keep it simple guys I'm just gonna keep it simple so here we can change it uh, different sendings for the inbound ports uh, by the way if you are going to run a web server here you can select to have it open for those as well here this will allow all IP addresses to access your virtual machine now if you're going to use this type of uh, uh, setup you don't have to if you don't want to typically you would just leave the SSH because you don't want to keep yourself you know get you know open yourself up for the intrusion once you set up a web server you'll have a way to access it um, through the web server interface so you don't necessarily have to have these HTTPS open at this time at all so you can leave just SSH because that's typically how you would access a Linux server because it's a command line anyways so uh, we just kind of leave it at SSH and, and for that um, once you deploy a web server for example you can block access to SSH externally there are different ways of doing it you can use it um, to uh, you can use a configuration on the server itself to block access to SSH ports but again we're going to uh, just kind of leave it at that for now I'm going to click review and create and then once it approves our deployment we're going to click create so keep it moving otherwise this video would have been God knows how long if I kept talking about every detail of things and it would be confusing as well okay let's see I'm just waiting for this window to go to the next window to kind of uh, confirm to me that it's submitted for deployment and hopefully hopefully our Windows 10 the first virtual machine is deployed already now I'm just kind of checking to see if everything is going right okay good good your deployment is underway all right so I'm gonna go back home I'm going to click on home you can go go back to home and see the things that we've touched on recently and uh, it takes a while to update actually right here it takes a bit to update but this is what would have show up typically of the new things that we've touched on or created or adjusted and it also does that in the dashboard if we go to the dashboard okay good we got a message here that deployment succeeded for one of our virtual machines we're going to check that here in a minute but you know what let's let's pin it to dashboard because I wanted to go to dashboard anyways that was my next I'm going to pin it to dashboard so let's see what that is so next thing under home here is dashboard so we're going to click on dashboard to see what's there all right looks like our Windows server is deployed oh, where's our Windows 10 that's kind of weird didn't we have Windows 10 machine deployed as well did that succeed or not uh, all right well let's go to resources I'm going to click on go to resources Windows Server 2019 oh this already deployed but not the Windows 10 that I asked for okay well let's go to our virtual machines again and see if it's there oh it's still creating it that's interesting so Windows Server 2019 actually deployed faster than Windows 10 it's still creating it huh that's very interesting anyways let's go ahead and see the overview of Windows Server 2019 so again we are on virtual machines and it, this will show you all the other ones that we created as well so we're missing a Linux here which is still being created and it takes a while to refresh to see so we're going to click on Windows Server because supposedly that one is already deployed we can see our public IP address of it and we can here connect to it but I kind of wanted to show you overview of it in the sense to see what is there for you to actually look at besides just regular information that is there I mean yeah sure you can see the IP address on it you can see the subscription subscription ID you know computer name if available uh, but you know in and then type of uh, type of um, CPU that you're running and this and that and you should be able to change this once you click stop and th that's a topic for another video but right now I wanted to show you what is kind of important as an Azure administrator and that is monitoring now you can see that there are four different uh, four different graphs here and that are kind of the reason there are four and these specific ones because there is are kind of the most important ones that you would want to look at first one is being CPU average this is the usage of your CPU 
And the next one is network usage, disk bytes, which involves read and write bytes at any given time. You can see it's it gives you how much on the left column here, and on the bottom it tells you the time of it. And also it gives you disk, disk read and disk write in bytes. And uh, then on the other one, on the other one here, over here next to it, it says disk operations per second on average, and it gives you different times. The reason this is important to have is that if you suspect something suspicious going on, for example, let's say you're running a website or a web server, or you suspect attack on your server, you can look at the different times and this different CPU usage, different um, different uh, operations on it that are happening at certain times. And uh, this doesn't give us a good example here because it's a brand new one. But let's go ahead and connect to it and we're going to do some stuff on it. So that way it's going to give us some data here which we can get back to and I can kind of talk about it a little bit more. Because right now it doesn't really give us enough for me to talk about. So let's go ahead and click connect here. And we're going to select RDP. All right. So what this does, it's going to download an RDP uh, file for us that we can just simply click and use it just a regular you know windows remote desktop uh, remote desktop protocol so we're going to click on that and it's going to save it i'm just trying to check in okay you don't see the pop-up but there's actually a pop-up that says uh, do you want to save this file or just open it i'm going to click open it i'm going to click connect i apologize you guys don't see the login on this recording but it is there so what i'm doing is just typing in the password and the login that i showed you before that i've set up upon the creation of this and i'm going to click ok i will show you the the uh whatchamacallit the remote desktop as well as soon as i get it going here okay just a moment please bear with me I just need to add a different source, window capture. I need to capture that window just a moment. Please bear with me. Here we go, remote desktop. Here we are. All right. There you guys. There you go. I hope you can see it. It's loading right now. I'm going to let's see here. Hope it doesn't break the. The stupid recording window software is not is not being good to me. All right, looks like it's showing the RDP there, and it's creating it. You know the typical thing: the first time you log in, it's going to create your local profile, and it's going to take a bit to load. It's you know th this is very typical. Uh, you just kind of have to wait for it to start and get going and here it is finally coming up so this is our windows server machine pretty soon we're going to see that windows server setup configuration there and then it's just like using a you know regular windows server machine you is if you were there you guys know what remote desktop is but then again you have this goes to show you that you have full access to it Okay, now I'm going to go back to that overview and kind of look at those graphs with you and tell you kind of for the things to, to kind of look for when it comes to monitoring this type of a system. And then I'm going to show you the other machines as well, depending how long this takes. And see, here it is. Here's that typical thing where it asks you to, do you want to allow this PC to be discoverable? And we're going to click yes. For that. So there you go. This is typically what happens or what you see when you install Windows Server. And uh, I'm just going to minimize this and go back to our Azure window. Okay, there we are. Okay, so we're going to click on Overview again just so you can see all the things that are be that are happening on the window uh, on the um, Windows uh, 2019 server. So since we've logged into it, we saw more activity. Now we can see that at this time, which is at 12:13 p.m., we can see that there is more CPU activity. As a matter of fact, they spiked to almost 100%. And at the same time, you can see that it kind of 
uh, moves the other uh, diagrams or uh, graphs at the same time so that way you can see what is going on at the same time so it kind of aligns it for you and now now you can see there is more read and write which is pretty normal it gives you the disk reads down here where it says 137 megabytes and then disk writes are 483 megabytes so this is happening as we are creating our local profile and at the same time we see some network activity and that is you know it says windows server is network in total is 147 megabytes and network out total is uh, let's see it's still happening it's at 1.27 megabytes so it downloaded 147 megabytes of data and it uploaded 100, uh, 1 megabyte uh, 1.27 megabytes and then it, we get di more disk operations so why is this important why am i telling you about this if you suspect somebody hacking in to your system you might want to kind of look at the spikes in the graph otherwise you'll be just normal or just a little jagged like this normally this is pretty normal operation just kind of idling but when it comes to huge spikes like this you want to kind of look at this and see what is happening now if it's just a web server and you see increase in traffic you know people using your website and you see a spike like this but then you look at your other monitoring tools for the live traffic of people coming through and you see a spike on your server that's not normal right but if you suddenly see a spike at a certain time then you might want to see if there is some kind of a you know attack on your server or whatnot or if there's some kind of a you know who knows maybe even a virus happening on your computer if you have abnormal disk reads a bytes or cpu usage all right so the next thing i'm going to do is look at other things that are here under the overview there are a bunch of different things here that we can look at that help you deal with this type of stuff and things that you can change so if you click for example on networking here under settings you can look at the network settings of it and gives you more information on it you can add inbound port rules if you want to open up uh, you know uh, different uh, ports or not you can at the same time you can disable one so here's our rdp here and we can disable it if we want so if you're occasionally accessing this windows server using the rdp you might want to delete it so that way you're you know you're more protected nobody can really you know try to access it afterwards and then same thing uh, when it comes to disks if you click on disks here um, you can you know make changes to it if you'd like uh, a lot of times we have to stop the um, the service from running I'm not exactly sure if that's the case here with the Azure systems. Uh, we can certainly try that. And then we got a bunch of different monitoring uh, things that we can look at. So one of the things that I showed you there are those graphs. And there is a different way to look at that as well. If you want to more customize and cleaner way of doing it. If you click on the little hamburger thing, uh, sign, you can go down here and select monitor. And you can look at uh, monitoring uh, metrics of it so if you click here explore metrics you can add different graphs that you can look at again I don't want to confuse you too much with this again this is just another way of looking at the same thing except in a more detailed manner where you can make adjustments and change the different metrics that you want to look at and here's a, just a real quick if we click here on the scope this allows you to select our resource so if we select our Azure subscription one we know this is where our resource group is at and then we can click Azure tutorial and then we're going to look down here for our server and for some reason it's not scrolling down but that's okay no problem we know that we have that service and to click on resource type I'm going to uncheck select all I'm going to just click virtual machines because that's the only thing I want to look at for now and I'm going to close that and now it's going to come up and say well you have three virtual machines which ones do you want to monitor I'm going to click I'm going to click Windows Server 2019 I'm going to select that and now it's asking me to select a metric so we can kind of replicate to you know what we've seen previously we can kind of select I don't know let's see disk read operations per second uh, we had that over there and then the graph is going to come up and show us you can see here and uh, there's that then we can you know add more to it or we can add another metric and uh, in a way where we can just select what was the other one network out total let's see where's our network network in total I should say and there was an out as well and it gives you that and it those they give you kind of side by side but if you want them to you know uh, kind of stack on top of each other you can certainly do that as well I'm just gonna move it to the right here to move the timeline but again 
there's not much going on right now so there really isn't much to look at and let me just try one more here CPU there's I want to look for the uh, CPU one percentage CPU here we go average okay and it gives you see it's it's just not enough for us to kind of visualize anyways the machine is just too new for us to actually for this to work properly because it hasn't even replicated completely we know there's a lot more going on it's just that it takes time and these things kind of take time to replicate for you to use this properly but anyways it's all here it's just a different way of looking at it and if you want to get a more de you know in-depth analysis of what's going on with the usage of that machine you can certainly do that all right let's go to other virtual machines uh, we can look at Windows 10, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I went ahead and stopped it early. I don't know if you guys seen that, but I went ahead and stopped it from working. But it's because the way I access it is the same as Windows Server 2019. I just wanted to show you that you can deploy that. Let's go ahead and click our Linux Ubuntu machine. The way you can connect to this is if you click on the connect, you can use SSH, you can use RDP. But if we click on RDP, you can see that we have to install certain things on our computer in order to access this. This is not going to actually work. So if I click download RDP, it's not going to actually let me work to it. Typically you would, um, and it's closed. We know that the port is closed anyways. So uh, we can choose to connect with SSH with the key thing, this and that, but you know, I don't, I don't want to do that. There's an easiest way to connect to this. And if you scroll down under this, all the way down, there is a thing called serial console. So if we click on that, it will give us the same access as if it was SSH, I believe. Now, uh, it's going to ask us for our password so we can actually have access to our console. But once we go in there, uh, it's just the easier way to accessing it. As soon as it comes up here, it's going to ask us for our password and we're going to be able to, you know, browse it. Uh, it's just that, you know, once you, the way, the only difference is that it's it's not a pop out the window you know and for me it actually works out for me to show you like this and uh, okay log in I'm going to type in my login name and I'm going to type in my password I'm gonna hit enter and as soon as it thinks about it we will have access and there it is we have full access to this server so if we do for example ls a it's going to show us what's inside of these different uh, folders and we can make adjustments you know updated do all kinds of different things we can create more monitoring we can install different uh, get app um, system analysis monitoring things that we can do okay anyways this is how you can access the linux server and just kind of you know go through it and and, and look at different things but right now we're just going to show you some, uh, let's see here, CD, VR, VAR, LS. And it just kind of to show you that you can go in and browse. If you want to, you know, run something, you you know, you can just type in sudo, you know, which is super user, invoking a super user. And then, I don't know, you can just type in sudo, I don't know, VI, and this is going to create a new uh, document. This is just you know, regular document that you can create and, you know, in, you know, install on there and whatnot. And, um, yeah, so there you go, guys. This is the intro to Microsoft Azure Virtual Machines. I hope you like this video. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you like my style of teaching. I, it, this is, it's really hard to teach without being super technical. So I'm really uh, trying to, trying my best not to sound too confusing because if I was to go into Linux here and, and try to do all kinds of different things it would be way too much in just one video for a person to absorb not I'm not saying everybody because you know a lot of people are knowledgeable and that they would like to see this type of stuff but I do want to teach everybody you know at least give them some kind of confidence to get and kind of get into this type of stuff to start with and once they get into it then they can you know learn more about it on their own or you know watching or, or learning or you know from other people and this and that but the best way to 
learn is to actually get in there and, and try, you know, do things uh, on it. All right. Um, in the next video, uh, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss it. I will talk about uh, storage containers. We're going to use some scripting to add the storage containers. We're going to create some file shares and how to go in there and add them to different machines. And it's, it's pretty cool stuff, guys. All right. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin Olson and Scobo Man. In today's video we have a refresh course for help desk desktop support or tech support in general. What I do is every couple of months I would take the videos that I've made over that time and combine them into a single video that you can watch without having to go through and find these individual topics on your own. So let's see what we have. First thing, we have a real world scenario where the issue is no administrator access at local level. I will show you how to do that. I will also talk about BitLocker encryption and its use in a business environment. Third part of that is installing software through PowerShell. So it's an introduction to PowerShell and how to use it to install and uninstall different programs. It's really good to use for somebody who might be interested in that. Last part of the video talks about file association along with some Java troubleshooting. Guys, let me know if you like this type of stuff. If you have any comments, please leave them below and I'll answer them as well. And if you got a moment, please click the like button. This really makes a huge difference for my channel. I really appreciate that and I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you. And in today's video, we're going to look a real world scenario in which you may come across in tech support. In this situation, we cannot access a remote computer so we can make changes to it or fix something on it. So what happens is, we, for example, try to backdoor into it to make some changes. We would simply, you know, for example, type in uh, backslash backslash name of the computer that we're trying to access. And then we would try to hit enter and the error would be, well, you don't have administrator privileges, so you can't do anything with that. Or we are trying to remote desktop into it. And it would be the same thing. We would type in the name of the computer, hit enter, and it would say, well, you don't have administrator privileges, you can't access. So what seems to be the problem? Well, here's the thing. As tech support, you probably belong to a group, group uh, policy on the domain that has administrator privileges that's automatically applied to all the computers that belong to that domain. So in this case, what happened was is the chances are that that group policy hasn't applied to that computer locally. So let's say the name of your group on the domain. Let's just open sticky notes real quick so we can have a reference. Let's say the name of your group is IT support. You and everybody else that belongs to that group, you and everybody that belongs to this IT support group on that domain has admin access. So at this point, in order to quickly resolve this issue, instead of going through, you know, reimaging the computer, this and that, or trying to force any of these things, we can just simply add IT support group that you belong to with administrator privileges. We can add it to this computer at local level. And if you appreciate this type of content, instead of me playing an advertisement here, please take a second here and just click the like button or subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And this way, I don't have to bug you with ads. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to have a local administrator password or a local administrator login so we can make these changes locally, obviously. Uh, you need local admin uh, privileges. So what we're going to do is going to access our system with using local administrator. Now, this is one of those things that your company will provide for you. Uh, you know, if you have a good company that you work for, chances are that every computer that they have will have a backup login, which will be a local admin, local admin and will have a specific password for it. So you're going to have to find this out. You're going to have to look up the name of the computer that you're trying to troubleshoot. For example, you can see here that the name of this computer is called tech support. So you would access the database that has the passwords for the tech support, um, for, for the local admins on tech support, and then you're going to find that what that password is and what the login name for that is, and then you would log into that computer. In my case, I am logged in as administrator using this login. So 
in my case it's YT login and it has administrator privileges and it's for this computer that's called tech support and I am good to go now I can make changes to the group policy that uh, has applied to this computer all right so let's get to it now in order to do this we're going to have to open up our local group policy now this is the wrong thing to look at. A lot of people look this up and they're like, oh, well, how do I do this? Where is this at? This is the wrong thing. This is local group policy editor for the components of the window or anything that runs on this computer. So what this basically does, you would go in and, for example, allow or disallow a component of the windows or software to run. For example, it would say allow, you know, or, you know, or deny um, whatever is trying to do okay and this is not it what we want is actually called local users and groups so in order to get that we can type in lusrmgr.msc in our run command and we hit ok and it's going to open up our local users and groups here's where we are going to apply our changes so that we can go about our business and get to fixing this computer now there are roundabout ways to get this so you can get to this through the computer management as well if you go to control panel click administrative tools and then select computer management you can see that local users and groups are here as well which is the same thing as the window that we opened previously like so so it's the exact same thing you can see users and groups here it's the exact same thing as what we have on this other side so that's one way to go about it now you can apply this um, IT support group by selecting groups here and this in this left hand side so make sure you select groups not users users are just local accounts groups is what we want so we're applying a group policy to this computer and let me just expand this here so it's easier to see a little bit easier to understand because I really want to highlight the part that we're going to make changes to all right so what we're going to do is add administrators group policy to it so obviously we're going to select administrators and you can see here if you read it it says administrators have complete and unrestricted access to computer slash domain get it so IT support group belongs to a domain now we're going to add IT support to the administrators of this computer that is locally and we're going to now do that and once we do that all the administrators all the people that belong to this IT support group will have administrator privileges on this PC at that time so the way you do that is simply select add and we're going to type in IT support and then we're going to click OK and in this case it's not doing anything because I, it's not it's just a fictional uh, you know uh, group policy so what happened is we would add it and then suddenly you would see IT support a domain group policy applied to this and you simply click OK and possibly reboot the computer but it should take uh, effect immediately at this point the whole point of doing this is so that not only will you have administrative privileges on this computer now you can make any changes to it you want remotely or this and that but everybody else that belongs to that group so all the people that work with you now they don't have to go through this thing of getting local administrator login the password this and that now you can make all these changes and then everybody can just log in and that's the quickest way of doing uh, doing this now of course if the local group if the group policy hasn't been applied to this computer automatically for some reason that there may be some other issue that you may want to look at it however this is a quick fix and you can just go about your business and then you know anything else I mean there might be multiple groups that need to be applied to this it just depends in, depending on the on the system uh, of the business setup that you have where you work at it's just going to kind of vary uh, you know from business to business in today's video we're going to talk about BitLocker and its use in tech support or in a business environment if you will BitLocker is used for encrypting of your drive so for example let's say you have a computer at work chances are it will be encrypted with some kind of software typically it would be the c drive for example here so there are many types of encryption software and for example one of them is sophos 
But a lot of businesses are going towards a BitLocker because BitLocker is part of Windows operating system and it's free and it's convenient and it works well. BitLocker uses AES-256 encryption and that's another reason to use it because it's just about impossible to uh, decrypt it in basically access any data on it unless you have a key for it or direct access hardware access to it so in addition what i'm going to do is actually talk about how it's implemented in a business environment and which kind of uh, operating systems can use bit locker so for bit locker to work you have to have windows 10 Pro enterprise or educational version of Windows operating system, meaning that if you have Windows Home operating system, you will not have the option to turn on BitLocker. You need to have at least Windows 10 Professional. So that won't work if you have Windows Home. Okay, I digress. So let's move on. So let's talk about the importance of having drive encryption. So what happens is if somebody steals this computer, they can literally take this C drive here, they can take it out of the computer, and they can plug it into their computer, and they're going to slave it to their computer. It's going to kind of look like this. It may show up as local disk D, for example, and they're going to try to access it. However, if it's encrypted, they won't be able to access it at all. It would just say, well, you need the key to unlock this drive. So there's a great security feature that comes with any type of drive encryption, but this is um, also made easy with a bit locker. So if they have access to your computer, let's say they steal it, and you know, chances are that you have a password, right? Most of us have a password before they can log into their computer, so they can't get past the password. So they take the drive out and they try to slave it inside of their computer. And if you don't have encryption, they can literally just go inside of C, they can go to your documents and look up anything that's inside and have full access to it. You can see there are some important stuff in here and then we don't want them to have any access to that, especially if you have passwords that are saved, for example, in a notepad. Let's say you have a notepad that you just keep around for a password. For example, let's say you see you have your Gmail password and then you have your login, chances are, you know, Gmail login, and then you may have it saved on a, in a notepad. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you have drive encryption. So keep that in mind. If you are saving any passwords to your computer in a format as such, which is completely normal, you, if you don't have drive encryption, then you're just kind of asking for uh, data loss or somebody, you know, God forbid, you know, this is just the worst type of, you know, scenarios that somebody steals your hard drive or they can even access it um, over um, in other ways, right? So that being said, we definitely want to have our drive encrypted. In our case, why not do it? Because it's free. It's completely free with Windows operating system. So let's look at the implementation of this in a business environment. But before I proceed, I would just like to ask you to take a few seconds to click like on this video or subscribe in this case i don't have to play an advertisement for you instead of waiting 30 seconds you can just spend five seconds here and click like or subscribe i really appreciate it guys i really do thank you so much so let me show you how bitlocker is enabled if you just have a personal computer you can simply right click any of the drives and then you can select turn on bitlocker so what happens is when you click turn on bitlocker the computer itself will test the drive to see if it's compatible with BitLocker, and then it will tell you whether you can turn it on. Chances are that it will be because most drives are compatible with BitLocker encryption. So here we go. It gives you an option to save a recovery key. And again, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. A recovery key can be used to access your files and folders if you're having problems unlocking your PC. It's a good idea to have more than one and keep each in a safe place other than your PC. So this is incredibly important to save somewhere else that's not your PC. I personally, what I do is I either save it somewhere on like somewhere externally and you can, there are many options of doing this. For me personally, I have multiple copies of the bed locker and you know, you can, so here's an option. You can save it on an external USB if you really wanted to. You can save it on you can send it to your email. You can uh, just print it out if you really wanted to. Those are certainly options that you have here. And of course, you have an option here that says save to your Microsoft account. 
I don't really do that because I may lose the password to my Microsoft account. You can save it to a file. That's definitely an option. You can print the recovery key as well. We will have a look here in a moment on how you would use the recovery key as well on an encrypted drive. However, let's touch on how this is used or implemented in a business environment. So the drive would be encrypted after the computer has been imaged or re-imaged. So after the, the system used in your business it has finished installing the operating system anew, it would start to encrypt the drive with BitLocker. And at that point, whatever the system has initiated, I mean, this could be done possibly with a, you know, a, a batch script or some kind of a, a tool that initiates BitLocker and at the same time saves the file to a remote loco location. So it, that way you have access or a, a copy of that recovery key in case of a computer crash. So let's say user reports an issue where he says or he or she says, my computer crashed. And you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, this is a hardware hardware problem let's say a motherboard died or something like that and the problem is that you can't just take that drive and plug it into another computer it won't work because BitLocker knows that that drive belongs to another PC so you only the only way to do the only thing you can do here is slave the drive and let me just cancel this or no let me just move this out of the way you can slave it your drive and they would kind of show up like this like local disk D and then you would have an option, you would have a, like a lock key, and I'll show you this, and it would ask you for a recovery key. So that's the thing, it would have a copy of this key somewhere else remote, and this process would encrypt it, save it somewhere else, so in case of a crash, of a hardware failure, you would have the system or a tool, it really depends on the business setup environment, it could be just a, a file spreadsheet somewhere, we don't know. but. I digress, you would have that key and then you would look it up probably by using the host name or maybe the serial number of that computer. You would look up what the key is for that so that way you can recover user data. So let's go ahead and do it manually here so to see what happens. I'm going to save it to a file and I'm going to click here, save, and you will see a specific error. And uh, for, for this here, I'm just going to leave the BitLock recovery key as it is. So that way, I don't, need to, I don't need to change it to anything. It's self-explanatory. I already know what it is. But I want to show you what happens if I was just to click Save here. And you can see right away that the BitLocker wizard here says, you can't save to this PC. Please choose uh, another location. So let's go ahead and try desktop. I'm going to click Save. Again, says this location can't be used. Your recovery can't be saved to an encrypted drive. Choose a different location. You see how everything kind of comes back to this to have a remote somewhere else recovery key located so that way you don't so that way you can recover the data right in case of a crash or anything like that i mean as far as i know you may like you may forget a password for your drive and then you can recover it with a recovery key as long as you remember to keep a key somewhere safe that you know to look for it okay so let's go ahead and save it to another drive I'm going to try to see if I can save it to this other drive that is not encrypted. So I'm just going to leave it at D here. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it BitLocker Keys. And I'm going to go inside of that and then I'm going to save it as so. So let's go back in here and make sure that we do have that bit locker key where's our thing bit locker keys and here's our file if we look inside of it here are our keys here's the recovery key here's the identifier for it and that's you can see that that's reflected in the file name as well and uh, here is our recovery key in case of a crash so you can see that the recovery key in this case is just a combination of different uh, of uh, numbers uh, with dashes and this is 256 bit encryption for your drive okay now that we have the key saved I can go ahead and, and click next gives you an option on how to encrypt it you can see the encrypt disk usage encrypt used disk space only and it's faster and that's set up for base brand new computer so if it's a brand new install this is what typically what happens and anything else that's added to it you save new files programs this and that it's going to encrypt it automatically as it states here 
and but if you have a computer that's been used for a long time you might want to encrypt the entire drive which is slower but this is what happens so you know chances are if you remember that you know once your computer is reimaged just you know use uh, the fast one and that should be fine because everything else you add to it later on will be uh, encrypted as well so it's going to click next new encryption mode here's a choose a, which encryption mode to use as you can see here there's a two different types of mode and uh, the newest version is installed or introduced in version 15 11 of windows 10 and if you're unsure you can just leave it at compatible mode so that way it's backwards compatible for all other versions of windows that you may be running if you're not worried about it you can just leave it in new encryption mode because i believe the newest version of operating system i believe it's 19 something so we're well past that either way it's fine uh, i'm just going to leave it in compatibility mode just in case and then i'm going to it's going to ask you are you ready to encrypt this drive encryption may take a while depending on the size of your drive he says you can keep working which is fine although your pc might run more slowly so it's asking you if you want to do a, a bit locker system check in this case all it is doing is just making sure that the hard drive itself is in good running condition meaning that there are no errors with the drive itself and you can certainly do that just to be sure so let's go ahead and do that and then again don't forget i will show you how it looks like uh, when we are trying to recover data on a an, an encrypted bit locker drive so what you're looking at here is what happens if somebody tries to boot from the bit locker hard drive this is the error they get. And you can see it's referring to a recovery key ID. And if you remember, it's the exact same one that we have for our hard drive. So I literally put it in another computer, try to boot it from that drive as well. And then now it's saying, well, you need the key to even, even attempt to even get to the login screen of this PC. And here's our reference number. We can compare it exactly to our key. And it's this here and then we have the identifier for it so now it's asking for this specifically all right now let's see what happens when we log in to our computer and see it as a slaved drive so here we are our encrypted drive is now slaved now we can see that it has a little lock key on it so let's double check it and see what happens and here we go again it's asking for that bit locker recovery key all right let's give it a shot and see what happens with that i'm going to open up our recovery file here is our key i'm going to copy this entire key like so i'm going to try it again i'm going to paste that in there i'm going to hit unlock and there you have it guys now you can see the little lock is unlocked and now we can go inside of this make any changes and recover user data which is typically located in users and under their login profile and lastly going back to our computer where we have encrypted it originally we're going to have a look of some options that are there available for managing a bit locker if we right click the c drive and select manage bit locker we can see that we can once more back up your recovery key if you need a copy of it or you can also turn off bit locker if you choose so in today's video we're learning some of the basics of powershell specifically on how to install or execute application installation so what will uh, what i will teach you here is how to use some basic commands that would lead you towards creating your own scripts that would allow you to install software through the PowerShell. So basically, once you go to the internet and you download something, it's going to be inside of downloads folder and whatever you decide to install, let's for example, take this example here, Media Creation Tool 1809, you would simply double click it and you get the prompts and you go to the prompts and then you install everything like that. Well, you can also execute this through the PowerShell. So there are a couple of ways of doing this which will help you get to the point where you create your own script to run PowerShell remote installs or even local installs, if you will, and that is to get to the same directory. So if we type in CD downloads, it's going to take us to that directory. The reason they got this to the directory because we're already partially there. But if we really wanted to navigate to this, it would be simple as this. We're going to type in users, name of the local profile that I'm using, which is YT login, and then I'm going to type in 
downloads, it's going to get us to the same place. So if we type in DIR, we can see that that media creation tool is indeed there as well. So this is one of those things you might want to double check every time you create or before you start to create your scripts. <clears throat> By the way, this is going to be a little bit more advanced, so it's a little bit more advanced for uh, you know people who are more familiar with computer software. But if you're new to computers, I will try to go as slow as possible. Comparatively speaking, here's the same directory in a GUI form. So this is inside of our Windows, and we can see that it's exact same stuff that we see in here. So let's go ahead and execute it from the PowerShell. And the way to do that is to type in start process. And then type in media creation tool.exe. See, now we get the same prompt to uh, go through our uh, prompts to, you know, basically install our software. However, if you want to make this to be a silent operation, you would do the same thing and then just do a switch or a command, which is forward slash s. This would execute it silently if it is an MSI package, typically. It won't work here because this is executable. It's designed to literally go through the prompts like that. But if you do have MSI package, it will allow you to do so like so. And for example of an MSI package, in case you don't know, is for example this one. This is an MSI installer for that, and that is .msi. Now here's another example of how to do it on from a remote uh, remote location. In our case, we might have something on a network level, which is for me located here. I went ahead and created a folder for this example on forward uh, backslash backslash Kobuman one, and that is the PC name or the server name that you might be using. And then I'm going to type in folder name repo one. So if we look inside of this one, the IR, we can see that we still have that media creation tool inside of that. So the same way we can execute it from here as well. So we can start type in the same way, start process media creation tool 1809.exe. Since we're in the disk directory already, I can just hit enter and we're going to get that pop up again and it's installing. So I went ahead and canceled that. This is where you're getting all these errors. Now, we can the same way we can start our script by typing in let's see here start dash process and then we're simply going to navigate to the network location let's see here and then it's going to be cobbleman one for uh, folder name repo one and then we're going to do a backslash and then we're going to type in media creation tool 1809.exe. Then we're going to hit enter, and now we have that pop up again. And again, if you want to make this silent, you're going to have to create your own MSI package or something like that and basically design it so it is silent. So, meaning that nothing happens that you see visually, it just kind of installs it. So, that's how you would do it. Uh, that's how you would start to create your script for a remote location using PowerShell. Now, you can also use a package manager to download different applications or access different applications and execute them like so, but you would have to have some kind of a uh, package manager that would allow you to do so. So let's look at a repository that's online available right now that you can kind of look at as an example of that. So there's one that was set up for testing by Microsoft, which we will navigate here in a moment. Let me just do a, a quick clear here so that we don't have any uh, confusion here. And in order to find these packages, we can type in find dash package. And then we need to specify a provider, which that means is you know dash provider this is basically indicates that we're going to now type in the provider name in our case the provider or our server name if you will is chocolatey i think that's how it's pronounced so we're going to hit enter here and see what happens so here's just the run of all the things that are available as in packages on this repository or uh, server if you will so 
how do we get any of these packages downloaded to our computer? We just kind of have to know which one we want, but we can also kind of, if we specifically want to look for some specific, let's say, I don't know, uh, let's say Notepad. So we can stop it from kind of going through all the things and see if there's anything available for Notepad. Because you can see there are so many different things here. And if there's something specific that, you can, that you're you looking for, you're going to have to, you know, kind of remember that or specifically search for. So let's stop this process here. And I'm going to leave it up just for the sake of reference. I'm going to open up a new PowerShell and we're going to access the same repository, but I'm going to tell it to look for a specific name. And in our case, we're going to use an example of namepad. So we're going to type in again, find dash package, and then we're going to type in provider, and then server chocolatey, and I'm going to specify a command, which is name, that tells it, I'm okay, I want you to look for this specifically or anything or any derivative of that or anything like that. I'm going to type in notepad and I'm going to use asterisk. So I'm going to type in and everything that's uh, that has a notepad there's in, inside of this uh, repository, it's going to show up as so. So now we can see all the things that are available as a package um, inside of this repository. So yes, we can now download these packages and uh, we're going, we can use them in our package manager to push this type of different software. So what can we do with this point? Well, we can install one of these packages. So let's go ahead and pick a, a random one. Let's let's pick this one, Notepad++. We're going to do Control C on this, so we have it saved. And then again, we're going to uh, use some commands. And this is this case, instead of typing in Find Package, we're going to type in Install Package. Install Package. We're going to uh, type in Provider once more. And then we're going to type in chocolatey, and then we're going to specify a name, and then we're going to say notepad++. So let's see what happens when we execute that. And now it's asking us whether we trust this source, which is for the right reasons. If you're going to look at this repository, make sure that you feel comfortable with installing this on your computer. And here it asks you, are you sure you want to install software in chocolatey? And I can say yes. Yes to all, no, or no to all, suspend, or or if you're unsure, you can type in help. So in my case, I'm just going to type in Y for yes, and I'm going to hit enter. And now it's installing this package. So let's see what happened. Did this actually install it? This is actually what happened. When we did that, it actually just downloaded that repository into our folder that is created on the root of C, and it's going to be in our libraries. And here is our chocolatey uh, well, there's a core extension. There it is. Notepad++ is what we just got here. And there are a couple of different packages here that are installed. Ah, oh, this one actually came with the installer. So that's cool. Now we can actually execute this installer if we really wanted to. And all right. I found that some of these uh, packages are not com incomplete that I've downloaded, for example, Visual Studio here. This one doesn't seem to have the actual the actual uh, executable in there. But this one actually installed. What is this one? This is part of the same one. OK, well, we can execute this now. And all we got to do is just copy this path here. And then we can type in again, start process and then we can specify that and then we we need to get the name of that installation let's do the uh, x64 the 64-bit version of that and I'm going to paste that in there and I'm going to hit enter and here it is now let's see if it works silently it errored out because I clicked no as you saw I'm going to use the S switch let's see if this nope so yeah, it has to be an MSI package for it to install silently, and this one is just a simple executable. Anyways, guys, I hope you find this kind of interesting because it really is. You can um, do we can set up scripts that will allow you to install remote uh, software packages into multiple computers. This and that. There are many many ways of going about. This is kind of just an introduction to PowerShell. 
and uh, there are many many different tools that you can look at and uh, and not only can you install you can also uninstall and again there are different ways of doing this you can use the invoke command or you can just use install package command you can use the start process command many many different ways and this is the great thing about PowerShell you can customize this to your needs or to your business needs of just the way you the way it feels the best for your type of business that you'll work at and in today's video I want to talk about file association this is a good to know for everybody for everyday users like me and you but also for people who do tech support a lot of times you'll come across an application that requires specific software to run but sometimes and for some weird reason it doesn't work because it doesn't know which application to use this is usually or this is typical with apps or applets that need to have a base software to run underneath uh, so that way it can do its thing and that good example of that is java applications or applets or even java plugins so of course we know what the basic file association is if we look at this video file we can see that it opens up using a windows player so if we right click it and go to properties we can see that it opens with movies and tv which is part of windows so it's a windows uh, video player but if you want to open this mp4 file with something else we can simply do this click change and for example select the vlc media player click ok select it and now it's using videos media player so that's a quick file association and you know this is pretty easy anybody can do this and it's really quick and really simple but sometimes in tech support in a business environment